so uh, now we will discuss about uh, something about tripping so uh, if uh, it is uh, it has been it, ha it has seen that more tripping is are happening because of wrong setting in, instead of having a real fault so this is a dilemma and this is also why this subject is very important to understand that relay settings and relay coordination and power system production is really important because if you misunderstood the power system production then the result will be false tripping because of wrong settings false tripping because of wrong interlock diagrams or less uh, adequate interlocks available in a system so you can calculate the cost of single tripping which resulted in cascade tripping and which resulted in whole country blackout for 12 to 24 hours so you can calculate the cost by yourself whole industry is off all the hospitals are off and all the power plants are off so this is a huge loss and also the reliability issue any investor if you want to come and invest in a country he will be susceptible that the power network is not healthy so how i can invest and how i can meet the deadlines so we need to avoid the false tripping false trippings one is a real tripping another one is a false tripping real tripping is because of fault false tripping is because of wrong settings or because of uh, mal malfunction of the relay so we need to test the relay that's why there is always annual testing routine testing there is a um, we need to keep on testing and check the system second thing is localizing the fault so if and a part of the network has a fault even though it's a three phase short circuit only that part for example if a line is dead short if somebody has forgot to remove the portable temporary grounds from the line i will tell you one interesting thing that used to happen in the past if somebody installed a portable ground because portable ground is just like connecting uh, copper wires to the conductor of transmission line and to the ground so there is no interlock in it and nobody can monitor it only so that person who has taken the permit he knows if somebody else came he cannot check even the operator uh, is, is there is no interlocking there is no indication it cannot monitor it so uh, it used to happen nowadays also there is a chance and when a person is trying to close the line he will check all everything he will make a visual inspection first of all normally what is required is before after you finish off all of your permit if you cancel it then you have to go to the site you should make a visual inspection always and then you can go back and issue your permit uh, then you can go back and continue the process of analyzation so in case of portable temporary ground as soon as you can close the breaker there is a fault there is a already built in fault it's this fault also has a, <clears throat> a very special name it's called a switch on to fault and uh, it's, it's uh, in other words we can say is S, it is a SOTF the other name of this fault is a bolted fault so it's you can say it's a very heavy short circuit because it's a dead short using a three wires and if you have if you know that three phase short circuit has the highest level of uh, short circuit current it can feed the highest level of short circuit current in the network as compared to single phase to ground or two phase to ground faults so then uh, this is example of uh, switch on to fault and uh, each uh, protection relay especially in the distance and also in over current which is protecting the line they have that's why they have introduced a separate function which is called a switch on to fault function so whenever the breaker is closed at that instant this function is switched on for only 200 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds and after that it is disabled so what the relay is doing it is setting its priority to check switch on to fault first because it's these are these are uh, these days we have numerical relays and you have if you have done the programming you know that the <coughs> program is executed line by line so 
the what the relay is doing it is calculating the voltages and currents and then it's executing the code checking voltage is under limit current is under limit impedance is under limit one by one is checking all the condi conditions and it is in the loop always but and it mean that uh, we can give priority here to diff certain types of faults we can give priority that first you need to check for example distance protection zone 1 then you need to check zone 2 then you can check you can check uh, over current earth fault over current backup so you can depending upon your priority there will be a you can say a few milliseconds which is really important for a big networks <coughs> so uh, if a person switching it on the uh, network on a fault then it's a severe three phase short circuit fault so that fault should uh, uh, what should happen technically that that only line should be tripped but uh, what has I, I have told you example already that uh, the similar fault happened and it resulted in tripping of all the country uh, also I have uh, experience in Saudi Arabia where we have similar type of a fault earth fault to ground the line was uh, breaker was close to a solidly connected earth and it was a new substation it was under commissioning and by mistake uh, this interlocking was not working and they closed the breaker and it was closed uh, until there was no interlocking and the result was all the region was uh, blackout for few hours so this is very common so what happened if you are switching on to a fault switch on to fault in, in this condition and if the relay did not work or it, it is working uh, delayed uh, there, there is uh, in the network there are always two things or uh, there is uh, basically <coughs> sources which are supplying the power and there is a load also so we are keeping uh, generations and we are keeping balance between generation and we are also keeping balance between load and also there is another thing that I will tell you is basically spinning reserves so we are keeping some generators and we are keeping them on and their ro rotor or turbine is spinning uh, whenever there is sudden change in the generation you can immediately take the power from the spinning turbines these are called spinning reserves of the network so what happened that if the line was if the line flows on the earth uh, three phase earth is already connected so what will happen that the line should trip there is a delay tripping in the line and that resulted in tripping of a power plant nearby power plant because power plant could not sustain that much short circuit levels there is under uh, under uh, over current production there is out of step production so uh, these productions operated and it tripped the generation so and it's still uh, fault is kept on fading because fault is not clear so now the, also the spinning reserve in the network was not not enough so when one generator goes down fault is still available it, now the gen, uh, the load is more and the generation of the network is less because we are not keeping uh, enough spinning reserves also so the next generator trips and uh, after some time hold the network tripped so this this is called also a cascade tripping so this could happen that if you have a load if you have 1000 megawatt of, of megawatt of load and we have 1000 megawatt of generation and you are not keeping any spinning reserves with you if one of the line trips which is applying for example 200 megawatts then there is a sudden decrease in generation of 200 megawatts versus 1000 megawatts of load so now you don't have any spinning reserves with you so what will happen that further generators will trip and it, it might result in cascade tripping so that's why it's very important to have a good protection coordination good under frequency scheme installed and you should have proper coordinated settings which uh, area should trip first and which area should trip after afterwards so whenever the fault happened there comes always an investigation so you need to investigate the fault 
Welcome friends, uh, in this section we will discuss that what we, we have to protect in a power system. So let's start. So in a power system we have a different components, we have substations, we have transmission line, we have transformers, we have generating stations, we have solar system, we have a lot of equipment which is installed. So power system protection it will uh, what is the purpose is that it has to it cannot prevent the fault protection cannot prevent the fault but it can reduce the severity of the fault it can reduce the basically the damage to the equipment or to the network as minimum as possible it can reduce it cannot prevent the outages but it can reduce the duration of outages as minimum as possible. So the basic concept of power system protection is not only to trip when the fault occur but it has to take care all of these things that interruption should be there should be no interruption if there is an interruption it should be as minimum as possible there should be no damage to the equipment but if there is a fault and the damage should be as minimum as possible. For example in the transformer if you see the example of the production here, the buckles relay is installed here in it and this relay is basically monitoring if there is any gases available in the transformer. These are trapped in this. First of all, it will give alarm and if the alarm is not basically uh, appearing, uh, if uh, alarm is not clear, the gas is further increased, it will give, issue the trip. So, in this way, uh, we are monitoring the transformer and instead of uh, having a complete fire in the transformer, we are fire, we are, we can in this way monitor a small uh, spark or small fault in which is still developing into a big fault. We can monitor it and if the alarms uh, is coming, then we have to take the shutdown on the complete uh, transformer and we have to do the testing and try to find out what is a for real the fault. In this way, for example, in this way, we are minimizing the fault on the transformer. Uh, another example of monitoring the fault and minimize, minimize, minimizing the uh, damage is we have installed here a, a temperature, winding temperature and oil temperature indicators. So we are continuously monitoring the temperature of winding and the oil and if it's beyond certain limit the alarm and in, uh, also possible the tripping is initiated. So instead that the transformer winding is keep on heating up and then finally there is a fault and start burning. We are just tripping it before, before it and we are limiting the, limiting the fault. So these are some examples. Basic idea is that we are protecting all our equipment using these relays and we or the aim is uh, to uh, have a better selectivity and isolate the faulty portion only in case of fault. So this is an example of we are protecting to protect equipment. So another relaying a production uh, uh, ideology also uh, in this relay coordination relay studies and short circuit studies we are doing the calculations of we are taking care of human safety also because humans has to work in substation on or the transmission lines so we have to take care about the humans so in this uh, specific uh, sheet you can see there is a calculation in which uh, we have to calculate the as per design uh, substation or the transmission line what is a step potential and what is a touch potential is what somebody is touching the tower and they will be when when the conductor is is basically passing and it is energized voltage will be there and there will be some kind of induced current. So if somebody is touching this transmission line, how much current could pass through its body and if somebody is walking through uh, near this tower and how much could be 
the voltage is between its two steps so it is called as step potential because uh, of because when there is a fault conductor will lay down and there will be a voltage gradient in it and there will be some step potential which is dangerous for human also there will be touch potential so we have to do all these calculations so the other perspective of protection system studies is to protect the humans so humans also we have to take care using our protection system studies the next thing that we need to study is basically the environment so what is the effect of environment and how we can improve this impact for example what is the impact of certain power plants and, and certain substation on the environment nowadays just an example that if you choose uh, if you have to pass a transmission line through a forest so if you select uh, as a study if you take this matter also if you select an AC substation AC transmission line it will take uh, it will uh, occupy more area than a DC transmission line which is slimmer and smarter so it, it means then you need to cut less forest and you, you have to take care also this aspect when you are doing the relay coordination system studies system design that what is good for environment we should take care also our environment when we are doing power system production studies now the new problem are for example is could be in the environment we can count it as an electromagnetic interference so the DC transmission lines AC transmission lines the electrode power when power flows through the electrode stations it they can cause an interference in the network so which might result in disturbance of telecom signals so this will also impact humans in some way so we need to consider and design a system that should have minimum interference we should should create minimum interference in uh, uh, in an in, 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 in the environment so this these are the factors that we need to consider thank you very much hey friends now in this section we will move forward and we will study that why we do need to protect so what will happen if we are not doing a protection in a proper way if the relay coordination is not correct what could happen so protection relaying why so i will give an example of a burj khalifa the total um, height of burj khalifa is 828 uh, meters it's a world tallest building and it is in in dubai everybody knows it it was completed in 2010 and on top of it you can see they have installed a lighting protection so they have installed lighting protection if lighting strikes so this lighting is effectively grounded to the earth so it is protecting a light because the building height is so high so it's prone to a lighting strokes so they have installed a lighting protection on top of the Burj Khalifa so a magnetic field is created in arresters that carries the lighting surge current so in this way when there is a lighting strike on the rod here you can see a beautiful picture of uh, Dubai you can see there is a certain pattern of lighting and lighting striking on top of the Burj Khalifa where they have installed this lighting protection so if they have not installed this lighting protection this lighting would strike and it will it it, it will certainly damage this high-rise building so you can see we have we need to put install the lighting protection on high especially high-rise buildings all the substations power plants transmission lines if you know they have a lighting protection installed on them so on each transmission line there is an uh, overhead uh, shielding wire which is protecting a tower and transmission line from the lighting similarly on each substation the lighting asters are installed in such a way that they are covering complete substation area 
So lighting protection installed on everywhere in, in the network. So we need to provide the lighting protection on the buildings. So similarly lighting protection you can see the another example. So this is another very beautiful view of uh, Burj Khalifa where lighting is striking on the top of the building and here on this top the lighting protection rod installed which is effectively grounding this huge electrical uh, charge or power to the ground effectively. So here you can see uh, in this picture you can see that there is a basically uh, transmission line on top of this line you can see this wire this is called a shield wire or earth wire or overhead ground wire you can find this wire on uh, east tower so if you are uh, passing through a transmission line you can observe there is a wire on the top of the uh, tower that uh, is protecting basically the line from the lightning strokes so here you can see the presentation of uh, uh, the graphical presentation diagram. So each shield wire or shield, shield rod has its own protecting angle. So when you are designing this shielding you are calculating this angle and this angle should cover the protected object. For example you can see now this is the transmission line and shield wire is not installed here directly it is installed at certain height. So this height is giving to cover all the wings and all the area of transmission line. If you install this line, for example, this shield wire here, not on the top but here, if for example, if I trying to install this shield wire downside, then this wings, this area, if I draw this angle from here to here, for example, then this area will be unprotected. So if I am not doing this guide wire uh, to a little bit height if I am putting my guide wire here so I have put my guide wire here so from this point the angle will be some kind of this okay to this so it means that this area this complete area is now no more protected to the lighting so my angle is this is, this is my protection angle so if I want to cover this area then I have to increase the height of ground wire to the certain level for example here I have taken this new point now I have done the calculations and I have now covered the complete tower plus I have some margin of error this much is my margin margin of safety so that's why I have taken the ground wire a little bit higher and then I have covered this Basically, this is just some introduction about the ground wire, how ground wire works. So this is another example. Here you can see that this is basically the overhead ground wire. You can see and this is basically the lighting arrestor rod. So in the substation, you will find lighting arrestor rod and also the shield wire. Both are combined to protect the substation from lighting strokes so this is example of lighting this is just I am briefing so this is an example you can see there is a fire in in the, in the in the transformer so we need to have good protection if you want to limit the faults if you want to eliminate the faults you need to have protection if protection is not properly working result could be like this that the equipment can damage and this damage can cause by short circuit, by overheating, by flashovers. You can see the, there is a flashover. So the system is not all the time smooth. System is dynamic and it is subject to environmental conditions, ambient temperature, flashovers, moisture, humidity, uh, loading conditions, voltage stresses, lighting stresses. So. So these all things it has to bear. That's why we need to have protection. Here you can see there's a flashover on the MV system. There's a flashover here. This is basically the disk of the transmission line. It is, disk, it is called a disk insulator and you can see this is the shield wire. 
and here you can see this are basically called as a damper these are dampers because uh, in transmission line due to air there is a vibration in the line so in order to damp the vibration and protect the structure so these dampers are installed and here you can see there is a flashover and it means that here the conductor is grounded through arc arc has a low impedance and with arc is formed completely it is, it is uh, creating a short circuit heavy short circuit so in order to protect the system from these failures we have to have protection so here you can see another example in this one you can see that transmission tower uh, transmission line which is in fact the medium voltage is, has fallen down because of uh, any reason because of climatical changes heavy winds so we need to in such cases when there is a falling of line we have to immediately cut off the, that specific portion to save the equipment to save the human life here so this is another example so you can see uh, in this example the conductors uh, has broken it and it is now touching the ground so in this uh, in this case also you need to cut this power supply so you need to have a protection which, which who can sense this fault and immediately within power tucker it should cut down the supply of the line you need to have have a breaker installed which which can uh, which really can give command and it can isolate this uh, specific uh, area of the substation so here you can see they have they have formed the layers when the, uh, this is just an example just in, uh, for your knowledge that when the conductor any high voltage conductor fell to the ground it's not simply that the voltages are on the conductor but for example it's uh, for example if the line is 33 kV near to the line there will be 33 kV after some time it will be 30 kV then 27 kV next layer will be uh, 24 kV so voltage will be in the form of gradients the voltage will be in the form of whirlpool so it means that if somebody is standing or uh, wants to come near to this high voltage line and it, 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 if it's standing here if person is coming and standing here one foot is on this and another foot is here so you can see there will be effective 5 or 6 kVs of voltage different between these two legs because voltage are not straight these are voltage are in the form of gradient they are decreasing gradually decaying gradually near to the fault points so this guy this is called a step potential and this guy can easily be killed or it can die by this step voltages so just just for your information that whenever the high voltage conductors fell down never try to go near to this conductor or if it's fell down near you then you have to join your two legs together and then you can jump and come out of the this area and you should not fall down if you fall down then your hand and your legs your current will pass through your heart and body and then it will be fatal so that's why it's important to cut this line when the conductor fell down for human safety for the equipment safety so that's why we need protection so we need a good protection and relay coordination if you want to avoid the power interruption if you want to avoid the massive power breakdown so in recently in Pakistan what happened is that there is a fault on a line the line was uh, ground temporal by grounded by a portable temporary ground so basically portable temporary ground is a temporary uh, grounding connectors and these simple wires that you are connecting to the conductor and then you are grounding it and uh, when they switch it, switch it on the portable temporary ground was connected and the fault only that line should trip but instead of tripping that line whole networks came down so if the protection system and coordination has been done properly a specific line could have been tripped and we can save all the systems so you should have a good protection system installed uh, in so that it can 
uh, it can only cut off the specific uh, area where it has a fault instead of shutting down whole the system so we need to have good protection system so the another example if if you cannot uh, avoid the faults you need to limit the fault for example here you can see there is a fire in the in the transformer nowadays there is a new system which is available and in in which uh, the gas is uh, when uh, basically the gas is uh, because when there is a fault inside the transformer gases will form and when the gases will form this system will be activated and it will inject the nitrogen inside the transformer it will trip the transformer immediately and inject the nitrogen and it will take all the gases flammable gases out because it will compress basically the uh, nitrogen will uh, it's uh, it will block the basically oxygen and it will allow the all the gases to go outside of the transformer and also and uh, so it uh, the fault has occurred but it will try to limit the fault here we, limitation has not been done and you can see the fire has been started so we can have we should have a protection so that we can we can limit the damage to the equipment so again this is an example uh, uh, earlier i have show you there is basically a touch thing which is called as touch potential and another thing which is called as step potential so we should have normally uh, just for your uh, interest all the substation all the power plants uh, we are calculating uh, when we are designing the earthing mesh we have to calculate the touch potential and step potential so if we are putting uh, if you if first first step is to check the ground resistance ground resistivity and based on this uh, we have to put some parameter permissible uh, basically current permissible uh, basically short circuit level we have to put in it we have to put the short circuit duration and then we have to calculate how much uh, we are laying a basically a copper mesh inside each substation and the power plant so then when there is a fault then the, this charge will be grounded effectively and the touch and step potential uh, has to be within the limits so we have to uh, do all these calculations we have to do all we have to design a protection system to protect humans so another thing is when a, a very famous question is that basically what kills the human uh, basically there are two things one is voltages one is amperes but the thing that a kill a person is not voltage is basically when uh, the thing that kill a person is the amps passing through the body of the human so that's that's a important thing so we need to limit the current passing if you cannot limit the voltage then you have to limit the volt, uh, limit basically the current passing through the body so that's why the example is we are using gloves so if, if you're working on low voltage if you're using insulated gloves there will be voltage but because you have now high resistance in uh, gloves installed insulated gloves resistance is in mega ohm or giga ohms there will be a very less current passing through your body so in this way you are controlling the uh, basically the current the another example is basically uh, uh, the gravel which is installed in the substation so the example uh, of uh, controlling the if you cannot control the voltage controlling the basically the resistance is the other method is to increase the resistance so that the less current will flow through the body if what is somebody is coming in contact with the voltages so here you can see the, uh, the gravel is uh, uh, is placed in the substation uh, switch yard so reason of placing this gravel is to reduce the touch voltages and the step voltages to reduce the basically touch and step voltage uh, impact because this gravel has a high resistance now if for example if somebody is touching this uh, tower then this body resistance plus the resistance of its uh, if somebody is standing here 
and this foot is here and it's touching basically the tower so what will happen for example if this is the tower and if somebody is touching then its body resistance plus the resistance of the gravel both will come in series so this is the resistance of gravel for example and then ground so in this way the current flow through the body will reduce and it will somehow will come into within the permissible limit so this gravel has uh, you will find this gravel on each substation this is put with purpose in order to increase the resistance and in order to control the current flowing through the body in case of touch and step potential so the type of gravel and the thickness of the gravel is very important because if more more will be the thickness more will be the resistance so this thickness is when we are calculating step and touch potential we are keeping this thickness in the calculations so here you can see some basically and um, basically a chart so they have shown here that uh, some current has passed through the body and what is the impact on it for example if 1 milliamp current is passing through the body a person can just feel it it will have a, some sensation it it has a tingling sensation and change in the perception level so if 5 milli is passing through the body a subtle shock the individual is able to let go of the object intense ill voluntary spasm might lead to injury so 5 amp is, is you can remove your hand but it can injured so 6 to 16 milli it, it has basically a painful shock uh, muscle control uh, will be lost and often referred to as a freezing current where the individual cannot separate from electric source so we basically our all the body is uh, operating through electricity so by small electric pulses so if you have external uh, electricity then your pulses from the brain will not work so ultimately you cannot take your hand out of it and uh, the result will be really bad then we have 17 to 99 milli and then it is extreme painful also lung failure strong muscle contraction inability to separate from electrical source possibly fatal so it's, it's start, fatal is starting here then we have 100 to 2000 milliampere severe abnormal heat burn extreme muscular construct uh, contractions and never damage occur nerve damage occur likely resulting in death so greater than 2000 m milliampere or 2 ampere heart stops beating internal organs are severely damaged and ex extreme burns probable death so this is example of the current passing through the body so another thing is which current is more dangerous ac or dc so just for your interest ac you know i'll already that uh, it's it's uh, it has a frequency 50 to 60 hertz so every time it has passed through zero so there when it's passing through zero there is a chance and you can remove your hand uh, even though the current level is a little higher but for dc it is a straight so it will be difficult for a person to take his hand off so this is just an uh, example when the current passing through a body uh, can damage so we need to control it for for protection uh, for such uh, in such cases there is a prote protection relay which is called as earth leakage protection uh, you can see this diagram and this is uh, i have put one relay for example here you can see set this uh, time when the here you can see when the earth leakage current is 30 milli we are keeping always 50 or less than 50 milli the settings and the time is also mentioned here is uh, we have kept here instantaneous we can keep 150 if it's um, keep on tripping because there might be some leakage at other place so uh, this protection really we can stall normally this is always a good idea to stall earth leakage uh, circuit breakers or earth, earth leakage relay in in homes so in case of uh, any person is touching any 
uh, fire immediately this protection will isolate the house and it will save that person from electric shock so this is an example of why we need protection relaying so next we will move on to our next topic so thank you very much uh, i hope that you enjoy my lecture Hey friends now in this section we will discuss and study about the some characteristics good characteristics of protection system uh, i have put it here as an when so when you are designing a protection system what things you need to consider and what an a good protection or ideal protection system should have so we will start our topic so a protection system um, should be selective so the characteristics of the protection systems are selectivity number a so it's kind of uh, isolate only that area where it has a fault instead of isolating complete region city or an area number b is sensitivity it should sensitive enough to sense the fault number c is speed uh, the protection device should not delay the fault for a longer duration because in in this way the backup protection will operate and the result will uh, load sharing or shading of uh, power on the uh, bigger area so the characteristics of the protection uh, system is it should have uh, operate in, in right speed then it, re it should be reliable so the protection system should be reliable so it's considered that whenever there is a fault it should operate uh, next thing in, and that should be in the protection system is simplicity so the protection system or for example protection relay or scheme should be simple enough so everybody can easily understand it or in case of fault you can also easily troubleshoot so this there should be a simplicity in in the protection system uh in point of also find from point of point of maintenance that protection system also be able to uh protect properly and when we are doing maintenance then you should have an enough space and it should be easy to maintain then the economy the protection system should have should be economical so we'll start with our first uh, topic selectivity Hey friends, now we start our topic. It's called as selectivity. This is one of the uh, most important characteristics of a properly designed protection system. So let's consider this example. So here you can see this is uh, we are uh, denoting bus bar by a line. So you can see a uh, two transformers. This is symbol of transformers. Two transformers are connected to a bus. and both are feeding you can see a network so basically you can see it's it is called as a ring so you can see uh, it's a ring and here you can see and there there is basically a fault in this section there is a fault here in this section so and at the moment you can see that the coupler is open this is a coupler which connect the two networks which are forming a ring so if there is a fault here that in the ideal network uh, this breaker and this breaker pr2 and pr3 should open should trip and if they are, they are tripping uh, correctly in the right time then this fault is isolated successfully and all other networks will be keep on running so the more better protection could be the tripping of these two breakers and then reclosing of this tie breaker so in the second step first of all fault will be isolated here and this when this breaker is closed the tie breaker this is closed then the supply will be restored up to this point so you need to uh this is kind of called as uh, reclosing so this is a good example of selectivity 
so the purpose is that you need to uh, select as minimum portion of the fault did area as possible to isolate the fault so this is one of the main characteristics of the protection system so here uh, there is another example so here you can see this is a trans symbol of transformer and you can see this is the zone 1 later on I will explain you how zones of protections are designed so this is just an introduction so this is the main breaker which is called as incomer and there are three outgoing feeders and the case consider case that there is a fault on one of the line here is the fault you can see there is a fault on one of the line so this breaker only should trip so if this breaker trip it will isolate the fault and the remaining system will be keep on running as it is so it means that fault is isolated properly fault selection is done correctly and only the faulted loop has been tripped so another example of the fault is the, now the fault is on the bus if the fault is here and if this feeder is stripped it will not isolate the fault so in order to isolate the fault the, now this fault is feed through this transformer so we need to trip the this breaker so in this case in order to isolate the fault we have to trip complete uh, bus and we have to trip the main incomer so this is example of fault and how to select how different areas of select are, are selected so here uh, you can see an example in which we have a generator we have a, a breaker of the generator which is connected to a bus this circular symbol is for the generator and this bracket symbol normally used for breaker rectangle and this um, straight line here is used for the bus bar uh, uh, showing the bus bar and then we have breaker feeder breaker here then we have another transformer then we have another breaker and then we have another bus so you can see that voltage is step up or down using this transformer and it's connected to the bus and then it is connected to two different lines so all the production systems uh, is divided in zones and it is important that each area of the protection system should be covered at least by one zone no area of the protection system should be uncovered or, or it should 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 be exposed to faults so you can see this is the uh, generator zone zone of generator and this is the another zone you can see which is covering the bus and the two breakers this area you can see this area the zone generator zones and the lead protection zone <coughs> both uh, zones are basically overlapping so it's called as overlap zone so in the protection systems you will see lot of overlapping so advantage of overlapping is that that if for example here the lead protection did not operate because of any reason the back and uh, the protection of generator will operate and it will isolate the fault so this is called as loop overlapping as uh, uh, zones overlapping and these are different zones so this is example of and we are forming the zones to have a better selectivity more zones means more better selectivity so if the fault is in this zone here open zone so it will trip and this is an example of closed zone so op uh, what is the difference between open and closed zone just for your information an overcurrent protection has an open zone and a differential protection has a closed zone because any protection which can only which operate only when the fault is within its zone within within a predefined area if there is a fault if a zone really will operate example is a differential protection then it's called as 
a closed zone protection so let's show you something so for example if we have a line station a and station b we have cities here we have another city here so for example here one relay is stalled 52 over current relay and another relay is installed here 87 which is called as a differential relay and differential relay is feed by this CT and this CT it is checking difference of both CTs and with over current relay is feed by this one and CT only so for example if there is a fault on this is station A for example and this is station B this is station C if there is a fault here for example in zone fault there will be a fault current feeding from this to down and there will be no fault current here because for example here the source is only connected this side so this will be fed to the 87L and the 87L will operate in detail I will explain you later just for example to show you what is open and closed zone means and also differential relay will pick up because of this fault okay so this will because uh, but the differential has instantaneous time so in distance will trip first 50 uh, protection 50 is basically a backup protection so it will be trip it will trip if 87 is not trip after some time delay so but if there is a fault outside between b and c there will be a fault current from station a to ground so here you can see the differential current in and out both are same so differential current will be zero in this case so differential protection will not operate whereas there will be fault current and 52 will be fed by this ct only so it will send some current so we can say that differential protection is a unit protection and it is operating only when there is a fault between a given uh, point a and b between these two cities whereas the overcurrent protection is kind of open zone protection so that's why overcurrent protection is used benefit of using overcurrent protection is that it can be used for gated protection whereas 87 is not used as a gated protection so let, let's on and later we will explain you in detail what is a gated protection for example if this breaker fails to trip if the protection for example DC supply is fail here in that case this protection will trip after if we set this tripping here in one set in second for example I can set it here one seconds and here I can set it two seconds tripping in two seconds so if this relay fails then this relay can trip so we can have concept of graded protection so 52 can be open zone can be used for gated protection whereas 87 is used for unit protection so this is some example so here you can see in a, another example of uh, selectivity so we have divided the power system into four zones zone 1 zone 2 zone 3 and zone 4 so uh, in this way now we can understand that uh, power system is always divided into zones and we are dividing it in zones so that we can selectively trip uh, faulted portion only and if the faulted portion protection fails then it should be tripped by the backup protection so this is example of selectivity that we should have So, so we can define selectivity uh, as simple as that this is the ability of protection system to select correctly that part of the system in trouble and disconnect the faulty part without disturbing the rest of the system 
a well design design and efficient relay system should be selective that is it should be able to detect the point at which the fault occurs and cause the opening of the circuit breaker closest to the fault with minimum or no damage to the system in order to provide selectivity of the system it is usual to practice to divide entire system into several protection zones when fault occurs in a given zone the one then only the circuit breakers within that zone will be opened this will isolate only the faulty circuit or operators leaving the healthy circuit intact the system can be divided into several zones just like protection zones for generators power transfer transmission line hp switch gear etc so this was a little definition uh, for selectivity i hope that you understand the the lecture clearly thank you very much so the next important thing about the relay characteristics is the sensitivity the sensitivity is is we can say that it is an ability of the relay to operate with low value of actuating quantity so actuating quantity can be voltage can be current can be impedance frequency etc sensitivity of a relay is a function of volt amps input to the coil of relay necessary to cause its operations the smaller the voltage amps into required to cause relay operation the more sensitive is the relay thus a 1 va relay is more sensitive than 3 va relay it is desirable that relay system should be sensitive so that it operates with low value of amp volt amp input so it's very clear now that if a relay is drawing more power basically more va means it's drawing more power so it mean that it it need to draw more power to operate so it means it's less sensitive the relay ideally the relay should be very sensitive it can sense a smallest uh, basically quantities so that it can operate easily so the next uh, thing to improve improve sensitivity is selecting the current correct voltage ratio so normally the voltage ratios of uh, for example if we take if we take an example of a feeder are selected how much load is supplied for example if the maximum load is 800 amperes so mostly we are selecting the ratio near to 800 like 900 or 1000 we are always allowing 110 to 20% we are considering as an overload so but if the uh, if we are not selecting the correct ct ratio for example if the load is 800 and we are selecting ratio like 3000 by 1 ampere so it mean that the sensitivity of the system is uh, compromised so for example if we are selecting 3000 by 1 ampere and full load even we are getting 50% of load is flowing so then it's like 400 is flowing divided by 3000 so the current secondary current will be 133 milli in that case so you need to select the proper cd ratio if you want to have the correct basically uh improve the sensitivity of the system so that's always very important so how how you can find out the sensitivity of the relay so here i have shown a snapshot from the relay manual of differential protection so this is a snapshot from the differential protection uh here you can see they have shown some values in the chart so let me show you that they have shown that differential protection can operate the operating range is 0.05 to 2 with a step of 0.01 so this relay can sense increase of 0.01 amps so this differential protection is very very sensitive so you can see it can detect the smallest change in the current and the minimum current it can it can detect uh, safely and operate is 0.05 so you can say the relay is very sensitive to detecting the smallest quantity and also to detecting the differential smallest differential step so other thing you can see other setting is high current stage uh, in the differential this is a second stage of differential so you can see the pickup is less sensitive because it is a second stage so it's a 0.5 uh, uh, amps 
235 amperes and step size is 0.1 so because this step is designed to detect the severe faults and heavy faults with the fault level can reach up to 20 to 30 times of um, normal load current so we don't need that much of sensitivity here so they have set this sensitivity uh, step is 0.1 so you can see this is an example of uh, differential protection sensitivity so here you can see some other tolerances are given here so this is an example how you can check your because basically you have to go to the relay manual and you can check how the relay is sensitive so uh, another uh, thing uh, that we can see here is so normally uh, another thing that we can see, we can see here that um, is that normally the relay which are used in power system production have their secondary um, basically rated current is either 1 ampere or 4, 5 ampere that is normally used so uh, in in the previous uh, days in the old days the relay was up to 5 ampere but in order to reduce the burden because 5 ampere relay has a higher burden than a 1 ampere relay so here you can see here also that uh, this is 1 ampere and 5 ampere you can see the burden this uh, this is the burden that we were discussing in our previous lecture the VA uh, in this lecture that we are discussing that similar is the VA more is a, uh, more the sensitivity of the relay so it means that if, uh, in the relay there is a uh, previously there used to be in C protect for plug settings so you if you if you open the relay from the back side you can change the plug settings and you can change the uh, current settings uh, from uh, 1 to 5 so okay you have done it but uh, things that you need to consider is that you need to also consider that now the VA burden of the relay has increased so there is a CT sizing calculation normally that is performed on each uh, substation so you need to uh, you need to recalculate the CT sizing calculations because uh, the VA burden connected to a CT basically this is a burden on the CT should be within the limits uh, so that the error should be within the limits so here you can see the same relay if you connect it 1 ampere and if you connect it 5 ampere the VA burden is increased so here you can check the VA burdens and you can check the sensitivity so 1 ampere same relay if you select it at 1 ampere the VA bur uh, the burden is less and the relay uh, will be considered to be uh, more sensitive than the VA burden if you select at uh, 5 ampere so the relay will be considered as a less sensitive <coughs> so uh, if you select the uh, ratio as 0.1 if you have a, this relay has option of 0.1 also so the VA burden you can see is uh, even more or less so the relay is very very sensitive and you can see for high sensitivity input at 1 ampere there is separate input in the relay for high sensitivity you can see at 1 ampere it is 0.05 amp is basically is the VA so this is an example that how you can basically uh, check the VA burden and what is the impact of VA burden on the on the system so basically CT uh, current transformer in each substation is connected to the wires and connected to the relays and each relay has its uh, uh, VA burden and each uh, wire if the length of wire is more and if the dia of the wire is less the VA burden will increase so all the VA is calculated and then based on this calculation CT size is calculated so if we are using a relay which is cheaper but it has a more VA burden so at the other end you have to select the CT uh, of a bigger size which can support the VA burden so you have to take care of all of these things in the substation while you are designing so this is some concept about the sensitivity so I hope that you enjoy my lecture thank you very much hi friends uh, next topic is reliability the system should be uh, reliable enough it means that uh, in case of fault it should always operate it should not happen that sometimes the relay operates and sometimes it did not operate 
so reliability is one of the key factors so uh, what is a normal practice of utility is that whenever a vendor is bringing or manufacturer is bringing it's a new relay if want to introduce in a network so they are keeping this relay as an you can say duplicate protection with existing feeders where which is prone to frequent faults and then they are checking the performance of the relay on these feeders and after years they are giving the approvals to use this relay on, on the network so it's a lengthy process and it's very that's why it's very important to have a reliable uh, protection relays and the scheme also should be reliable enough to work properly in in the system it is a reliability of the uh, relay system to operate under the predetermined conditions without reliability the the protection would be rendered largely ineffective and could be could even be become a liability so the reliability is always a key part so in order to check the healthiness of the relays that's why you know, in each year uh, or as per prescribed maintenance plan annual maintenance or five yearly maintenance relays or keep we are retesting the relay to check the healthiness of the relay thank you very much Hello friends, now the next important characteristics for the protection relaying is basically the speed. The relay should be fast enough uh, that it should detect the fault and the deduction uh, should be as fast as possible then it quickly um, basically react, it could quickly decide and then respond properly means first step is basically each relay is fed with the, some actuating quantity like voltage current or frequency etc and then the relay basically uh, converts this analog quantity now modern days relays are converting this quantity into a digital quantity and then uh, after converting it uh, into digital they are using some comparators and then checking the they are checking the set value versus actual value and if the limit is uh, if the uh, observed quantity is more or less than the predefined set limit then it has to take the quick action so the relay then issues uh, alarm trip uh, commands or LED indication as program and then this is called a uh, speed so uh, the speed is very important if the relay is slower to act then uh, the backup protection will operate and that will result in tripping on mm, basically the major area so fault will not be localized so more region will trip so this is always important to check the speed of the real in during commissioning time uh, what we are doing is that we are uh, putting the setting in the relay for example in distance protection zone 1 is instantaneous and then we are simulating a fault in zone 1 and then we are checking the time of the relay that how much time it should it operated and we need to check this time uh, uh, in which uh, the relay operates it should be uh, within the predefined limits or within the tolerance so this tolerance you can find from the relay manual each relay manual is uh, giving the tolerance of the uh, relay if the fault uh, uh, operating time of the relay is uh, beyond the tolerance then you need to replace uh, the relay basically uh, but it's not as easy as uh, uh, as you think how to we detect something happening miles away how do we react quickly enough electricity is traveling at almost at the speed of light how do we ensure that the response time is correct and incorrect response time could make the abnormal condition worse so some of the questions i have already answered so now I will take you to the relay manual. So here you can see this is the overcurrent protection, overcurrent and phase residual, residual current protection. So they have defined here some characteristics. As I told you, they have defined the steps. And in each uh, step, you can increase the pickup. And this is the step for time. 0.01 seconds so you can increase the time also then we have current stages then we have operating time of the definite time
so here you can see they have defined the tolerances with definite time as per IEC so these are the tolerances are within the IEC defined standard so the pickup current they have shown should it should pick up at 105 times the set value means 5% to 15% relay should picked up and this is the time tolerance so 5% plus minus 15 milliseconds is the time time tolerance and at frequency of 50 to 60 hertz and if the frequency is 16.7 hertz then tile tolerance is 47 45 plus minus 5 percent of the set value so this is basically the tolerance the result should be within this tolerance so they have you, you can find all these tolerances in basically the relay manuals and this should be as per IEC relevant standard IEC 2 so let's uh, go back to our slide and if you if you can see here again the example if for example there is a fault on the line and the trip time of the release 100 milliseconds of this uh, This relay has a trip time of, for example, 100 milliseconds, and this relay has a trip time of 200 milliseconds. Okay, so now there is a fault here. So if the relay is operating fast, so it will trip its uh, within this time. So let's see uh, this time plus relay operating time. The relay, for example, will trip. In this case is even 135 milliseconds so 35 milliseconds relay takes the time to trip and 100 millisecond is a preset time delay so relay trip it in 135 milliseconds and the timer of the incomer was 200 milliseconds so the incomer will not trip and the out outgoing field will trip now consider example that relay is uh, slow to operate so there is some problem in the relay so relay take instead of 135 millisecond relay took now 300 milliseconds to operate so there is some issue in the relay software so relay is taking 300 milliseconds relay is slow so only it's slow by you can see 200 milliseconds so um, you can see incomer setting is 200 relay stripping in 300 so incomer will trip first when this incomer trips you can see all this area will be shut down so the speed of the protection is very important it should be coordinated and should speed should be good also so this is an example of uh, speed that you need to consider so now we can move to our uh, new topic thank you very much another key factor for the good uh, protection system is the simplicity of the protection relays and protection systems so uh, it should be easier to operate uh, for example, uh, in a utility, uh, I have experienced that they were preferring a specific type of a relay by a specific manufacturer, even though it was expensive because they used to say that it's easy, very easy to operate and very easy to uh, maintain. So uh, simplicity is one of the key factors and uh, it, should, uh, it should be easier to operate and easier to maintain. For example, if a vendor is providing a uh, transformer or a GIS that is very perfect uh, it's very reliable and it's uh, cost effective even but it's difficult to maintain means if you want to you have to do the maintenance you have to open a lot of uh, uh, parts and, and even there is no access to some parts of the transformer or GIS so you need to dismantle complete base uh, to access certain parts so 
maintenance uh, point of view the simplicity also should be there the scheme should be very clear and easy to understand some of the production schemes in my career i have gone through and i find out that these are very complex schemes and the, uh, during commissioning it will increase the commissioning time obviously uh, but uh, for maintenance point of view if there is a fault and if you need to troubleshoot then it will be it will it will increase the time of fault uh, troubleshooting and rectification and analysis so the scheme uh, of the production scheme should be as simple and as effective as possible the softwares uh, nowadays uh, most of the release are numericals and even the softwares are used to communicate send the settings and receive the settings from the production relay i mean to download the fault records the software now there is now there is a concept that foster software should be uh, user friendly and easier to operate so these are all the requirements uh, nowadays from the new utility also the user friendly hmi uh, hmi is basically if you are facing a numerical relay there is a display on the uh, each uh, really nowadays so uh, the display should be user friendly if you don't even have a laptop it should be easier to operate and you you should be able to easier easily see the fault records and the events and alarms and the settings if you want to change the settings you, you should be able to change the settings from the hmi itself so these are all the uh, basic uh, requirements nowadays for a good production systems uh, thank you very much nowadays uh, there is a lot of competition in the market and market is becoming more and more competitive so the cost is all, uh, always uh, uh, one of the big big component uh, whenever you are selecting a production system or production release or production equipment so economy is one of the key factors uh, i have uh, gone through certain clients uh, that uh, they are preferring a new relay uh even though that the new relay is not that much user friendly but uh they don't have a big budget so they are preferring the new relay because its cost is uh, price is less uh so the co- uh, the price is always a key factor the ideal production system that we have to should should consider and design a production system we have to also consider the issue of price and the cost so nowadays the key players uh, in the global market which are uh, very famous uh, in the process of productions are abb for example uh, basler electric siemens ag nr electric company eton scl relays are very famous alstom general electric mitsubishi electric schneider electric toshiba fenox little fuse so there are a lot of uh basically companies which are in the market and which are there supplying their goods here you can see the estimated uh, basically and the projected uh here you can see the productive relay market by region in us dollar billion us dollars so each region is shown with different colors so here you can see europe is shown by blue north america is by this cyan color asia pacific is green middle east is yellow and south america is red so you can see easily the asia pacific is, is basically the highest at the moment where the highest investment is being done in the production systems and then it's north america and then europe this is uh, yellow color is the middle east market and this red is south american market so this is a serious business and uh, it's one of the very important aspects of this uh, energy uh, so this is uh, also an aspect that we need to consider when we are designing production system the cost thank you very much my friends uh, in this section we will discuss that what equipment uh, is used to perform production so at start so the equipment that's used to perform production relays are just one component of production production so the relays are just one component so there are other components also that we are using just like we are using of uh, other than relays are circuit breakers or switches 
basically we are using switches you can say isolators uh, we have bus parts so we have uh, side resistors lighting resistors we have input devices like CTs, current transformers, CTs, potential or voltage transformers, sensors, input and output devices. We are using DC system, batteries. We are using interconnections. We are using wiring control integration. There are a lot of monitoring devices, control devices uh, that are being used. Uh, so here you can see uh, this is basically the circuit breaker and uh, it's in, it is an uh, air insulated substation, it is an AIS. This area we are calling as a switch yard and uh, this is basically the box uh, near to the circuit breaker where the mechanism and the terminal interconnections are installed in it. This is called as the bushing of the circuit breaker and this is the tank of the circuit breaker and this is basically a picture of uh, isolator. So these both equipments are used in protection systems. Isolator is used to isolate. If you want to perform maintenance, you are, you have to first open the breaker and then after that you are opening the isolator. The reason is that uh, in the breaker you cannot see physical movement of contacts and the separation is not enough to perform any maintenance. So that's why always with the breakers you will find isolators where you can perform uh, if you want to perform maintenance, you have to open the isolator and then you have to connect the earth to the relevant portion. So what is the uh, difference between circuit breaker, isolator and load break switch? So we will uh, discuss now. Basically circuit breaker is on load, off load device it can also interrupt the fault current so and whereas isolator is basically an offload device means you cannot operate the isolator if there is a current flowing through the circuit then there is a load break switch load break switch is on load uh, or offload device but it cannot interrupt the fault current so circuit breaker basically whenever uh, circuit breaker uh, can be operated without load with load and also it can interrupt the fault current Circuit breaker uh, is basically also getting tripping commands uh, automatically in the case of fault from the release and there is a fault level, uh, fault, fault is directed from the release it is issuing the uh, basically the trip command, relay will issue the trip command it will be received by the circuit breaker and the circuit breaker will open and it will interrupt and it will break the fault current Whereas uh, load break switch uh, is basically you can uh, operate it off load, you can also operate it on load, you can break the load current, load current level is always uh, uh, is uh, uh, limited, for example it, will, it could be 10 ampere, it could be 50 ampere, 100, 200, 500 ampere, but uh, whereas the fault current level is always very high, mostly in kilo amperes. So the load current is designed as per load and it can break the load current but it cannot operate automatically. It cannot interrupt the fault current in case of fault appear in the system. So normally each substation mm, if you want to operate the isolator it is uh, necessary that first of all uh, you have to open the breaker. If the breaker is open then only you can operate the isolator so there is an interlock available between uh, breaker and isolator with an electrical interlock there is auxiliary contact of circuit breaker uh, which is wired up through the control circuit of isolator if the circuit breaker is closed you cannot open the isolator so there is an interlock in between them so that's the difference a uh, little difference about uh, circuit breaker 
uh, isolator and the load brick switch the, the, the switches we are using in our house to switch on and off the lights uh, are example of load brick switch where you are you, you can use it off load you can use it all load but it's it will not operate automatically you can also break the load current Uh, here you can see another primary equipment that is used to perform the protection it is basically the lighting arrester here you can see this is the picture of lighting arrester which is installed on a post insulator uh, uh, on the post uh, pole and this ring is basically the corona ring and the purpose of this ring is to distribute the voltage across this disc equally if you are not putting the ring here there will be more stress on the upper Early disc than the lower disc the so zero. this disc is distributing the voltage stress the equally the over the surge arrestor so this is the purpose of this uh, disc and so you can see this one this is basically the counter surge counter here you can and see so in this display this is uh, showing the leakage current in milliamps and this is uh, uh, is a counter which is showing the basically the zoom in this is basically a surge counter you can see how many of surges are grounded through this this portion will be connected to the to the open side and the downside portion will be connected to the Earth. and you can see you have to connect an insulated wire uh, from this terminal to the equipment so if you are not using insulated wire the surge will be grounded directly and this counter will be bypassed so what is the purpose of surge arrestor basically surge arrestor is a non-linear resistor uh, it means at the low voltage it has infinity resistance and at the high voltages, extra high voltages, the resistance is uh, reaching to minimum and it is then grounding the surge. So this is a very important equipment to ground the surge. Normally it is made up of, you can see by zinc oxides. Here is, uh, you can see the other equipment. This is the current transformer that we have discussed. If you go to the substation, uh, you will see the current transformer and the current transformer will be look like this so uh, how you can differentiate it you can see there is a one cable coming in and one cable coming out so current transformer is always put in series so this is the connection of current transformer so this is basically a input is providing an input to protection relays control relays and measurements the current input will provide it through this this is the circuit breaker you can see one is connected to the top another wire is connected to the bottom and in between there is an interrupted unit there is a moving contact so they have provided enough space and this you already know that this is a transformer um, which is used to step up and step down the voltages so here you can see this conductor is a hollow conductor and this is a post insulator and here you can see they have installed here again the surge arresters and through the CT this wires are connected this is an, another example of the equipment that we are using for the production of substation here you can see on the top uh, this wire is available and this uh, this basically uh, lightning mast it is protecting substation from lighting this is a uh, overhead shield wire and here this rod you can see is basically uh, the uh, lighting rod it is protecting the substation from lighting also so this is another protection so here you can see the primary equipment the voltage transformer this is basically the voltage transformer this one these are the VTs connected in the substations and, and this is uh, uh, I have shown you a gas insulated substation in this one uh, all the equipment that we have seen previously was outdoor 
it was uh, air insulated AIS but this one is gas insulated and we are normally using SSX gas in it SSX gas has uh, good uh, properties of insulation so in a small space you can have a big GIS or you can have a big uh, switch gear installed so the GIS is prepared uh, 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 over places where, we, where the land is very expensive and also the maintenance cost of uh, GIS is uh, very che uh, cheap and very less maintenance is there uh, on the on the GIS so uh, occasionally you will need some maintenance so that's why it has an added advantage uh, then you can see the picture of uh, AIS uh, you can see how much size is required here again you can see this is overhead shield overhead ground wire shield wire on the tower for lighting protection this you can see another shield wire here and you can see the gravel here uh, in, uh, basically I have explained about the gravel previously this is basically the cutout of the medium voltage switch gear I have a separate training about the medium voltage switch gear so if you are interested you can join my this training also if you are interested about how you are doing the earth design calculations of a gasing substation I have also a separate training in which you can uh, learn about this and if you want to study some relay coordination you can also join one of my training about the relay coordinations so this is the MV switch gear this is also used for perform the protection so uh, this is you can see this is here you can put the trolley in this trolley there will be a breaker and operating mechanism of the circuit breaker will be installed this is uh, basically the bus bar here you can see CT and VTs are connected protection relays are installed in this cabinet here and then you can see the battery systems why we need uh, basically the batteries um, uh, option A uh, you have in the substation in order to protect the uh, system you need uh, the relays and in, in order to operate the relays you need the power so if you choose an AC power to operate them if there is a fault the supply will also go off with the fault so it might be a fault where the whole substation is blackout so in that case there is no power so normally in each substation you will find these batteries so these uh, just like uh, in your houses nowadays you have seen a solar and you, or you have seen a UPS in which uh, you have installed a battery if main supply is failed then you are supplying your home through this uh, battery as a backup so in the same way uh, in the substation all the protection system control system is on the DC and it is backup by uh, normally this DC supply is provided by the chargers battery chargers and battery chargers are uh, converting AC supply to DC and then they are supplying to the relays control and production systems when the AC supplies fail then the charger uh, these batteries will feed basically the relays and production control system as a backup so that's why in each uh, um, substation you will find the batteries and normally there are uh, two batteries two backup um, uh, two banks in the in the substation bank one and bank two you will find two banks in each substation to protect so if one even one bank is failed another bank is can supply and also uh, if you have a two protection uh, protection system one and two normally protection system one is connected with bank one and protection system two is connected with bank two and then there is a charger so the batteries are uh, this is uh, from very famous brand Benny. so the the battery uh, AC supply is connected to this charger and output of this charger is DC so the uh, output is connected out to the batteries and this charger is charging the batteries and also the load is connected uh, through this charger so this is basically some introduction about some components of production systems that we required 
Thank you very much. I guess it's time to bowl as well. But hey friends, now I will just introduce you to single line diagram, which is also a <coughs> key document for protection and control systems. In a single line diagram, all the information uh, is shown on the high level. Uh, it means that you have to show a very basic information of our system. <coughs> for example, here you can see this dark line is showing here the bus bar. This is basically 11 kV. You can see the voltage level is mentioned here, 11 kV bus bar. <coughs> so the information about the bus bar is mentioned here. The continuous rating for the bus bar is uh, 300 ampere. It means that this bus bar can uh, conduct the load of 3000 ampere continuously without the temperature rise. Short circuit capacity for this bus bar is 25 kilo amperes and the duration for this is for 3 seconds it can bear 25 kilo uh, amperes. 50 hertz is basically the frequency, 3 phase is a 3 phase bus bar. And here further you can see it has an incomer K5 which is supply uh, the feeder or the which is connected to the bus bar and supplying the power to it is called incomer. So this is incomer K5 and it has then four outgoing feeders K1, K2, K3, K4. Uh, K1 is the capacitor bank here you can see. Uh, each and everything here is basically three phase but uh, for simplicity all three phase are shown by a single line. That's why it's called as a single line diagram. You can see here this is the breaker and this is the 11 kV switch gear that I have shown you already and uh, this double line means it, this, uh, it, this trolley doesn't have an isolator but you can rack out the trolley physically to create an isolation. So this facility of racking out is shown by these double arrows and then you can see this uh, C, uh, CT. It has a CT with the two cores, the two cores shown by the ring. The polarity of CT is, is shown by P1 and P2. This is the name of CT and you can see the CT ratios are mentioned here. This is the uh, basically class point 2. This is 4 metering. This is protection class 5P20 and this is the uh, rating of the CT which is in VA, 10 VA, 15 VA and this is basically uh, multi-ratio and multi-core CTs because it, two ratios can be selected 800 and 400 and, and it has two cores, second decide, so both are marked at 5-5. Breaker is shown by Q0 and the rating of breaker is 1 to 5 0 amperes which is less than the bus bar rating. Short circuit rating is same as the bus bar. So all the other feeders also have the same rating. Here you can see they have shown uh, this is the feeder K4 which is connected to the auxiliary transformer of the substation 11 kV by 415 volts and it is supplying power to the substation AC power. Here you can see this is showing as a cable ceiling end. The cable is connected. It is connected through a cable and it's, uh, it's basically 4 AWG 3 core cable. And here you can see uh, digital power meter, KWH meter, KVR meter. So all this information you can find high level information on single line diagram. So if you are more interested to learn about this, you can enroll in my uh, course which is explaining the single line diagrams in detail. So I hope you will, you will enjoy this training. Thank you. Hey friends, now I will show you another uh, drawings which are called as schematics drawings or we are calling them also as a detailed drawing. Basically each substation I have shown you a single line diagram and then this which is showing the high level information. Then we have a detailed drawings or schematic drawings which are showing in detailed information about the protection and control schemes. So let me zoom. So here you can see this is the uh, detailed drawing. 
so detailed schematic drawing look like this so where you can see some information detailed information for example i have uh, selected a drawing of a circuit breaker q1 it is not a single line diagram it's uh, showing each and every wire separately for example here you can see this is basically circuit breaker compartment this dash 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 line showing that this is another compartment this doesn't belong to the same drawing that we are looking in and we are at present looking in the drawing of line control cubicle uh, line control cubicle LCC is installed in front of GIS that I have shown you recently and uh, here you can see this is the tripping coil 1 on M602 and there are also some contacts and then it's you can see this point this is basically the male and female uh, contact of a hardening plug it's basically a plug it is shown here like this this is the uh, tripping coil 1 and this is basically you can see tripping coil 2 uh, this is sorry this is the closing coil uh, which is shown here and this is the counter whenever uh, breaker gets a pulse for closing the counter will operate and it will operate the how many times the breaker is closed so each substation is provided by uh, detailed drawings all the control production uh, panels alarm indication panels they have similar schematic drawings these are basically the auxiliary contact of uh, the relay SF6 stage 2 relay are shown here so this is a little introduction about the schematic drawings in the substation so I have separate trainings on these so if you are interested you can uh, check these trainings uh, in my profile thank you very much welcome friends in my, in my previous training I have told you that there is an interlock between uh, different components of substation and this interlocking is to prevent the mall operations the mall operation could be like uh, closing of a live line or while the earth thing switch is closed so such practices are avoided and we are trying to make the system foolproof and uh, for this uh, we have to do the electrical interlocks so and an example I have shown you a table okay in this table you can see uh, there is an equipment E01 line bay and it has some components like this is the breaker Q00 so this breaker can only be uh, closed when Q1 and Q9 are closed so let's see what are these So let's go to E01. This is E01. So I will zoom in. This is basically the line breaker. So this is basically the configuration of the substation. It has one 132 kV line as an incoming and one 132 kV line as outgoing. So it, it has only two lines. So you can see I can operate the breaker only when Q1 and Q9 both are 1-1 one, one means here you can see 1 means equipment HV equipment not in intermediate position I is basically I I means it's, it should not be intermediate uh, 0 O means HV equipment is in open position C means HV equipment is in closed position so I can operate the breaker uh, this is my single line diagram this is 132 kV uh, line bay this is my breaker Q0 uh, sorry this one is my breaker Q0 this is the bus isolator Q1 this is the bus bar uh, this is the arch switch to ground the breaker then you will move forward this is q9 is the line isolator q10 
8 is the line at switch so I can operate the breaker line breaker Q9 if my line isolator and bath isolator are either fully open or fully closed I cannot operate breaker when the isolator is in intermediate position so reason behind is this that as, as I told you that isolator is basically <coughs> A offload device if it is in, in intermediate position it means it's not fully closed and if I close the breaker then what will happen that there, there will be uh, arcing will be started between these two contacts which are not still closed so and and there will be a damage in in the isolator so that's fine to protect I can either operate the breaker if both of the isolator have completed their operations they should not be in intermediate position so this is an example <coughs> of uh, interlock table okay we'll see how can i operate i can operate bus isolator q1 if breaker is open q0 is my breaker line break breaker is open and q51 earth switch is also open so this is the requirement to close the isolator so isolator should never be closed when the earth switch is connected and when the breaker is open and it, it only be closed so this is an example of uh, interlock uh, uh, locking and this is interlocking table so in detail I have explained this one in my another training related to single line diagram introduction to single line diagram so if you want to have this you can join this training and uh, okay uh, so I hope you you understand some basic information of how interlocking is working thank you very much Hey friends, uh, here uh, I we will discuss about local control cubicle. In my previous uh, lecture, I have shown you the drawings or as a sample of local control cubicle. Basically, this is our GIS, and I will explain you a little bit about it. Uh, this is basically the current transformer here. This is the CT. If you visit the GIS and with experience, you will know this one. This is the breaker compartment. Here we have moving uh, fixed and moving contacts of the circuit breaker. This is the bus bar of the uh, GIS, bus 1, bus 2. This is basically the VT voltage transformer. Okay, here we have high speed earth switch. This one is the isolator, you can see it's a line isolator and this is the mechanism box for the circuit breaker and here you can see the GIS uh, the gas uh, is filled in the GIS but uh, all the GIS doesn't have, have one compartment so for the sake of control and for the sake of uh, uh, better operations the GIS is also divided in different compartments or parts and uh, each part is uh, gas is separated from another compartment for example here you can see this is uh, shown by red color this is shown by green color so uh, the red color means this part this complete part this is one compartment and here another compartment is starting this is a gas tight seal is installed in, in, in between this so we uh, we have to fill gas here and check the pressure and the gauge will monitor only the pressure of this uh, area so the green means permeable gas permeable ga uh, uh, compartment so it means that here the, the gas is not uh, tight and it means that this uh, VT and this uh, isolator and this earthing switch these are all in inside it has one compartment it has only one gas whereas you can see here the CT and the circuit breaker is also one gas compartment and one gas is filled or one one uh, our one gauge will be installed uh, on it so each uh, GIS is divided into several gas compartments and they are shown by this uh, color red and green gas tight or gas permeable and each compartment is then monitored by a separate uh, gas SFS gas monitor. 
and here you can see the bus bar also has a different compartment which is hidden behind this and uh, you can see th this is basically the control cubicle which is called as local control cubicle LCC and here you can see this LCC and this area especially if you see from the front you will see the LCC like this and this area is basically the is called as mimic and here you can see the symbols as I shown you single line diagram you can see the symbols of uh, this is basically the called as SEMA4 indications So these are called as SEMA4 indications at present uh, they are in the middle state because DC supply is off when you switch on the DC then you will get the actual status of isolator. If this line is in line with the uh, this uh, main mimic line the SEMA4 is in line it means its isolator is closed and if this is perpendicular to the uh, mimic line then it means that isolator is open so you can see this is isolator symbol is shown by circle whereas a breaker symbol is shown by a square and you can see this is the earth switch and this is the voltage transformer connected here at the line and these are the bus bar you can see this is bus 1 this is bus 2 if you see further in detail you can see they have written here G3 so and G5 so these are basically gas compartments so this is the gas compartment number one which is uh, G5 and there is another gas compartment which is G3 as I have shown you in which it, uh, there is CT and breaker R in the one, one gas compartment it is G3 and another compartment has a VT and the earth switch is uh, is in the another gas compartment here and in the same way you can see the bus uh, one is shown in one gas compartment g1 up to this point and the another bus is shown in g2 so normally uh, you will see a gas diagram for the uh, for the gis uh, which is showing different compartments uh, they are also drawing this gas diagram on like this one on the mimic so if you want to do the maintenance of for example bus bar you have to close uh, you uh, you have to close this switch and then you can close the isolator the other way is you can close uh, there is a bus bar earthing switch is installed on each bus so you have to isolate all the there is an interlock between the bus bar switch and the bus isolators so you have to open all the isolators then you can connect the bus bar as switch and then you can do the maintenance on it. So on the top you can see two annunciators. So one annunciator normally in LCC feed by AC supply and one is feed by the DC supply. So if uh, DC supply fail the al alarms will appear by AC and if the AC supply is failed then alarm are normally shown by the DC. So here you can see uh, this is basically the single line diagram of the GIS this is double bus bar and single breaker scheme and they have shown this is called as a gas diagram in which they have shown the gas compartment so you can see this is the gas compartment number 3 feeder gas compartment uh, which has the VT as we have seen just now and it has the earthing switch and and the uh, cable compartment everything is in one compartment this double door uh, this uh, dark color line is showing basically the gas tight element so you can see the voltage transformer has a separate gas compartment in in this case so uh, we have one two three four five gas compartments here so one gas compartment is vt and the gas uh, uh, compartments are shown by a uh, normally orange color uh, which are gas tight and the parts which are not gas tight for example uh, they are not shown by any color or you can use a green color in that case so this is a this is basically a single line diagram this is the is called as a gas diagram gas compartment diagrams and this is basically the cutout that we have shown 
of a circuit breaker just for uh, your understanding uh, thank you very much hello friends uh, in this section i will just uh, go through some basic components which are used in the protection systems uh, this is basically an hardening plug you can see it's a plug uh, this is the main part of the hardening plug and this is the female part the main part is connected here you can see to the cable and instead of connecting wires to the terminal block you can just plug in and plug out a uh, reason for using this uh, type of hardening plug is that uh, normally sometimes it's required to do maintenance and um, and you need to remove some of the component of the GIS so if there are terminal blocks and then it's uh, you will remove the wire one by one and then after finishing the commissioning uh, you, when you put the part back you have to connect it back one by one so which is a lengthy process the second advantage of using this hardening plug is when during commissioning uh, for example when uh, the GIS is delivered at site, you just have to plug in these plugs. Plugs are pro uh, supplied uh, along with the GIS, and just you, you, you should know the correct cable and the plug number, and then you can insert the plugs, and then you can switch on the hardening, uh, switch on the GIS. So these are some different types of hardening plug. So here you can see this hardening plug is installed here. You can simply plug in the cables instead of connecting one by one to the terminal block so you will find these hardening plugs everywhere in the GIS uh, you can see this is basically this side is the local control cubicle and uh, this is also connected by a hardening plug so it's easier to uh, operate and connect and remove so it's uh, very uh, very uh, basic and good uh, tool uh, further here in the GIS you can see this one is basically the SF6 gauge monitor which is monitoring the SF6 of this gas compartment where VT is installed. So how does uh, this hardening plug look like in the drawing I have shown you previously let me take it back again. So this, this is the drawing of LCC that I have shown you previously so you can see here they have shown the hardened plug like this is the male part and this is the female part so the both uh, of these compartments s1 and q and circuit breaker both are connected through the hardening plug so in the drawing they are showing hardening plug like this hey friends let's start our new topic and it is related to the battery charger so why we need battery chargers in a protection system it is necessary that the control DC voltage uh, will shall remain constant for us uh, for as much time as possible so that the system works without interruption hence the batteries are normal kept on charge continuously by a battery charger the charger is a rectifier which produces a slightly higher voltage compared to the nominal cell voltage of battery However, when the batteries get fully charged and their voltage reach at set value, the flow of charging current through the batteries is stopped. The, the main power source is derived from normally available AC source, which is rectified by the charger. Typically, connection are shown in the figure. We will see this figure in the next, that how they are showing the connections. So, uh, then the function of this, uh, there, there are some functions available in this uh, battery. One is trickle charging, one is floor charging, one is boost charging, and one are the dropping diodes, and one are the terminal voltages. So, we will discuss these things one by one. So, here you can see, this is basically the single line diagram of the uh, station. Uh, charger so here you can see three phase AC supplies coming in and then there is MCB of uh, 125 uh, ampere and is basically uh, then it's going to a, another three phase transformer and then it's going to rectifier from after the rectifier also 
there is basically a fuse you can see fuse installed okay and then they have put a limiting reactor so this il1 is a dc uh, this is a dc filter chalk so uh, if, if it's still there is any uh, uh, ripples <clears throat> after the rectification this chalk will remove this ripples and then you can see one connection is coming and at this point the voltages uh, this is the uh, terminal of the rectifier we can see and the voltage available here will be called as a terminal voltage so you can see then through ISH3 which is basically a cutout fuse and they have also installed ammeter here and these voltages are fitted uh, to the battery bank so here you can see a battery bank installed and in this there are total 184 batteries and uh, in during the float the charger will supply uh, 257.6 volts at, at the float condition and in the boost uh, charging the charger will supply 280 volts uh, DC total so there are the float and boost voltages uh, in the charger you need to set total number of voltages and the float and boost voltage per cell so if you calculate here the per cell voltage it would be float will be 257.6 divided by 184 so the float voltage per cell are here 1.4 and boost voltages per cell are 1280 divided by 184 so 1.52 is the boost voltage where is a battery rated voltage is around about because it's a nickel cadmium so the battery rated voltage are around about 1.2 volts so you can say normally the battery remains on float mode and when battery is discharged more or uh, then it is uh, we are um, changing it to the boost mode there is also automatic option in which the charger will check itself and it will convert uh, the battery from float to boot automatically so you can see and then from here the another connection is going to basically here you can see going to this strapping diode so here you can see v7 here is a blocking diode uh, this is the blocking diode v7 so what is the purpose of this blocking diode it's basically blocking any feedback from this side okay so and then there is a basically another mcb and then you can see these are basically the regulator we are calling it as a dropping diodes and uh, this has two steps you can say there are two contactors used k6 and k7 then for example uh, if k6 is closed some diodes will be bypassed and if k6 is open this diode will be in into the system so when you are ordering any charger you need to uh, see the that how many dropping diodes are used and how many steps they have provided to control the voltages so uh, more the steps it means that more regulation is possible and more the number of diodes it means the total bandwidth will be more and then here you can see this is further connected to uh, the DC distribution board so this is one of the very simplified uh, diagram for the DC uh, charger here we have shown you two sets of batteries are installed at the substation this is to be achieved redundancy so always uh, we are installing two sets of batteries and two set of chargers sometime I have seen there are three chargers installed in the substation so one charger is kept as a backup so if one charger is failed so another charger come in into the action so here you can see these are the chart uh, uh, which is shown shown for lead acid batteries so the float uh, charge is for lead acid batteries is 2.23 and uh, the boost uh, charge is 2.4 volts and here you can see there are some typical type of uh, charging time for different type of systems so this was a brief introduction about the uh, basically the uh, the battery chargers 
so uh, now we will go through some definitions of float chargers uh, float charge and uh, boost charge and dropping diodes so the float charge is keeping the voltage applied to the battery at the manufacturer specified float voltage per cell which is normally 2.25 for lead acid and 1.35 for nickel cadmium multiplied by number of cells such uh, setting adjustment which is normally available in charger is carried out before connecting the battery with the charger this with this therefore maintain a constant voltage across each cell and the battery bank as whole this method is usually adopted in conjunction with supplying continuous variable dc loads from the charging equipment as should as would typically happen for substation batteries the load in a substation normally comprises of small continuous load consisting of pilot lamps relays etc and momentary short time load of comparatively high values such as those for circuit breaker tripping and closing operations motor bound spring and so on since the charger battery and loads are all connected in parallel the continuous load is carried by the charger at normal floating voltage and the battery draws its own maintenance current at some at the same time any load that exceed the charger capacity will lower its voltage slightly to the point where the battery discharge to supply the remainder if there should be complete power failure the battery will supply entire load for a period depending upon ampere hour capacity and the load until ac power is stored and then automatically starts being recharged typically float current will be in range of 30 to 50 milliamps per 100 ampere hour of rated capacity increasing to about 10 times towards the end of battery life so boost charging uh, boost charging it is a fast charging process through which relatively high voltage is applied across battery which causes higher charging current to flow here also applied voltage is in accordance with the manufacturer specified boost voltages per cell similar to float charging process the battery bank boost voltage is also adjusted in the charger the process is normal normally adopted when battery is sufficiently discharged due to supply or charger failure however battery manufacturer recommend to carry out process after some appropriate intervals may be about 6 months even if there is no any charging source failure this improves serviceable life of the battery trickle charge trickle charging is a method of keeping the cell in fully charged condition by passing a small current through them the correct trickle charge current is that which does not allow cell to discharge does not allow cell to discharge gas and does not allow a specific gravity to fall over period the cell voltage will be approximately 2.25 volts for lead acid battery and 1.35 volt for the nickel cadmium batteries so these are some definitions and some theory that i would like to share with you so i hope you enjoy my lecture thank you very much hey friends uh, in this session we will see the two different components uh, one is uh, terminal block another one is drain rail basically uh, you can see this one is a terminal block and uh, it is installed in almost in each and every protection and control panels and uh, this uh, metallic uh, uh, u shaped bar is basically uh, called as a drain rail so this terminal block is locked uh, on the drain rail and it can be removed also and the drain rail is mounted on the panel you can see this uh, area where you can put a screw and then you can mount it on the any panel wall so how terminal block look like uh, in the real drawing so let's open the drawing for example so you can see this uh, they have shown a terminal x101 1 and 4 this is a positive and negative terminal 
here you can see that uh, uh, DC power supply is coming from external of these panels this long dash and then dot it's showing that this is coming from external and it's coming to the terminal blocks x101 positive and x1014 negative is coming so the terminal block are shown like this in the drawing then another supply is connected here also uh, here you can see DC panel DC2 x1041 and 4 is connected so this is how the terminal blocks are shown in the drawing so we will see further go through the drawing you can see and this is the CD circuit and it is coming from core 2 of the CT and then it is connected to the terminal first X3, 7, 11 and 13 of XDCT2 and this is this terminal is in the LCC you can see this is LCC panel E01 LCC and then it is coming to this protection panel R03 R1 to the terminal X1-11, 2, 3 and 4. So this is a little introduction about the terminal block and if you want to know in detail so you can check another on my other trainings on the production systems. Thank you very much. Hello friends, in this section we will study uh, about auxiliary relays. Uh, basically auxiliary relays uh, are basically used uh, in uh, to prepare a schematics uh, control and production schemes also these are uh, used as a supporting role to the main relays alarms indications and sometimes trippings are also connected uh, through this auxiliary relays interlocking if you want to make an interlocking circuit you need to have auxiliary relays uh, to perform different interlocks so uh, the, all these relays are uh, function as an addition to the main production release. So main production relays are basically sensing uh, the actuating quantity, voltage, current, frequency, etc. And then they are uh, comparing it with the preset value and then they are making some decisions, alarm, stripping, etc. Whereas these uh, auxiliary relays have a more of kind of supporting function and uh, and these are used in, uh, in in control and production. So there there could be different types of uh, auxiliary relays. So uh, one could be one could be uh, auxiliary could be AC or DC. It means that there are auxiliary relays uh, which operate on AC supply, whereas there are some auxiliary relays which are uh, 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 energized and and, and used uh, on DC system. So then we have uh, um, auxiliary relays. Uh, types can be classified as instantaneous or time delayed or with timer. So auxiliary relays uh, have uh, can be uh, instantaneous type. When it means as soon as you energize an auxiliary relay, it will operate or it could have on a timer. So um, as soon as it is energized, the timer will start and after preset time, it will. Uh, operate the contacts. So here you can see in auxiliary relay, this is uh, basically auxiliary relay, and this uh, black color downside is basically the it is called as the base of auxiliary relay. So the auxiliary relay uh, here you can see is connected to the base and it can be removed uh, from the base. Uh, here you can see the auxiliary relay, uh, another type of auxiliary relays uh, which are with flag, and this is one is without flag. Basically, uh, uh, each auxiliary relay um, can have flag or cannot have flag depending upon your ordering. So some auxiliary relays have that have flag, it means that when these auxiliary relays are operated, there is a flag that appears. So when the condition is reset, this flag will not reset automatically. So you can see this is, uh, they have given a reset uh, button here, you have to push it and then it will will be reset. So there are some auxiliary relays which are self resetting uh, which flag is will be reset automatically but there are uh, other auxiliary relays you have to uh, reset it manually but there is a flag when the relay operate the flag comes for example uh, in this case uh, uh, for example if, if uh, the relay is connected to, to some monitor the DC supply 
if this is a flag file this flag will come and you need to re reset it manually and this relay is uh, coming without any flag so you can see here another type of auxiliary relay so this type of auxiliary relay when this uh, relay is, uh, is basically power on it has an LED or when it's picked up this LED will be on so by checking this uh, LED itself uh, you can uh, you can check and you can confirm that the relay, uh, the relay is picked up and it's, uh, energized here you can see uh, there are some contacts they have shown this is basically the coil of the auxiliary relay and one you have to connect uh, to negative and two to the positive this is a DC supply relay and these are the contacts of auxiliary relay so you can see when the these contacts are drawn when the, uh, when the relay auxiliary relay is considered as de-energized so you can see here that uh, 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 it has one two three four changeover contacts so uh, 3 and 11 is you can see a normally closed contact and 7 and 3 is a normally open contact so normally closed contact is contact when the relay is de-energized this contact is closed so you can see it is closed at the moment and 7 and 13 is normally open means when the relay is de-energized this contact is open so this is a little definition of normally closed normally open uh, contacts and these are change over contacts you can see this contact changes position from 11 to 7 so you can utilize these contacts for interlocks alarms in the scheme so here you can see more other types this is another auxiliary relay and you can see uh, this is type is uh, v80rh3 so you can see it has the flags as soon as it operates it will give indication uh, here you can see this is another auxiliary relay which is which will be mounted on the base as i have shown you previously and they have shown here you can see they have shown it has two changeover contacts so and the supply is connected to two and seven the supply of this coil is connected to two and seven and uh, it has two changeover contacts so you can see here that uh, normally closed contact is at one and four and normally open is at one and three similarly normally closed contact another uh, is at five and eight and normally open is at eight and six this is basically a uh, we, this also auxiliary relay but we are calling it as a contactor a typical term for this type of uh, device is a magnetic contactor or, or a contactor this is uh, heavy duty it has a more capacity uh, current carrying capacity than this this small relay so here you can see they have also shown the coils a1 a2 and they have shown the contacts available in this contact it has one two three four normally open contacts are available for this uh, this is another picture for the magnetic contactor so here you can see uh, how the auxiliary relay is drawn on the circuit so this is basically auxiliary relay and it has uh, these contacts when the relay operates this contact will change its position so this was a little introduction about the auxiliary relay i hope you enjoy this section thank you hey friends if you visit uh, any substation you will find uh, protection panels and what are protection panels in the protection panels uh, all the protection devices are installed which are protect, protecting a specific part of the uh, of the substation it could be like line it could be like transformer shunt reactor circuit breaker so there are a lot of protections available so here you can see uh, this is a panel uh, where you can see a lot of protection devices are uh, installed 
so this is basically this big one is the main protection relay and these are you can see these are small are the auxiliary relays which are installed this is again the main protection relay we are calling and this is basically the main protection relay again and this is the auxiliary protection relay so this is the main this is the main main and these are auxiliary protection relays so a protection panel is basically you will find the components like main protection relays auxiliary protection relays terminal blocks you will find a door switch a bulb ac socket you will find <coughs> terminal blocks you will find the external internal cables you can find the earthing plates and auxiliary relays you all such stuff uh, is available in the protection panel thank you so i thought it's uh, worthy to show you a uh, protection secondary drawing for a protection panel so this is how the drawing start in the start you can see the cover sheet it's uh, telling you about uh, how many pages are available in the drawings and what is on each sheet especially you can see then you can find different operators uh, here for example which relay is installed and the line of cell 411L, uh, overcurrent and earth fault protection, tripping relay, DC supervision relay. So all the details are shown here. Then you can see in this drawing the symbols, legions are shown here in this protection and control drawing. Further they have shown a single line diagram here in which you can see all high level information like how many CTs and VTs are installed, which relays are installed. You can see there they have shown the four cores here. Then they have listed down all the components available in the production panel. Here you can see the digital design is starting. They have shown how AC supply is connected. So in each, this is the lamp. And this is the AC socket. This is basically the humidity sensor. And here you can see this uh, space heater is installed. The space heater is installed in each protection control panel to control the moisture. So if there is a moisture, then uh, there, there is a chance of rusting. So as soon as the temperature falls below the set value, the space heaters are switched on. And then you can see the two DC supplies are coming to the panel and this is the changeover. Then they have shown basically the CT and VT circuits. I'm just taking through you very fast and how protection schemes and detail design look like. And here you can see these are binary inputs. Different inputs are coming from the field like circuit breaker status, PLC status. Then here you can see there are these are the lockout relays. Lockout relays are basically protection uh, uh, for example, here overcurrent protection is not uh, issuing trip directly to the tripping coil, but it's issuing trip to 86 lockout relay. And then lockout relay further giving trip command to the uh, LCC. Uh, this is basically to protect the relay contact itself. So in this case, if for example, if the relay has a low burden contact or if you want to save the relay contact itself because it's difficult to if the relay contact get damaged, it's difficult to replace the relay contact. But if you are initiating another relay through this relay contact, and then this relay is taking all the burden. If this relay is damaged, then you can you can have a spare and you can easily replace this relay. So that's why the concept is to use another uh, relay. And here they are using uh, also lockout relay 86. So if this relay operate, uh, the lockout relay has a feature that it will not allow circuit breaker to close unless this relay is reset. So this is a function of lockout relay in protection systems. Here you can see trip coil one. And here you can see they have installed a trip circuit supervision relay. So this is how this drawing is look like. Then they have uh, connections to SCADA alarms to an alarm panel, SCADA panel. And at the end they are showing the drawings of first of all of all the main relays like this is SEL line production relay uh, backup overcurrent relay 
and then they are showing the detail about auxiliary relays after that this is basically a test plug they have shown and they have at the end they have shown the layout so this is how this is how the protection second time look like so i hope you enjoy this portion Thank hello friends uh, previously we have discussed a little bit about the auxiliary relays now we will discuss about the main relays so main relays uh, uh, basically uh, all the ct and vt inputs uh, current transformer and voltage transfer inputs are normally connected to these main relays and these main relays are basically the main devices which are monitoring different voltage and current and impedance parameters of the substation or the power plants and they are also called as a brain of substation or a power system and what we are doing we are putting the settings uh, in this uh, relays and they are continuously comparing the set value uh, with, uh, with a measured value and they are making all the decisions and if it's necessary to trip the breaker then they are also making the decision so here you can see this portion of the relay is called as HMI so here you can scroll and you can see different alarms events settings in the relay also if you want to change the settings you can change it you and this these are normally protected by the password so uh, all these things can be done from the front uh, this area is basically these are uh, led these are uh, the leds so if some event happen for example red phase pickup yellow phase pickup blue phase pickup this led will be glow and it, if you program it as a latch it will be latched it will remain and operator after the fault uh, he can come and he can check which fault has which loop has a fault and what type of fault is it and he, he can gather all the information from from the relay itself from the front and here you can see this is the keypad where you can enter the values and you can scroll through this uh, uh, this menu through these arrows so there are different type of the relays I have, I'm showing you so main relays, um, the relays such as over current relay, over voltage, under voltage relay, frequency relays, differential relays, distance relays, RF relays, over saturation relays and except and many other relays. These are all example of main relays. So nowadays you will see more and more microprocessor based relays uh, as, as I have shown you here. Uh, previously relays were electromagnetic uh, mostly uh, but now you will see most uh, mostly the uh, microprocessor based release so uh, I hope you enjoy this section thank you very much so here uh, I will show you in the drawing uh, in this drawing they have uh, this is our main production uh, differential production and distance production relay F87L so they have shown this relay at the end of the drawing and uh, uh, wherever the uh, in this drawing and the connections are shown they have shown the page number for example this is the CT circuit for the relay and it is shown by IAW, IBW and ICW and if you want to see uh, where uh, the CT circuit is connected you can go to sheet 25.7 and you can see the drawing of CT circuit so this is how they have shown the CT circuit I will show you later on and if you want to see the VT circuit uh, for this relay VT is connected on these terminals of the relay and you can see from where it's coming at 25.7 so let's go to 25.7 to see CT and VT circuit so this is basically the page which they refer so here you can see this is the CT circuit this is a current transformer that we have already a little bit gone through it and this coming through this uh, this is the local control cubicle and through this and this is the terminal blocks on the local control cubicle then it's coming to the protection panel RP03 R1 X1-1 terminal block 1 2 3 4 and then it's further coming to the task block so if you want to perform any testing you can insert the plug and then you can inject the current and voltages here here you can see this odd side is switch yard side and the even side is the relay side 
and you can see the CT is connected to the relay and this is the VT circuit in the same way VT is connected so you can in the same way you can find all the information of the relay if you want to scroll and you can see uh, further you will see the power supply this is the power supply it is connected at 30.2 these are the binary inputs IN201, 202, 203 these are all the binary inputs you can see on the sheet number 31 these are the binary outputs so if the relay sends a fault it can issue the trip alarms and it you can see th these are used on different sheets this is the communication channel because it's line differential relay so it is communicating also to the remote end so these are all our input outputs are shown here in the same way all uh, we will see another this is the f51 this is basically the over current relay this is the current input this is the voltage input and these are the binary inputs this is the power supply this here you can see this is the changeover contact and this is the normal contact so this is the difference between changeover and normal contact so this is how the these relays are shown in the drawing thank you very much hey friends let's start our new topic uh, the burden the burden is actually the load on the secondary what is referred to as a burden to avoid confusion with the primary load uh, current transformers are usually designed for either metering or relay applications so basically uh, uh, whatever uh, on the CT secondary and VT secondary that especially uh, we are using a term burden uh, if for example if you if you connect uh, a relay to the CT secondary so it means you are adding a burden to the relay secondary all the CT and VTs uh, their rating is shown as uh, VA for example CTVT can be shown as 20 VA or 30 VA uh, it's called as basically the burden uh, rated burden for the CT if you you connect more if you connect more load or if you connect more uh, burden than the rated one it, and then the accuracy of the CT will be compromised so here you can see uh, this is a nameplate of a CT and you can see uh, this is uh, the rated VA so this can this CT has uh, basically two different cores so this one S1 S is showing secondary and one is showing that this is the core one and two is showing it is a core two and this is the secondary side terminal one and two so this CT has a two core primary is rated at 150 if 150 ampere is there the secondary will have a 5 ampere at the secondary side so the rating of this uh, both cores is 15 15 VA and uh, class here you can see is the accuracy class is 0.5 and uh, it means it, this uh, type of CT has an error of 0.5 percent and uh, here you can see this uh, accuracy class for this uh, protection class for this uh, CT is 5p10 so here uh, 10 is basically accuracy limit factor and uh, 5p is basically the accuracy class it's mean that it this CT have 5% could have 5% error if the current is 10 times the rated current so rated current is 150 so if 1500 ampere is flowing through this CT the ratio of the error could be five percent so we are basically uh, measuring the rating of the ct with the va and all the basically uh, relays uh, they have mentioned that what is the burden of the rear relay itself so previously i've shown you if you use a relay at one ampere and five ampere so burden increase at five ampere then then a one ampere relay so this term burden especially is used with CT and VT in the power system production. So I hope you enjoy this uh, small uh, topic. So we'll move to the next uh, topic. Thank you very much. Hi guys, whenever manufacturer is, is supplying any relay uh, and then it's also supplying that what is the burden of the relay. Uh, you can also measure the burden of the relay by applying the rated voltage and then you can use a clamp on uh, to measure the current uh, for example if it's a 
basically a CT circuit then you have to apply the rated 1 ampere and then you can measure a voltage across this relay then you will be able to measure the VA burden of the relay. So here you can see uh, I have shown you uh, you can find the VA burden uh, of the relay in the relay manual uh, which is provided with the relay itself. So in this manual I have shown you that uh, uh, there is a relay which is 1 ampere or you can also choose it to to be connected at 1 and 5 normally on the if you remove the cover there is a basically jumper is provided and uh, if you change the setting of the jumper you can convert the relay from 1 to 5 but uh, the remarkable difference uh, you can see here is that if you change the uh, relay from 1 to 5 the V rating the burden is also increased so in previously the practice was to use uh, 5 ampere relays but uh, in future in order to reduce basically the burden mostly now uh, in, uh, everywhere you will find mostly the 1 ampere relays because uh, if you use a 5 ampere relay so you might uh, save some cost or uh, if you but uh, you, the burden will increase and then you need to increase the size of CT. So that's why it's always you need to uh, check each and everything before designing the system. Thank you very much. Hello friends, uh, in this section uh, we will move to the next topic and that is uh, how to apply protective relaying, how to apply the protection system practices. So it's all about, uh, it begins with the uh, engineering design stage. First of all, the base designs are prepared and base design basically having a high level of information uh, like uh, how many should be, we have the line base, how many should be the bus power, either it will be a single bus power or double bus power scheme or it will be double breaker, single uh, double bus single breaker scheme or it will be a one and a half breaker scheme. So all these things are uh, finalized uh, in the base design stage and then single line diagram is prepared and single line diagram is showing all the uh, high level information how many CTs and VTs are used after we are finalizing the single line diagram the relay meeting SLDs are prepared uh, relay meeting SLDs are showing which protections will be used and how many CT codes will be used what is the specification of CT codes and all this information is finalized uh, further in this design stage which is the first phase of design stage uh, voltage and drop and sizing calculations are done for the CT uh, for this uh, AC and DC circuit uh, CT sizing and sufficiency calculations are also done in this stage to check how, what is basically the size of CT required adequate for uh, carry the burden of relays and uh, also the cable's length and the burden on the CT depends on the length of the cable, the cross section of the cable and the burden of the relays. Then short circuit level is also confirmed and uh, this is very important also. So short circuit level uh, you are, uh, it is the main input uh, for designing the mesh earth mesh and also for procuring the high voltage equipment each equipment is rated for certain short circuit for a given time then you have earthing design calculations uh, you have to do design the earth and you have we will calculate all permissible values like uh, allowable touch and step potential allowable voltage rise so each thing should be under control uh, after doing all these things, we are proceeding to the detailed design stage in which we are preparing the detailed design of uh, different production and control systems. So, after detailed design is uh, completed, uh, then it's such a time to go manufacturing go ahead. So, then similarly LCC drawings are finalized which are total control cubicle drawings. 
interlocking are also finalized and reviewed in this stage. Uh, if you are doing the planning of uh, uh, adding a new power plant, then you will have to do the load flow studies. You have to simulate the dynamic models. So these all things are done at the engineering part of you. Similarly, relay settings are also prepared based on provided data. So after design approval, manufacturing go ahead is given. And when manufacturing go ahead, given manufacturer start preparing the equipment protection panels and GIS and uh, when the GIS is ready uh, FAT factory acceptance test is done at uh, factory premises at approved test formats uh, normally the, th uh, the possibility is to use a third party inspector or you can also client sometimes also want to visit so he can visit himself and we have a packing list and delivery to the site when the equipment is delivered at site, uh, normally process starts with request for material inspection. As soon as the material arrives at site, RM, RMI is issued and the material inspected. It should be not defective during transportation. It should be as per the drawings. Uh, bill of quantities is also checked. After material is inspected, then the next phase is to do the installation. For this one, request for inspection is done. Uh, in this inspection, uh, the stall equipment is checked and if there is any comment is passed on and it is corrected. After installation is finished, the next phase is to start the equipment testing. Individually, each equipment like CT, PT, generator, motor are tested individually and the results are recorded. When the equipment testing is finished, then next process is to start the commissioning and integrating individual equipment components together. So. Uh, this process when is complete then the final process is basically checking all signals, trippings, command operations of the complete system uh, internally and with externally to other panels. Finally the closed loop is done in which all the alarms and signals are tested from first of all locally at local substation which is called as local closed loop and from uh, next from the remote substation uh, remote control center which is called as remote closed close loop. So when system is commissioned successfully after that it comes the part of doing the maintenance. So maintenance uh, uh, first of all uh, in during operation and maintenance the one part is to take the uh, hourly daily monthly readings as per the decided frequencies to do the routine maintenance, to do the preventive maintenance, uh, to do the annual maintenance. Uh, also, there are some tests which are recommended by manufacturer to do it in five yearly basis. During uh, maintenance, uh, we are checking trip, uh, we are checking interlocks, uh, we are checking batteries, relay testing, equipment testing, insulation testing, all uh, has been performed during man animal maintenance testing. Then we have uh, if there, there are faults uh, instead of any fault then uh, these faults are analyzed and finally root cause analysis report is issued so this is basically the process by which we are continuing the production system um, from start and thank you very much hey friends now start our new topic that is about uh, zones of protection in previously we have studied that zones of protection uh, to make zones of protection is very important in power system protection this will help to localize the fault and uh, only the, that portion of the uh, protection system will be out uh, which is basically feeding the fault so this is basically the comp concept So here you can see uh, we have a protection system. Just consider the case where we have two generators which are feeding a protection system. On here you can see on the left side and the right side we have one more generator, we have one motor and uh, we have one substation which is working as uh, to make a ring. Then we have another substation where we have uh, four outgoing feeders and two incoming feeders. 
so here i have to start to make uh, zooming so first of all i will uh, start to make uh, zooms on individual feeder itself so i started with uh, four feeder protection zones so it means if any fault occur and only this feeder should trip if the fault is on the feeder itself this uh, square uh, or rectangle is basically the showing as a circuit breaker this is the symbol of transformer uh, this dark line is symbol of a bus bar and this is, uh, line is showing a feeder basically so i in the stage one i have prepared uh, the zones for feeders stage 2 uh, we can mark also here uh, zones I, I have make a separate zone on the motor and i have included the breaker it means if there is a fault on the motor then the breaker uh, will trip and it can isolate the fault so let's now start making another zones okay now i have make uh, created further zones so this is the zone 1 between this and this breaker this is another zone this is another zone this is another zone so these are you can see this could be regarded as basically the transmission uh, line protection so we consider them as a transmission line so each line i have make a separate protection zone so here you can see uh, one difference here you can see this transmission line has a breaker at one end and the other end is directly connected to the transformer so i have uh, you cannot isolate uh, this part of if there is a fault you cannot isolate the line itself because it is connected directly to the transformer so i have to include the uh, transformer and the breaker so if there is a fault in order to isolate i also have to isolate the transformer itself so i have included this transformer and breaker in this zone uh, in this case you can see I have two breakers one is before transformer one is after transformer so I have make a zone uh, where I have included the breaker uh, before transformer and the line breaker so if there is any fault I will prefer to trip and isolate this portion only so I have this, this zone similarly I have make two more zones here uh, one zone I have make uh, for this line from breaker to breaker and one is zone is here from breaker to breaker so now you, you I have prepared three zones so far feeder protection zone this is the feeder protection that we have created first then we have created the motor protection and then we have created the line protection uh, number three I have created and the zone for generator protection so I have created two zones in zone one you can see i have taken a complete generator and i have taken a breaker and in this zone i have facility to isolate if there is a fault here for example i will trip this breaker and this breaker so i have make rather a small zone here so zone, uh, the zone should be as small as possible so this is to improve the selectivity but here i don't have an option to isolate the fault so i have taking the nature together so here now I have uh, taken another three zones which are called as a bus bar protection so I have drawn a zone here this is one zone this is another zone on the bus bar and this is another zone on the bus bar so if there is a fault on the bus and then the bus bar protection will operate and now here you can see there is overlapping between these zones so now this area is protected by two different zones so overlapping is always good all the protection systems should at least covered by one protection zone and if and and it could be also covered by more than two protection zones so over, uh, normally in order to protect the system overlapping is, is done so in this case for example if this uh, uh, if there is a fault on the bus bus bar protection will operate if the bus bar protection fails to operate then you can see this zone can also operate now i have added uh, here you can see i have added a generator protection here 
so I have covered this part here so I have added the denominator production previously this was not there so I have I am now deciding the zones so I have added generator production here so overlapping zone of production no gaps every anywhere in the period so no area of the protection system should be uh, without cover, covering without any zone so this is an example so now we will discuss uh, zones uh, of protection so let's uh, have another example I will draw for you so let's uh, draw a bus bar so for example this is the bus bar okay and uh, this is the line okay so I will draw here one breaker so let's draw a box for for it and draw line another bus so this is uh, representing a uh, station A for example this is the substation A this is substation B okay and we have breaker here we also have a breaker here and one CT is installed here for example we have one CT here and we have one CT after the paper okay so I will copy this scheme I will show you two different schemes now you will take if, if we take a scheme like bus power protection if you, I take bus power protection from this CT so zone of protection will be kind of this so if I take this CT for the bus bar so this is my bus bar zone and if I take the line CT from this and I have another CT here if I take line differential protection between these two CTs then my zone will be kind of this this is an example of doing the CT selection and here is another bus another CT and if I take this CT for the bus bar so this is my another zone so now if I make such selection so you can see this area this area is basically not covered by any zone if there is a fault here this is wrong for example this part so neither this zone will operate nor this zone will operate so this is an example of bad protection scheme so what should I do I will prefer in order to cover this area I have a CTs same CTs if I apply same CT and if I want to cover all the area because this all area which is not covered by any zone is unprotected so I have to change my scheme here so what, what I can do so I will select this CT for bus bar if I select this CT for bus bar so it means my bus bar zone will be increased from here to here so this CT will feed in the bus bar so my bus bar zone now extended from this CT to that CT and let me draw one CT here and one CT after CT after breaker and if I take my line differential CT from this CT to this CT 
TT before breaker at the both ends. So now I have covered the line and also this area. Similarly, at the other station, I will choose the CT after the breaker for the bus bar scheme. So now you can see in this way. I have covered all the parts of the substations. So basically, uh, uh, from where you are connecting CT, we are taking CT to the potassium relay, is deciding the boundary of that potassium. So here you can see if there is a fault here in between, in this area, is there is a fault. So neither of the bus bar potassium nor the line potassium will work. But now, if I inject the fault again, if we consider a fault here again, this point, if it has a fault, there is a fault here, this point, then bus bar production can also operate here and also the line production can operate. So line differential will also operate here. So this is an advantage and the fault will be immediately located and cleared. So I can do here one more thing if there is a fault for example in this area. So I can trip the breaker and isolate the fault because I have the facility and if the fault is before breaker I can trip the bus bar immediately so that because the fault will be kept on feeding through the bus if the breaker is open through the other feeders so for example if there is one more feeder here if there is a one more feeder here then this will keep on feeding the fault so this is this is an example of showing you that you need to cover all the area this area in this uh, bad example of uh, zoom selection and this is the good example of uh, zoom selection that I have shown you so in this way you can increase the system stability you can also increase uh, the selectivity of the system thank you very much hey guys now we will see that how we have we can create backup uh, of a given zone protection for example you will see uh, we have installed a distance protection here so the uh, distance protection zone 1 is normally 80 to 85 percent uh, so you can see this is the line from this station, consider this is a station A, this station B and this is station C. So here you can see in zone 1, discovering the 85% to 80% of the line. So time of zone 1 is instantaneous normally. Uh, zone 2 here you can see it has covered almost 120% to 30% of the second line. So time of zone 2 is normally 300 to 350 milliseconds and then zone 3 you can see is covering here 225% uh, or something to the shortest line or the third line. So here you can see if there is a fault here for example if there is a fault here in zone 2 this it is the zone 1 of this relay this relay should trip in zone 1 okay and if this relay has not trip in zone 1 then you can see this relay it can trip in zone 3 uh, with the zone 3 time delay approximately 700 milliseconds similarly if there is a fault somewhere here so this relay should trip in zone 1 continuously but if it is if it is not trip in zone 1 then this relay it is zone 2 of this relay will trip in the given time of 350 milliseconds so in this way uh, the backup is provided for the protection systems so here you can see this uh, uh, protection zones and their backups so similarly uh, on each station with the distance relay and backup overcome protection is also installed so on the same station backup production is available as a backup overcurrent if the distance for example if distance operates if there is a fault here and distance should operate if distance is not operating then there is a backup of uh, overcurrent production is there also so backup should operate so one backup production is installed 
At the same point, another backup is being done by a remote end by the other protection. So in this phase, uh, these zones are created and these, uh, uh, these are backing up. So zone boundary is usually defined by CT and a circuit breaker. The CT provides the ability to detect a fault inside the zone. The circuit breaker provides the ability to isolate the fault. So this is little introduction about the backup, uh, how we can do the backup and how we can do the coordination. Thank you very much. Hello friends, uh, here we will go through a little conclusion that all the power system element must be encompassed by at least one zone and we have seen example that uh, all the power system should be at least covered by a single zone of protection but there could be more than one zone of protection which is called an overlapping the more important element must be included in at least two zones zones must overlap to prevent any element from being unprotected the overlap must be finite but small to minimize the likelihood of a fault inside this region. It means that uh, overlap should not be unlimited, so it should be uh, limited to a certain portion. Such a fault will cause both protections to operate, moving a larger segment of systems from the service. So overlapping is good, but the disadvantage of overlapping is that both protections could operate in that specific, if the fault occur on in that specific area, as I told you, if for example, I have covered the region with the bus bar and the line protection, so line differential protection is the fault occur, both will operate. So it will result in outage of a bigger area. So we need to consider all each and every aspects before going forward. So here you can see a power system where we have created some zones. So this is another example of zones. Thank you very much. Hey guys, now we will consider a case of uh, zones of protection, uh, which is created by a uh, over current relay, definite time instantaneous, or by a line differential protection relay. Basically, line differential protection relay is called as a unit protection. Uh, this it means that it will operate if there is a problem on a specific given unit whereas uh, overcut protection is uh, operating whereas overcut protection is basically operating uh, based on the current only so for example this here you can see this is overcut protection and it's feed by only one CT Whereas the line differential protection here, it is created by two different CPs. And if there is a <coughs> if there is a fault within these two zones, within these two CTs, within this zone, then this differential protection will operate. If there is a fault outside of the zone, then this differential protection will not operate because if there is a fault outside of the zone, the current in and out of the CT will remain same. But if there is a fault inside of the zone, then current entering and leaving will not be the same and differential protection will operate. So the differential protection it has a defined reach and the zone is, is closed here. So you can see zone is closed, zone of protection is this. It is closed and reach is defined. Whereas the overcurrent protection is fitted by only one CT. If there is a fault, for example here, the relay will operate. If there is a fault on another station here, the fault level will be lesser but still the current will be feed by this breaker and then this protection, uh, differential protection will operate. So this is an example of uh, two different protection schemes. So let's consider again in detail. So just consider here if there is a another feeder outside and if there is a fault here so this fault current will be feed by this bus go to the ground and this current will go to the relay the second design 
and the relay might pick up and trip. So this is still in the reach of the overcurrent relay. And for example, if there is a fault here, the fault is now at this time near to the source. Just consider that we have a source here. We have the neutral installed here. So again, the current will flow from here to here. The current value of current will be more because now the conductor length is increased. But the fault current will be feed through this, and then again the current will go to the relay. So the zone of this relay is not very well defined. So its zone is open. Okay. Whereas uh, in this case, just consider, for example, if we have line here, if there is a fault here. Okay, 100 ampere current, for example, is flowing from here to the ground. So it means 100 ampere current is leaving from here, uh, uh, and uh, 100 ampere current is entering here, and 100 ampere current is also leaving from this region. So current in and out both are same. So differential current here will be I differential will be. Zero. Okay. So differential current in this case will be zero. So we are calling a fault which is outside a differential zone. We are calling it as a through fault. This is a terminology that we are using in a production system. So it means the differential production should not operate on the through fault which is outside its zone. The zone is closed. The zone of this protection is between these two CTs. Okay. So this is a protection reach. So now we consider another fault. For example, the same fault come here. There is a phase to ground fault here. Now current the, consider the path of a current from here. It will go to ground and then back to the generator. So here you can see here that 100 ampere current is now again flowing here. For example, if this CT is 100 by 1, so 1 ampere current will be here. 1 ampere will be entering the relay, and this relay there will be no current because all the current is bypassed and flowing to the ground now. So differential current will be equal to in this case, for example, 1 ampere. And if we have set the relay settings to 0.5, for example. This relay will operate and trip the circuit, these two circuit breakers. So that's why we are calling a differential protection as a closed zone and overcurrent protection as an open zone. So I hope you have an idea about this and uh, different type of protections. Thank you very much. Hey friends, now we discuss the concept of uh, primary and backup protection. So why we need a backup protection? So backup protection is required basically to in order to if uh, the fact that if main protection fails, there should be a backup protection available so that it can operate. So another concept in extra high voltage is to use a duplicate protection schemes on uh, on the lines. Uh, in extra high voltage, uh, we are using two distance protection and two backup overcurrent protections. So each distance protection is fed from a separate CT core, and it is also connected to a separate DC bank in 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 in, in, a, in a substation. So uh, each distance protection is also giving tripping command to a separate tripping coil of the breaker. So in this way. Uh, the concept is to create a redundancy. So, in order to create a redundancy in a substation, two DC supplies are um, uh, normally uh, uh, placed uh, are installed, and two uh, protections are installed on the extra high voltage. And there are two trip coils available on 132 kV and above levels. So, if one trip coil fails, another trip coil is still available to trip and and to the breaker and isolate the fault. Uh, apart from duplicate protection, duplicate protection have the same timing as it is as the main protection. So the, the, we can call this protection as main one and main two in our uh, extra high voltage. Uh, whereas the backup protection 
has uh, delay tripping so if a main production duplicate one and two both are failed then the backup production should, uh, should operate so backup protection there are two types of backup protection one backup protection is installed in in the same substation just like installing a backup over current relay to a main distance relay or other option could be to install backup at the remote so if you are installing a backup protection at the remote station it means you have completely independent relay you have completely independent CT breaker you have completely independent DC system and everything whereas if you install a relay a backup relay on the local end then it means that the, the, the backup relay will also be feed from the same CT it will utilize also the same DC supply so there are more chances that if the main relay fails the backup will also fail but the remote uh, uh, disadvantage of remote relay is that uh, there could be more than one uh, remote relays installed at different locations because one location uh, of the sub one substation could be fed from more than one sources so each source will be each uh, line uh, would have a backup protection and the result could be instead of tripping uh, one uh, one line and this if it fails to trip then the other backup lines they will be tripping on more than one line so which is not uh, a, a great sight so uh, let's uh, see this example so let's make uh, I will make substation here this is our bus bar substation A this is substation B this is here you can see substation C or make this one and you can see this is the line and this is another line and this substation is fed by more than one source for example so now uh, for example if we have let's draw breaker here also so this is the breaker one breaker here one breaker here we have one breaker here one here one here we have one breaker here one breaker here one breaker here okay so uh, you can see now the zone one of this uh, station of the relay is from here to here this is the zone one okay whereas zone one of uh, this relay is from here uh, just a minute let me correct this zone 1 of this relay is from here to 85 percent zone 2 for this relay is from here to 120 percent if we consider this one as zone 2 and zone 1 of this relay is 85 percent zone 2 for example from here to 120 percent this relay zone 1 again here is 85 percent zone 2 will be somewhere here to let it make it another color make this one brown zone 1 zone 2 will be kind of here and zone 1 is 25 percent zone 2 will be kind of up to here so we have here protection relay installed and that is we have 21 here we have here distance relay 21 
which is a distance protection and we have also 51 or we can say 50 definite time over current here we have also 21 distance protection uh, here we also have distance protection and here also we have distance protection so first of all we consider the case here that if there is a fault here in the line there is a fault here okay there is a ground fault here the line is grounded here okay let's draw a better better presentation so line is somehow grounded here so it means that fault current will be feeded from all three sources to the ground fault current will be all the resources to ground it will be from here so let's choose an, another current uh, color like blue the fault will be flowing here to here also the fault will be feed from this source this source and this source so let's suppose the distance protection should operate here you can see distance protection here we have 21 and 50 whole current protection so distance protection should operate here but for example distance protection should operate in zone 1 zone 1 time here is uh, instantaneous so ideally zone 1 of the distance protection operate and it will open this breaker and it will send signal to the remote end also to and then the remote end breaker will also trip by teleportation so and this is an ideal scenario but if for example distance relay fails so it is if distance relay fail then we it has a two backup uh, we have one backup protection installed on the same substation which is 50 over current relay okay so if we uh, normally the timing of zones is defined here is as zone one is instantaneous zone two is 300 milliseconds zone 3 is for example 700 milliseconds so this is normal we are setting these zones like this so this is a phase to ground fault so if i set these settings here if this is my backup power current so it should operate instantaneously if it has not operated then for example if i have set to operate the backup power current and just before zone 2 just like 200 milliseconds so if uh, i set this one then this backup over current here backup over current earth fault definite time will operate in 200 milliseconds so still these relays all these all three relays are picked up in zone 2 but zone 2 timer is 300 milliseconds if they will wait for 300 milliseconds to before issuing the command so these three relays uh, are distance relays these are working as a backup protection of relay here so you can see the relays are installed at remote locations and the ct here is totally different vt here is totally different and this power supply is totally different everything is independent but here this backup is installed here so if this protection operates then the breaker will open and the fault current will be reset there will be no tripping only this uh, breaker will be tripped so this is the advantage of local backup over current protection but just consider a case that CT uh, was such a request to hesitate it and the over current relay backup over current will, uh, was also feeding through the same CT so this uh, this protection also did not operate so now all three uh, uh, distance protections uh, now the timer will run and as soon as 3 seconds 300 milliseconds are crossed all the three sources will trip and all three you can see lines will trip instead of tripping one breaker the three breakers will trip so this is a remote location there are advantages is that everything is separate every supply DC supply AC supply breaker everything is redundant here separate but the disadvantage is to but it now because there are a lot of sources that remote 
so there could be lot of uh, uh, power uh, shutdowns more than one sources uh, will be out so all three lines will be out which are feeding this line so this is an a disadvantage uh, for this that's why on extra high voltage normally we are keeping two distance production are feeding from two different uh, CTs if one distance fail still the chances to that other distance will trip otherwise uh, you can see that uh, normally the backup production time is not set to 200 this just I have taken example the product backup production is normally is taking as to 500 milliseconds or one seconds so if this relay did not trip the other relays uh, in zone 2 they will trip and isolate the fault so I hope you have understand the concept in detail so thank you very much hi guys in this section we will consider an example where we have a backup production which is installed on the same substations here you can see there are two different CT cores core 1 is feeding 21P whereas the core 2 is feeding to 21B and there there is a single VT also it has two cores two separate cores are feeding to two different productions so each relay has a separate uh, CTVT cores connected so let's see what happened if there is a fault occur in, in, in between these stations this is one substation this is another substation and you can see this is the bus power so there is a fault here you can see the fault is sensed by both relays okay and both relays uh, have given trip command to this relay so this is example of duplicate protection so two distance relays are installed here both have same reach you can see only the difference is uh, the location of two CT cores and uh, both are acting to the fault so this is example of backup protection and in this case backup protection is available locally so if one of the production fails other production can trip at the same time it is called as a duplicate protection other option is that uh, which is normally keep on the substation is that apart from duplicate protection and backup power current is also installed uh, which is backing up these two line protections so this is example of backup or duplicate protection at the same position Hey friends, now in this section uh, we will see an example where we have a backup production or is installed at the remote locations at the other locations. So for example you can see this is basically our distance protection is installed here on this feeder. So uh, you can see and uh, this is a substation so this is backup protection 21 and uh, on uh, you can see on the coupler one over current relay is installed and uh, at transformer you can see LV side and the another protection is installed which is over current protection so let's see if the fault appear here if the fault appear here then this protection should operate so there is a fault this is the reach of uh, this protection this protection should trip but if it did not trip the coupler will operate coupler will trip you can see and it will open the breaker because it will try to stop to feed the fault to the other bus and also this transfer production will operate which will try to isolate the fault so the backup of this uh, protection of this feeder is one relay which is connected at the coupler another relay which is connected to the transformer side so this is an example of backup protection hey friends now you will see that uh, how backup protection installed at remote substations works so you can see here we have substation A and distance relay installed here and at substation B another distance relay is installed and let's we'll see if there is a fault here at station A this distance relay should operate in zone 1 but if just consider a case that it failed to operate the breaker still remain close then this relay here it will sense the fault in zone 2 and then it will trip the breaker 
so this is an example of production stored at remote so you can see this production should have cleared this fault in zone 1 if it has not cleared so you can see that the another production at the remote end has picked up in zone 2 and after a predefined time delay of zone 2 normally which is 300 to 350 or 400 milliseconds it will trip and isolate the fault but the disadvantage could be in the remote protection is remote backup protection is that if there are more than one sources which are feeding the fault on more than one sources then more than one sources can trip on same fault because these all are feeding to this station this is the disadvantage of remote backup protection thank you hey friends now we will consider the concept of uh, tally tripping uh, here you can see this is basically a simple configuration uh, we have one generator here and and we have one transformer which is then feeding to a remote station uh, the transformer doesn't have any breaker so one directly cable is feeding and when there is one breaker over here only and we have one bus bar and at this bus bar there are several feeders which are connected so let's consider the case one so if there is a fault here so this relay 87 will pick up because there is a fault uh, on the transformer differential has been picked up but there is no breaker to isolate the fault so it will send a remote trip signal to the remote breaker to isolate the fault and uh, uh, this breaker will trip so this is example of a remote tripping so consider the another case so there is a fault here on the breaker so if there is a fault on the breaker then the protection will be a bus bar protection will operate and this breaker is uh, failed to open and then it will operate and trip the complete bus bar to isolate the fault and also it will send the remote signal uh, direct transfer trip signal to remote end and this remote end breaker will also feed so if and the concept is if there is a fault and the breaker failed to open all possible sources which can feed the fault should be isolated so in this case these all or breakers which are connected to the bus bar uh, should be isolated and similarly there is a one feeder which is feeding the fault from the remote so this feeder also need to be isolated so this is example of daily trip so i hope you enjoy this concept thank you very much welcome guys now in this section we will just go through the basic concept of uh, intro trip scheme and let's start here you can see we will define the intertrip scheme first. The term intertripping may be defined as method in which operation of a protection equipment at one end of the circuit causes a signal to be transmitted to trip a circuit breaker at the remote end of the circuit. So the concept is really simple. Here you can see there are two ends. You can say this is end A and this is and B so this is substation A here this is substation B uh, in this substation you can see the breaker is installed here on the line and at the receiving end there is a transformer and uh, there is no breaker at transformer high voltage side whereas, whereas there is a breaker at transformer low voltage side so it's uh, very clear now that if there is a fault in between line here or there is a fault on transformer so in order to isolate the transformer it's very important that we should be able to isolate it because there is no local breaker the tripping has to be sent to the remote breaker and it should trip immediately so uh, in this condition this type of scheme is called as direct transfer strip scheme but uh, we will discuss this one in detail but now the concept if, if substation A and substation B if there is a fault in substation B and, within, and there is a con such a condition that if there is a fault substation B we, and there is no breaker here so we want to trip immediately the feeding and breaker at the remote station 
so through this PIED it will transmit a signal and as soon as signal is received it will strip the breaker at remote end to cut the fault current so this is basically the example of transfer tripping so it could be in case of a radial feeder or uh, there are some other applications we will study so concept of unit protection scheme unit protection schemes can be formed by several relays located remotely from each other and some distance protection schemes such unit protection schemes need communication between each location to achieve a unit protection function this communication is known as protection signaling communication facilities are also needed when remote circuit breakers need to be protected operated due to a local event this communication is known as intertripping so these are the basic definitions that we have learned basically um, unit protection scheme is a protection scheme in which uh, it is um, when there is a fault on a unit for example a transformer it's a unit line it's a unit it's it is stripping the uh, feeding sources or stripping the breaker at the same time so whereas in the grid protection scheme tripping is done that we will learn later on tripping is is not done as per unit but it's as per grade for example if you have a uh, um, as you have seen there is a uh, 400 volt incomer breaker and there is an outgoing breaker so if there is a fault in outgoing breaker first outgoing breaker will trip if tripping is not uh, successful then incomer will trip this is kind of a grating graded protection so we will further learn later that what is a unit protection and what is a graded protection so communication messages the communication messages involved may be quite simple involving instructions for receiving device to take some defined action tripping blocking etc or it may be, be the passing of major data in some of the form one device to another as in a unit production scheme so communication messages so you want to send communication messages it, it, it is not necessary that it's, it will send a tripping it could send through a communication medium a uh, trip signal a blocking signal unblocking signal in some cases like line differential protection it is sending the signal of uh, measurements like how much current at one end and other end and both currents are communicated so these are example of communication messages so this we will discuss in detail So, so far we have understand what is the concept of unit production in this section and in detail we will give you the concept of graded production. We have understand about what is inter-trip scheme and we have understand one example. There are several examples that we will study in the next section. So, thank you very much. Welcome friends. In this section, we will study uh, the detail and types of intertip schemes. And we will discuss the basic types. So, intertip uh, inter schemes can be classified into following types: direct transfer tip schemes. In this scheme, the relay issue trip DGT, direct transfer trip command to remote end and it trips the circuit breaker immediately without performing any checks or condition. Permissive transfer trip scheme. Trip command is issued to remote end where relay installed at remote end evaluate and compare it with the certain condition and further permits the trip blocking scheme. The blocking commands are initiated by a protection element that detects fault external to protected zone. Detection of an external fault at the local end of a protected circuit results in a blocking signal being transmitted to remote ends. So there are three types of basic uh, uh, protection schemes. One is 
direct transceptive scheme and in this scheme uh, relay at uh, one end for, for example station A give trip command to the station B at remote end and the remote end trips immediately without making any logical decision or without evaluating any local conditions whereas in permissive scheme uh, the permissive signal is sent at the remote end that uh, the other end should trip at the local end we will discuss in, in detail later when we will discuss this uh, permissive scheme that local end will evaluate certainly the local conditions that must be fulfilled in order to uh, release the trip signal at the remote end so another type of scheme is blocking scheme so um, in permissive scheme uh, relay is waiting for permissive command from remote end whereas in the blocking scheme relay is always ready to trip unless it receives the blocking signal from the remote end so it could also be if you just apply an AND logic or inverse logic it could also be unblocking scheme this, this is another type that we will discuss in detail so these are some types of uh, iterative schemes we will go through the schemes uh, one by one now thank you hi friends in this section we will go through briefly to different elements of power system how these elements are connected and how these elements are operating so here you can see there is an uh, current transformer and this current transformer is feeding this over current relay the CD secondary is connected to this relay so the relay can sense the current in the line similarly this relay is power up from a DC bank so AC supply you know it can be failed on a substation and there is no backup of AC supply so it's easier to convert AC into DC through a DC charger and at the same time this DC supply will be sub connected to all the control and protection system in a substation and also this DC supply through charger will be used to charge the batteries and uh, when the supply is supply fails these batteries can supply the DC supply to the control and protection systems to operate so that's why you will find a battery bank in each substation or power plants similarly when relay gets the input quantity it compares this input quantity with a preset value first of all when an input is connected like a current there is an analog to digital converter in each production numerical relay it converts the relay to, uh, it converts the quantity from analog to digital and then it's uh, used in all computation microprocessors in the relay so relay compares the measured quantity with the set value for example if it is an over current relay set value is if 1 ampere and if the measured quantity is 0.5 ampere relay will not pick up and relay will not issue a trip command but if uh, the value measured value is more than 1 ampere the relay will pick up and it will issue the trip command and then it will operate the breaker which in turn will isolate the fault so this is an brief description that how the protection system works so you can see this is the item number one which is a current transformer or voltage transformer the function of transducer usually CT and VT is to provide current and voltage signals to the relay to detect deviation of the parameter watched over so CT or VT current transformer voltage transformers are basically you can see eyes and ears of the substation so these these are connected to uh, relays and the relays are measuring the data from uh, uh, measuring the quantities and then they are making final decisions so here you can see this uh, CT and VT is then connected to the relay it's an input output from the CT is connected to the input of the analog input of the over current relay so relays are the logic elements which initiate the tripping and closing operations so the relay 
is basically have the power to initiate the tripping and there is another relay which is called auto reclose relay it can also do the auto reclosing so circuit breakers isolate the fault by interrupting the fault current as soon as relay senses that the value is uh, more than the set value it issues a trip command after predefined time delay and then it's uh, giving trip command to the circuit breaker circuit breaker then in turn the context of circuit breaker opens and it interrupts the fault current tripping power as well as power required by the relays is usually provided by the station batteries because it's safer than the faulted system so each system you will find that each substation is feed from the DC power so this was a little introduction again uh, to brief you that how the system is integrated and working I hope you enjoy this thank you very much hey friends in this section we will study about the how we can classify, classify different production relays so production relays can be classified um, by different ways so we can classify as a protective relays, as monitoring relays, as a reclosing relays. So protective relays basically direct uh, uh, fault currents and it detects the defective operators. Uh, they are monitoring the dangerous intolerable condition. These relays generally trip one or more circuit breaker but may also be used to sound an alarm. So example of protection relays are like we have on the line we have a distance protection and the NC code of this protection is 21 and we have a backup overcurrent protection inverse time or definite time we have uh, overcurrent earth fault protection we have over under frequency protection over excitation protection um, there are a lot of relays uh, because, because uh, uh, these all of these relays are named as you can say as an uh, protection release uh, second type of release are monitoring release so we are basically verifying the conditions of, of the power system in the protection system these relays include like uh, fault detectors uh, alarm units channel monitoring relays synchronism verification and network phasing phase system conditions uh, that no, do not involve op opening circuit breakers during faults can be monitored by verification relays. Monitoring relays example is, uh, for example, for the GIS, uh, we are monitoring SF6. For the transformers, we are monitoring the winding and oil temperature all the time. And we are initiating the alarms and even the trip is initiated. Then, uh, buckles relays also installed in the transformer, which is monitoring the any gas which is produced inside the transformer so uh, in SF6 circuit breaker SF6 uh, is monitored so these are all example of monitoring release so another type of relay is a reclosing release these are called as for example auto recloser if there is a fault and it's of, it's of a temporary nature then auto recloser try to reclose after that time and then if it is multi shot then reclaim time is run and if reclaim time is uh, if the fault reoccur in reclaim time if it is a single shot then the second time uh, breaker will not close if reclaim time is passed and the so breaker is declared as successful then if the fault occur it will consider it as a new fault then we have classification of release uh, like uh, regulating release uh, um, for example uh, you can uh, see uh, there is a AVR automatic voltage regulator installed on the uh, transformer tape changer so the function of this relay is to regulate the secondary voltage to maintain the voltage so this is example of an regulating relay so uh, recruiting relays are activated when an operating parameter deviates from predetermined limits regulating relays function through supplementary equipment to restore the quality to the prescribed limits <coughs> so example I, have, I already told you that there is a automatic voltage regulating relay which is called as an uh, AVR relay and this relay is installed 
on the transformer and when and they then the predefined bandwidth is defined for example if the voltage uh, change more than the preset value 1 kV or 2 kV then the tape changer will operate and it will try to bring the voltage uh, within the limit so another type of relays can also be classified as auxiliary relays so these relays operate in response to opening or closing of operating circuit to supplement another relay or device these include timers contact multiplier relays sealing units isolating relays lockout relays closing relays and trip relays so auxiliary relays we have gone through this already in our training so these are small relays that you will find in the substation so for contact multiplication and for making a timer circuit for interlock circuit you will find all these relays mm -hmm. then we have synchronizing relays these relays basically check the synchro check uh, function the code of for this relay and C code is 25 so what the relays they are checking the uh, delta V difference of voltages delta F difference of frequency delta phi difference of angle between two sources that need to be connected so if uh, condition permits then the synchronizing relay will allow breaker to close so this is basically classification of relay so in addition to these function category relay may be classified by input operating principle or structure and performance characteristics the following are some of the classification and definition described in NCI IEEE standard C3.90 so on the basis of an input we can classify a relay into as a current voltage and power relays pressure relays frequency relays temperature relays flow relays or, or vibration relays we are we can also classify the relays uh, based on their operating principle or structure just like current balance protection multi restrain relay product relay electromechanical relay thermal relay solid state relay static relay or microprocessor relay so the further classification of relays can also be done by performance characteristics just like uh, differential distance direction lower current inverse time and definite time under voltage relays over voltage relays ground or phase over current relays high or low speed relays pilot protection phase comparison direction comparison current differential we can further classify the relay by mode of reduction of fault like level reduction, magnitude comparison, differential comparison, phase angle comparison, pilot relay, harmonic content, frequency sensing. We can classify the relays also by operating time like instantaneous relays time delay relays, independent delay, and dependent delay relays by design mode, electromechanical, plunger type, induction disk type, thermal relays, solid state relays, computer based relays by parameter control like current, voltage, power, impedance or distance, direction, frequency from the speed point of view if we can divide and classify the relays as follows instantaneous relays these relays operate as soon as secure decision is made so instantaneous relays don't have any time delay it operate within no time so like example of instantaneous operation is zone 1 where we keep the time to 0 the second type is time delay relays an intentional time delay is inserted between the relay decision time and the initiation of trip action. This time delay can be dependent on some parameter, usually inverse time dependent or independent. So, time delay relays are examples are inverse time relay uh, is example of a time delay relay, and definite time relay is also example of a time delay relay. 
so if you're talking about a distance zone 1 is instantaneous and whereas zone 2 and 3 are time delayed so then we have a high speed relay a relay that operates in less than a specified time usually 3 cycle is called as a high speed relay then we have ultra high speed relay this term is not included in the relay standard but it is commonly considered to be in operation in 4 milliseconds or less so these are some relay classification as per speed so I will conclude my this section thank you very much so now we will see and uh, how the protection relays are modernized how how, you, how used to be uh, the old protection relays and in the start of uh, the protection era the old protection relays used to be a very bulky big in size you will see especially relays black in color with the with the transparent uh, uh, glass uh, you can find the relay inside and these are called as an electromechanical relays the size of the added piece that I have seen is one of the very old relay that was installed is in I think 1980s uh, in 500 kV Jamshiro was LHB and you can see the size of this relay is half of the cupboards so it's a very big and bulky relay so I can see in the relay each element separately uh, like uh, you can see zone 1 element zone 2 zone 3 element separately you can see a starter element so when starter pick up you can see the starter physically you can see switch on to forward element and uh, you can see in you know, our current elements so you can see all the elements all the comparators uh, voltage and current coils you can if you, you if you want to try you can locate you can see the physical timer in these relays so this relay was uh, uh, name of the relay was led b and this relay was uh, uh, i came to know uh, this relay was made by jointly by electrical engineers and the jewelry makers in Switzerland. So it's basically a brown bow free relay. Later on, there is another uh, basically big company named Asia have a merger with the uh, brown Bavery and both uh, combine and they make an uh, another company, Asia Brown Bavery, and which is uh, very famous now. It's called as ABB. So older you you can find the older relays from Asia and Brown Bobby separately, but all these relays are uh, bigger in size and these are really rugged relays. So in the start there was no uh, uh, technology of uh, uh, microprocessors. Uh, so initially the uh, initial relays were made by this uh, you can see the watchmaker in Switzerland and the electrical engineers together so it's very fa fascinating story that how the initial electromechanical relays were made and I have seen uh, uh, the timers uh, and also these coils together and they are working together because the current element okay that could be pro 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 performed and programmed by the electrical engineers but all the timers and all these uh, different comparators and logics are supported and by by the watchmakers so uh, uh, it was an initial era and the burden of these relays was another disadvantage one is the size is very big and these are very heavy and difficult to carry and install and they take a lot of space the second disadvantage is uh, that uh, uh, these relays have a high burden the burden of the relay is high so it means that you need to have a bigger sizes of CT if you want to still if, uh, want to use this, these relays in the old old uh, time so this was the disadvantage another disadvantage was the flexibility so if you have designed a contact for certain function you cannot change it output contact if you design a input for a certain function you cannot change it uh, so these are the disadvantages of this uh, huge electromechanical release but the advantage what I have seen for this uh, huge electromechanical relays like CDG um, I really personally like this CDG over current relay this is a really rugged relay and it doesn't need any in our area we have extreme temperatures uh, like 40 to 50 degrees centigrade so even if I have found this relays even working fine in these temperatures but whereas the microprocessor basically need to have an uh, air condition and 
and you need that need to have a clean environment to run these relays. So the electromagnetic relays are rugged as compared to microprocessor relays. So next era was the solid state relays. Uh, these relays um, are smaller in size, and in these relays, they have uh, used basically the uh, digital component like capacitors, thyristors, transistors. So they have used <coughs> and they, they have tried to use these solid state components uh, in in these relays. And here you can select different settings by using a dip switch or a selector switch. Uh, this this was also uh, the compact relays and in electromagnetic field relays all the uh, input quantities are used as it is for, whereas in solid state relays uh, we are using some analog digital conversion at some stage then it comes the era of digital uh, relays instead of using the uh, solid state uh, uh, components uh, now the engineers started to use the microprocessor uh, to do the operations, but still you have again the microprocessor installed in the background, but you cannot do the reprogramming, you cannot do a lot of uh, functions. Uh, the relays work same as a, a solid state relay, but it has a microprocessor installed and uh, you can do some uh, some basically selection of uh, settings. It's not very flexible, but in the, uh, this uh, microprocessor release, base release, which, uh, uh, or basic digital release, the, now the, uh, the method of operation has changed. Now these relays are converting the analog quantity like CT or VT, current or voltage, which is uh, uh, input to these relays into a digital quantity. Mostly they are converting the first of all the input signal from analog to the, uh, digital, and then this digital signal is used in the relay everywhere so this is microprocessor based release later came the latest uh, production uh, relay that we are seeing now the latest generation in which uh, each relay uh, has a gra user graphical interface and relay has a lot of flexibility you can configure the output contact as per your requirement you can connect uh, uh, by any binary input for any function and you can change the settings. You have a lot of setting groups, uh, functionality of setting groups. You can switch on and off different setting groups. You can adopt adoptive uh, settings uh, just uh, by pressing a push button. So there are a lot of flexibility now in numerical release. So uh, this is a little background about the protection schemes. Now we will go through. So this is basically um, one of my, my favorite electromechanical relay. So you can see it used to have uh, basically this is this is we called as a current um, setting multiplier. This is a plug setting multiplier. This is a plug. That's why we used to call it the plug setting multiplier. So you can have a different setting of 2.5, 3.75. So and you can see this is a disk. So this um, relay works at the principle of induction disk. And during transportation, you can see they have put a paper so that it should not move and damage excessively so and you can see this these are the contacts when it move and hit this contact here so it will issue the trip command so this is basically the initial uh, mm, uh, electromechanical release that uh, I really also favor this relay. it's very simple to operate and it's very target relay so another example of solid state relay now with the time pass you can see now the relays are changing also so for um, electromechanical now we have uh, a relay which has solid state components like uh, diodes thyristors uh, capacitors in it so using this and you can see on the front there are dip switches these are called as dip switches in the production relays so you can instead of uh, putting a plug here you can select a dip switch and you can do the settings <coughs> as you need this is basically a differential production MVCH by GEC Alastom. Here you can see another relay which is basically another solid state relay which is a micro move. You can see this is also a very big relay. So uh, you can do all the, all, all the settings you can do by dip switches or the selector switches here. Now this is the latest uh, relay. Uh, this is the Dixie 5 uh, relays and this is one of the uh, very uh, most modern relay it, it 
provide you the most collectability and you, you it, it has a user uh, as this is this portion is called HMI user uh, human machine interface so you can do a lot of uh, uh, configuration you can view the file records so this is uh, giving you the maximum flexibility here and this is basically uh, the circuit diagram just uh, I have shown you how they have connected MBCH relay it is basically they are doing the differential production of a delta star connected transformers so here you can see in the old days this MBCH relay is a transformer differential production relay they have connected HV side to the MBC, MBCH HV, HVCTs and LVCTs are connected through these uh, interposing CTs the previous uh, solid state differential production relays were not able to compensate the phase shift and the ratio the phase error and the ratio error that is caused by the transformer differential vector group transformer vector group this ray doesn't have the ability to compensate uh, this uh, uh, difference of ratio and angle so what uh, the uh, what was the practice is to install uh, one uh, another matching CT which is called you used to call it as a matching CT so you have to connect this matching CT in a way that it should compensate the angle and it should also compensate the ratio so it will uh, so that the LV current will be reflected uh, same as HV current so this is an interesting fact that used to be do used to be done but nowadays you can see just you need to put a vector group in the numerical relay and the rest of uh, the matching will be done inside the relay automatically so this is a good example how the numerical relays has uh, saved the time and the money so I hope you enjoy this section so far so here you can see uh, this is a protection panel and you can see these are the numerical relays the main relays which are installed in the panel uh, this is the inside of the panel and you can see these are the auxiliary relays this is the set of auxiliary relays are installed here you can see this is the terminal block that we have seen the back side is you can see a DIN rail and you can see normally on the left side here the cables are coming from external side and the right side the cables are connected to the internal and here uh, you can see the gauges these are not relays but also very important so this is winding temperature that we have discussed this is installed on transformer and this is the oil temperature gauge now the red needle here you can see is basically uh, this when the needle is moving forward it will take the red lead with it when it's going back it will stay its own position <coughs> so in this way you can see what was the maximum temperature uh, has gone for the specific equipment <coughs> here you can see this is the gauge to monitor the SF6 okay and you can see this green it means that this is the healthy region and this normally there is a green then yellow means alarm and then there is a lockout region so this is SF6 gauge again it's a monitoring device then you can see a certain oil pressure relay so this certain oil pressure relay is installed uh, which is monitoring the pressure inside the transformer and this is the device that is connected together so as soon as there is a certain oil pressure the relay will trip the transformer then you can see a pressure relief device uh, this is again a mechanical device which is installed on over the main tank and when there is high pressure this will be pressure will be released and this contact will operate and it will give alarm and it, will, it may give tripping you can see the connection can be made through this then we have another type of relays like a buckle relay this is our transformer here so you can see buckle relay is installed between this is the main tank and this is a conservator tank so you can see the buckle relay is installed between these two so if there is any gas it will uh, go up on the tank and it will go further rise when it will come here and passes through this buckles this gas will be trapped here on the top and it will start accumulate and in first stage you can see 
when this gas is there this float will start to come down and then alarm will initiate and in the second stage and this is another contact if there is a severe fault in the transformer then oil will be rush instead of uh, gas oil will be rush with uh, such huge pressure from main tank to conservator tank because uh, huge pressure is built up in the uh, main tank because of the uh, uh, severe fault then this uh, contact uh, which is a trip contact will operate and it will trip the transformer so this uh, was a little introduction so i hope that uh, you have enjoyed this lecture also thank you very much hi friends uh, in this section we will study electromechanical different type of relays so electromechanical relays can be uh, uh, classified into four different types like magnetic attract attraction type magnetic induction type d arsenal and thermal units so these are different kind of electromechanical relays that we can classify so we will start and study the plunger type uh, production relays the plunger unit have cylindrical coil with an external magnetic structure and a center plunger so you can we can see here this is basically a plunger type uh, relay so this is a plunger which is and this spring is short okay so this is basically a damper damper is also installed here which damping the oscillations then this is the coil and this is a uh, plunger and this you can here see this uh, contacts when this armature is uh, when this uh, coil is energized then this plunger is moving forward and then it it will hit this contacts and this contacts uh, when it is hit they will closed and uh, any function like tripping or alarm or as you need uh, you can operate it and as soon as this uh, supply is switched off uh, this plunger will go back so when current or voltage applied to the coil exceed the pickup value the plunger moves forward to operate a set of contacts so you can see this plunger will move forward as soon as this coil is energized by voltage or current and it will hit the force f required to move the plunger is proportional to the square of the current in the coil the plunger unit operate characteristics are largely determined by the plunger shape internal core magnetic structure coil design and magnetic shunt plunger units are instantaneous in that no delays purposely introduce typically operating time of plunger relays 5 to 50 milliseconds with longer times occurring near threshold value of pickup so these are very fast to operate so we are operating the within range of 5 to 50 milliseconds these are very one of the very simplest uh, relays so the unit shown is used as a high dropout instantaneous overcurrent unit so here this is used as an overcurrent production the steel plunger floats in the air gap provided by non magnetic ring in the center of the magnetic core when the coil is energized the plunger assembly moves upward carrying a silver disk that bridges the three stationary contact only two are, are shown here a helical uh, spring absorbs the ac plunger vibration and produce good contact action so this is a very a very simple uh, plunger mechanism you uh, all the tripping coils uh, uh, which are used and closing coil which are used in the protection uh, uh, in, the, in the in the circuit breaker mechanisms are basically plunger type uh, and and this and this uh, coils which are used in in the circuit breaker have a very small duty cycle it means that you can if you can, if you have to give a pulse in for a very small duration of time if a pulse is given for a longer duration the coil will be damaged so we have to take care while operating these uh, devices so here you can see this is basically the plunger mechanism and you can see these coils are installed in the circuit breaker this is the mv circuit breaker so you can see this is a closing coil which is also plunger mechanism 
and uh, this is the trip coil so when these are energized it is hitting a latch and at the trunk that uh, the spring is released so it's, and then the spring is release mechanism is released and it and you can close and open the breaker so this was a little introduction about the electromechanical units plunger type thank you very much hello friends now we will start our uh, new discussion and that is electromechanical relay and now the type is attractive armature type so these are also called as a clapper units so basically these are uh, in u shaped magnetic frame with a movable armature across an open end the armature is hinged at one side and a spring is strain at the other so you can see this is basically an armature and it is restrained by a spring and it is hinged at one side and this is basically a coil and this coil is across an iron core so when this solenoid or this coil is energized then this uh, magnetism is formed and then this magnet uh, will attract this armature and it will come down so this is the normally close contact so when it will come down this is a common contact and then it will touch this so this is the normal open contact so when this is energized this armature will come down and this contact will move here so it will move from here it will hit here at NO so in this way this contact uh, this relays are operated and you can see this is the physical shape of the relays like this so these are kind of uh, yes or no relays so this is very simple logic the pickup and dropout values of uh, clapper units are less accurate than those of plunger units so these are not very accurate so here you can see another uh, type of uh, Adriatic armature relay so here you can see the another construction so how this adriatic armature relay is operating this is a very simple uh, diagram once again so when, the, when this coil is energized okay and this context uh, this armature will pick up and then it will push it and then you can see this contact will change from it's a change over contact from uh, NO2 and NC2 towards NO when it's picked up so this is basically a very simple relay so we'll move to our next topic so another type of uh, production release uh, our uh, you uh, previously used to make was on the principle of induction disk type uh, previously I have shown you a CDG relay which is a great example of induction disk type of the relay uh, induction type of the relays can be classified into two types induction disk type and cylindrical unit types so uh, how this relay functions basically uh, this electromagnet has a flux when this flux cut this, uh, this disk it induces the uh, current in it and, and, and the interaction of this induced current and the flux uh, there is a torque that is produced so uh, this is how this uh, uh, this uh, relay works and then this disk start to rotate and you can see at the end this contact will be made and this is a fixed contact this is a moving contact and you can see the relay will operate so another type of the induction principle release or induction cup type of the release so here you can see uh, basically the induction cup uh, this spring is used to reset the relay uh, uh, basically and you can see uh, this is uh, uh, it's forming a magnet and you can see uh, uh, this is basically a cylinder and in the similar way it will work as induction disk type so you can see the equation of torque so equation of torque is a function of product of two operating quantities applied to coils wound on the four poles of the electromagnet and the cosine of the angle between them the torque equation is t is equal to k i1 into i2 cos of phi 12 in minus phi minus ks where, co where k and phi are design constants i1 and i2 are the current through the co two coils phi 1 2 is the angle between i1 and i2 and ks is the restraining spring torque Different combinations of input quantities can be used for different applications, system voltages, currents or network voltages. 
so this was a little introduction about the induction uh, type units hi guys now we will discuss another different type of uh, uh, protection uh, release that we use in past is T arsenal unit we all have studied the galvanometer and how galvanometer works this is uh, working uh, on the same principle basically uh, you can see uh, a coil a coil is placed in a magnetic field across a magnetic field and the current passes through the coil and when the current passes through the coil it has its own field then there is an interruption and this interruption basically causing uh, and the, to 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 uh, this coil to move, and this uh, spiral uh, uh, springs are keeping uh, the needle. It's taking the needle back when there is no force. So a moving coil loop in the air gap is energized by direct current, which reacts with the air gap flux to create rotating torque. It is the simplest form of galvanometer. So. This also can be used to make a protection relief. So this is another working principle on which previously we have designed the protection release. So here you can see a very old form of protection relief. So you can do the, some settings and after preset value the contact will operate and you can get the here alarm and tripping. This is the very simplest form of electromechanical relief based on D arsenal unit. So we will discuss here the level detection or current relay or you can say the definite time or current relays. So these relays are basically continuously measuring the uh, current and then they are comparing it with the set value. If it is more just more than if it's over current protection, if it's just more than the set value uh, after after preset time delay or instantaneously depending upon the settings. Relay will issue an immediate uh, trip command. So it's just simply checking the level all the time. So here you can see the operating characteristics of the level direction or definite time over current relays are shown here. So here you can see this is the time, okay, and this is basically the current. Okay, when the current is increased this is the rated current and the setting is done as multiplier of the rated current n so when the rated uh, when the current is increased uh, more than the set value the relay will operate but the time of operation uh, will remain the same it will not change as soon as the relay picked up it will operate if it uh, if it is a uh, time delivery then it will wait a uh, timer will start and when the timer will complete then it will issue alarm or trip so this is uh, used for coordination of different protection of this type is achieved by time delaying and pickup settings it must be minimum of 300 seconds to permit operating of first breaker so uh, if you have for example Let's take an example. If you have two substation, this is one, this is two, and one relay is installed here. Okay, and another relay is installed here. and there is a fault here the fault current because both are in series will be same and we will set the time delay here to 100 milliseconds okay when as soon as the relay will pick up it will trip in so in this section we will discuss uh, different type of over current relay the uh, relay uh, how we can classify the relays by their uh, function so one type is level detection over current relay. So basically we can also name it as a definite time over current relay. So this relay or definite time over voltage relay. So these type of the relays are continuously checking a level, certain level. For example, if you have set uh, the setting of one ampere in the relay and the relay detects that it, uh, it is now just more than one ampere 
then after a preset time delay or instantaneously as per your settings relay will operate it will give alarm or tripping as desired so these are very basic type of uh, protection uh, um, uh, release so we will discuss here the level detection or current relay or you can say the definite time or current relays so these relays are basically continuously measuring the uh, current and then they are comparing it with the set value if it is more just more than if it's a overcurrent protection if it's just more than the set value uh, after after preset time delay or instantaneously depending upon the settings relay will issue an immediate uh, trip command so it's just simply checking the level all the time so here you can see the operating characteristics of the level direction or definite time overcurrent relays are shown here So here you can see this is the time, okay, and this is basically the current. Okay, when the current is increased, this is the rated current, and the setting is done as multiplier of the rated current n. So when the rated, uh, when the current is increased uh, more than the set value, the relay will operate, but the time of operation uh, will remain the same. It will not change. As soon as it is picked up, it will operate. If it uh, if it is a uh, time delivery, then it will wait. A uh, timer will start, and when the timer will complete, then it will issue an alarm or trip. So this is uh, used for coordination of different protection of this type is achieved by time delaying and pickup settings. It must be minimum of 300 seconds to permit operating of first breaker. So uh, if you have for example let's take an example if you have two substation this is one this is two and one relay is installed here okay and another relay is installed here and there is a fault here the fault current because both are in series will be same and we will set the time delay here to 100 milliseconds okay when as soon as the relay will pick up it will trip in 100 milliseconds and here we can set a time delay of 300 milliseconds so if there is a fault this ray will pick up and it will trip the breaker in 100 milliseconds this timer is also running but if the breaker is not tripped by the relay because the relay is faulty or there is no DC supply for example then this relay can will trip and isolate the fault in 300 milliseconds so the level direction relays with a given time delay you can do the coordination studies you can do the coordination and the thumb rule you are keeping the minimum difference of time delay of 300 milliseconds uh, to give enough time to op operate this this breaker welcome friends now we will study in this time time dependent uh, what can release these are also called as inverse time over current relay it means that uh, why we are calling it as inverse time because uh, if the fault current is increasing uh, above the pickup value more the current lesser will be the operating time so you can see this is the curve here okay so this 50 uh, 51 relay 51 relay is basically you can see is inverse time and the 50 relay is basically the definite time over current release so this is our pickup value for the inverse time it's, it's also we have set the same value but you can see if the fault current is increasing if the fault current is uh, equal to n both have this is a definite time it will trip for example in this time but inverse time as per the characteristic will trip in this time you can see the time it will take more 
but if you see if the current is increasing you will move forward the fault level is more so you can see if you see current is from the board here now the time is reduced operating time is reduced <coughs> So similarly, as more there will be more current, the the time will keep on reducing. So this is example of inverse time characteristics. So this characteristics permits a reasonable correlation between production just changing the pickup settings. These relays will be defined by the pickup settings and the type of the tripping curve, which can be adjusted. Basically, there are three type of uh, curves available that we are using. One is uh, normal inverse, also it's called as standard inverse, uh, very inverse, and extremely inverse. And, and there are uh, equations, predefined equations, uh, by which you can calculate this uh, uh, time. Uh, I am I will uh, prepare a training in which uh, I will uh, discuss about in detail about the overcurrent protection all the different types and how you can do the coordination so how you can make the relay coordination of a uh, feeder so i hope uh, you will enroll in this training also so this is uh, basically a very simple example of uh, over current protection that this is we are calling it the definite time which is a uh, which is a straight line and this is the inverse time the inverse time also has three different curves normal inverse very inverse and extremely inverse and each curve time can be calculated using a formula there are two different standard one is uh, uh, there and there are two different formulas one is nc and one is ic in our region we are working on ic which is mostly used in europe nc is used mostly in america Hey guys, now we will discuss about overcurrent protection. Uh, overcurrent protection is uh, a very simplest type of protection. Uh, when there will uh, or basically electromechanical release, then you can find a plug setting multiplier. We have just seen this uh, picture also, and uh, you can see uh, the basically the coil has provided with multiple tapes, and you can select. Uh, you can put a plug in between and uh, it means that you are now changing the turn ratios and magnetic field which is applied on the disc and effectively you are changing basically here the pickup currents so this is a mm, induction disc type and the very famous relay is cdg relay so here you can see we have put a, a coil here a lagging coil and basically it's a coil that will uh, make a difference of angle between flux which is uh, going uh, through this part and this part so phi 1 and phi 2 will be produced so this is old type of uh, electromagnetic relay and you can see this is uh, when the disc operates this contact will make and then you can uh, connect it to tripping or alarm and this is basically where time dial setting is uh, available where you can choose uh, different times for example if you want to have more time then you will move the disk further and it will it will take more time to travel and then it will uh, allow to uh, more delay so it is called as time dial setting and this uh, part is called as a plug setting multiplier So let me go back and uh, show you the CDG relay. So this is the relay that I have explained you. This is basically the plug setting multiplier that I have shown you in the drawing. And on the top here you can find uh, the time setting multiplier. This is basically a... Uh, uh, coil type spring which will reset the contact and reset the disc when the fault is reset and these are the contacts uh, that will operate so this is basically the old type of relay but nowadays the modern relays are microprocessor based relays and then you just have to uh, configure in the relay you just have to put the value pickup value 
and the relay itself will do all the calculations and it will do all the trippings and it's very simple so uh, uh, this is how the uh, overcurrent protection uh, works and it, uh, the overcurrent protection uh, normally has two types one we have seen one is a definite time one is inverse time so inverse time the MC code is 51 and for the definite time the MC code is taken as a 50 so other types of protection we can define as over phase overcurrent we are calling it a phase overcurrent and earth fault overcurrent so if there is a phase to ground fault the earth fault overcurrent will operate and if there is a phase to phase fault then phase overcurrent will pick and operate hi friends in this section we will study a little bit about the direction overcurrent protection so let's now discuss on a board So what direction overcurrent protection is doing? So let us understand this. This is for example a bus bar and this is the line. Okay, and this is the station A and this is the station B or we can make here a transformer so for example here we can make a breaker here this is an outgoing feeder this is an incomer feeder <coughs> so if uh, we install a directional overcurrent here it is called as directional or current earth fault so what will happen that this way will not only see the level of current but also it will see the direction of current it's flowing to make the decision so let's go the setting of the relay here is zero okay one amp and this relay is direction of this relay is basically this relay is seeing the fault in this direction in the forward direction so if there is a fault here for example if there is a fault here this relay will sense the fault level it will check it should be more than 1 ampere and it will take the direction of current if it is in forward direction then this relay will operate and trip but if the fault is in the back side here and for example it's normally DF is installed where on the generation side so we have a generator here So the fault will be fed by this generator. Okay. And then the current will flow through this over current relay. But now the relay will sense the direction of current is not the forward but the reverse. Direction current is the reverse. The current level is more than 1 ampere. But the direction of current is not forward so this relay will not operate and it will protect this generator to out of uh, network so for example if we have more than one feeder here if we have more feeder this other field is applying to another area so this relay will trip okay it will sense a fault and it will make a trip and this portion will be isolated so this portion will be isolated in this case when this trips so so 
so this region has stripped the breaker has opened and then this region is isolated but this generator is keep on feeding the uh, gen uh, to to the uh, to the load to the network so this is the advantage of directional earth fault so if the fault was here in the forward direction now generator cannot feed to the network you, you have to isolate this breaker that will operate and it will isolate the network it will trip this breaker and if there is a breaker here on this area it will it can also trip this breaker by direction by d to d or if the DAF is installed here which is looking in this direction it will trip or we can even install here a normal over country because the direction of fault will not change here so this is basically the concept of uh, using directional earth fault relay on the network the advantage is uh, mostly it is used with a out uh, feeder that has a generation so now there is a sense uh, of uh, 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 fault the direction of fault uh, either in forward or in reverse and how the relay uh, direction earth fault relay is accessing the fault is because one input of this uh, relay is CT okay for example this is the direction earth fault relay this is our direction earth fault relay and it is connected to a CT here and also it is connected to a VT so it is checking angle between voltage and current voltage and current in order to determine the direction of current flow so this is the working principle of DAF and why this uh, DAF is uh, very important. So DAF is uh, DAF this DAF feature is similar to a distance protection 21, uh, which also work in forward and reverse directions. But it is a cheaper solution. Mostly it is installed on the 11 kV and 33 kV uh, unit uh, feeders where uh, generation is connected. So the generator, uh, so the generator should not trip if the fault is in the reverse direction. So here we can go through some theory. Given that the maximum rotating torque is reached when the field owing to the current and voltage have a phase angle of 90 degrees, it is necessary to ensure that in case of fault, major values have a phase angle close to the offer mentioned value and internal phase angle is usually introduced to ensure the pause previously stated when a fault occurs the voltage of the affected phase can be significantly reduced so it is recommended to measure the line to line voltage of the other phase in order to avoid the incorrect performance of the protection so when there is a fault on for example red phase red to yellow phase or red phase to ground normally the other phase uh, voltage is used because the the phase which has the fault uh, the voltage will obviously goes down so it is called as uh, cross polarization and the uh, polarizing quantity uh, is uh, in this case is a voltage which is giving the sense of direction to the relay so uh, the angle at uh, at, uh, at which the maximum task torque is produced it is called as MTA maximum torque angle and uh, in the relay you can say they are doing some some they are using some method to adjust the angle to maximum 90 degrees so this is uh, some basic concept of direction earth fault uh, direction over current relay and direction earth fault also you have the option of uh, using a polarizing quantity a 3 v naught basically in 3 v naught you are connecting all three voltages uh, uh, all three vt windings in series together but you are not closing a delta and this delta will be connected to to the relay 
so normally uh, when the system is healthy all three phase voltages will be balanced and uh, there is some will be zero so 3 v naught in, in the normal condition will be zero but when there is a phase to ground fault this 3 v naught uh, will have some value and it will be used as a polarizing quantity for the sense of direction to the different uh, direction arc fault relay welcome friends in this section we will study another type of protection this is basically a magnitude comparison so basically in this uh, this type of protection is basically checking the magnitude uh, between uh, a and b so the focus is on the magnitude uh, we are not taking care here about the angle so uh, the current uh, uh, balance relay may operate the current in one circuit with the current in another circuit which should have equal or proportional magnitude under normal operating conditions the relay will operate when current division in the two circuits varies by given tolerance so example could be for example if we have a three phase motor the normally all three phases should draw similar currents so we can have a relay which monitor all three phases magnitude not not the angle and if there is a significant significant difference in stage one it could have relay issue the alarm and then stage two it will issue the trip because if one phase is out the relay could damage same uh, same we can apply on the generators so all the generators are designed to run on certain unbalance if the unbalance is more so it 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 will damage the generator so this is the working principle of magnitude comparison uh, units so another type of technique that is used is basically the differential comparison systems so in this way uh, alter alternatively one could form an algebraic sum of two current entering the protected element which could be termed as differential current and use a level detector relay to detect the presence of fault in general, this principle is capable of detecting very small magnitude of fault. Its only drawback is that it requires current from extreme uh, of our zone of protection. So uh, nowadays, uh, the differential protection uh, working principle, a uh, transformer differential protection is is working. So advantage of transformer differential protection is that uh, the HPCTs and LVCTs both are in the same substations. But if you talk about uh, the differential protection of a line that we are talking about now is that uh, you, one CT is available at local end and another CT is available at remote end. Previously it was difficult uh, because uh, the relays were not that much modern but now it's also very simple. Uh, the relays, uh, both uh, line differential relays are connected through a fiber optic and uh, they are communicating uh, all the CT data through fiber optic to each other and then and the, the relay is working satisfactorily and line differential is working fine. So here you can see uh, differential protection principle for we, if we consider for the transformer same will be the line. So it compares the current entering the transformer with the current leaving the element. If, the, if they are equal, there is no fault inside the zone of protection. If they are not equal, it means the fault occurs between the two ends. So this is the case one. Here you can see the fault is outside of the zone. Current entering and current leaving both are the same because there is no leakage in between. So there will be zero differential here uh, in the relay and the relay will not operate. So this is the case too where we have a fault on the transformer phase to ground fault uh, or transformer failure. So you can see the current will enter from the both direction and it will add up in the relay. So the relay will operate and differential is greater than the zero and greater than the set value. The differential will operate and it will make a trip. So this is a very simple explanation of differential relay. Thank you very much. Phase angle comparison release. These are one of the very interesting release that we used to, used to be uh, used before, uh, but now we are seeing lesser uh, this type of relays in the field. So uh, just consider this is a station A and station B. There are two stations. 
So the relay will check the phase angle of uh, the station A. For example, that quantity of current with the station B current. So it will check the phase angle uh, of the both stations. So you can see the direction of current will be from A to B and the direction of current we you can see is in this direction from A to B. Now if there is a fault uh, uh, in between these feeders the fault will be fed by both uh, uh, both directions so you can see here the phase angle will be out of phase by 180 degrees so there is a phase reversal you, the ray will sense the, the phase angle of the two quantities under observation the current of A and B is now reversed it means only that there is a fault so then relay will issue a trip command. So uh, now you can see if the fault is outside uh, this uh, zone A and B. So the direction of current in the both station will be the same. So the fault feed feed and, and the direction will be same. The phase angle of the A and B quantities on the both uh, substation will be in phase and hence no trip will be issued. So this is a concept of phase angle comparison protection release. Thank you very much. Hi friends, in this section we will study about one different kind of protection which is called as a circuit breaker failure protection. So the breaker may have a mechanical failure if it is not able to open any of the poles when it is ordered to do so or even electrical failure if, if all the open is not capable of breaking the current which will keep on flowing as an arc. So another type of failure could be um, failure of uh, SF6 lockout because if SF6 breakers if the gas is low stage 1 there will be an alarm and stage 2 the gas will be released more and it's uh, dangerous to operate the breaker so breaker will be in lockout stage so this is another form of breaker failure protection. This implies a current flow that keep on feeding the fault which can be used to detect the breaker failure itself. So the relay, breaker failure relay monitoring the status of the contact, auxiliary contact of the breaker and also it is monitoring the current. Since the failure could be electrical or it could be mechanical. It is possible that the breaker is open mechanically but the arc is not quenched and the current is still flowing through the breaker. So in this case the breaker failure will detect it as a fault and the failure of the uh, circuit breaker and then it will in stage 1 it will try to re-trip the breaker it will give tripping commands to TC1 and TC2 trip coil 1 and 2 and in stage 2 uh, it will trip the feeding sources. In these so those applications which even though mechanical failure exists, the current could the current could not be high enough to be detected. The uh, opening must also be verified by means of breaker auxiliary contacts. So let's uh, go to our board. So now let's consider the case here. So for example, we have here, okay, I will open, can I open this single line diagram? Okay, so better to draw on paint, it's easier to understand. So I will select, first of all, I will draw the bus bar. For example, This is the bus bar and this is one feeder. This is for example another feeder connected to the bus. This is another feeder connected to the bus. These are all feeding to the bus and 
we can then draw the breakers Uh, excuse me for some bad drawings. I will try to. I'm trying to improve this section also, but it will take some time. So this is basically the bus bar, and it is fed by different uh, breakers. So uh, we will uh, understand. We will. Con there is a fault, for example, here on the line. So we will consider uh, a case where we have a double bus and a single breaker scheme. Here you can see uh, this line can be connected to bus if you close this isolator it will be connected to the bus 1 and if you close this isolator the line will be connected to bus 2. And further we, we can have different uh, uh, connections that we can make. So we will first of all make connections I will connect line 1 to bus 1. So let's uh, close this isolator. So here we have closed the isolator and this isolator and the line isolator. So it means this line is connected to bus 1 and this line is connected to also bus 1. This feeder is connected to bus 2, line 2 is connected to bus 2 and coupler is also connected. So here uh, I have make a initial configuration. So we will consider a fault on this line. Okay, if we consider this line has a fault. Fault on line three for example this is line one this is line two and there is a fault on line three we will assume that there is a fault face to ground fault here on the line okay there is face to ground fault on the line and the relay of this line line 3 will pick up and it will issue the trip command okay so whenever any protection relay pick up this is our breaker failure protection relay for example This is breaker failure. Also, we will write BF relay. So, this is breaker failure relay. This for protection relay, line protection relay distance. For example, we have here distance relay which is protecting line 3. distance 21 mm, we need to resize it okay this ray will issue the trip command to the circuit breaker but circuit breaker we will consider that this circuit breaker is failed so it means that still fault current is flowing to the ground so loop of the fault current will be from bus 1 to the breaker to the ground. So this is the fault current which is still flowing in the ground irrespective that distance relay has issued the trip command the breaker is not open. So this breaker is faulty. So we will mark this breaker as faulty. So this breaker failed to open. 
when uh, the protection relay gives the strip command at the same time the protection relay also give initiation to the breaker failure protection relay so it will give initiation to the protection that you should be ready and start pick up when the relay breaker failure relay initiate it will get uh, initiation signal from the distance mean protection relay it will start its timer so it's getting a current input from the ct so let's draw a ct here so for example ct is available here let's choose a green color for ct and ct is connected to distance and also it's connected to breaker failure and then at the end it is grounded so now relay breaker failure relay is getting initiation signal so initiation means at least one of the protection relay should picked up means some some fault has happened and protection relay has operated already so this is information is now feed to breaker failure relay breaker failure relay at the same time monitoring the current if the current is reset the relay will understand that now this uh, 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 breaker has operated successfully and then no need to uh, uh, continue the timer the timer will stop so, but if for example in our case the breaker is failed the current fault current is still flowing it means the relay is also picked up the relay will not reset if the fault current is there relay will not reset so this uh, initiation bf initiation so the so one quantity is bf initiation and current pickup both are there so timer will be continued so predefined after predefined time delay for example so bf stage 1 is 100 milliseconds and bf2 is stage 2 is 200 milliseconds so in the stage 1 in the stage 1 the bf relay after 100 milliseconds has are passed the stage relay it could be 100 to 150 milliseconds uh, the stage uh, 1 is passed the bf will relay in stage 1 retrip command it will try to trip same breaker it will try to trip it again in fact in the scheme it will send trip command to tc1 and tc2 at the same time so it will try to retrip the breaker in stage 1 so that if the breaker is tripped and then fault will be isolated if the fault is still not isolated and the pickup is still not reset the current is still is there then the relay will go into the stage 2 differential breaker failure differential protection will go into the stage 2 and stage 2 what uh, it has to do is in stage 2 the basic principle that you have to understand for the breaker failure is you have to isolate all the possible sources which are feeding the fault so what are the possible sources source 1 is this bus 1 so the fault is feed through bus 1 so this is one of the source so we will mark it this is one of the source which is feeding the fault so breaker failure protection in stage 2 will initiate the bus power protection 1 because this feeder is connected to the bus power 1 so it will initiate the bus power protection 1 so let's make another box of bus 1 so the relay will initiate in stage 2 it will give signal to this bus bar because whatever uh, fault is feed is feed through this one uh, through this bus so uh, in the bus will operate so uh, now those feeders which are connected to this bus will be tripped 
so at the present you can see line 1 is only connected which is basically feeding the fault also so you can see the loop here from the line 1 fault loop is like this at present it is going through the bus 1 and to the ground so the bus will trip all the feeders connected to bus 1 so the this line 1 will be tripped and also the coupler will be tripped so so that the bus 2 should be isolated so when this is isolated this loop is isolated here so this breaker is now open so this is now open uh, also this breaker line 1 breaker is open now there is no fault feeding from this end but still there is a chance that fault is feed from the remote end so the breaker failure in stage 2 operate the bus bar and also it will send direct transfer trip to the remote end breaker so let me draw here the remote end this is the remote end so the relay will send DTT through the telecommunication systems it will send trip to the remote end breaker it will send the command is called as direct transfer trip it will send direct transfer trip to the remote end so this is how the breaker failure uh, protection is operating there is uh, another uh, function of the breaker fail for example if the breaker fail protection is connected to a transformer and there are some protection of the transformers which are uh, mechanical protections so where there is a chance that there is no uh, no enough current uh, in this like a pressure relief like a buckles so there is one option in the relay which is called as a low current mode and that option is enabled and also uh, breaker status is also connected uh, in this uh, uh, in, 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 in this uh, type of uh, low current operations and instead of current the status is, is, is monitored so this is how the breaker failure protection works so, so I hope you understand uh, the concept well so we will move on to the slide so we will see the tripping uh, uh, order for the circuit breaker initiate the time delay countdown for the protection so you can see the fault is here, the relay will issue the trip command. Okay. Once the time delay is over, if the breaker is not yet open, the production sends a tripping order to all the adjacent breakers, including those at the end of the line of if necessary. Sometimes two time delays are used, the first one to repeat the tripping order for the breaker itself and the second for the other breaker. So in the stage one, this is the breaker failure protection so you can see one core is connected to CT core is connected to distance another CT core is connected to the breaker failure protection so in stage one distance relay will give trip command but if the distance relay fails to trip the breaker failure will issue re-trip first of all in, in stage one it is normally 100 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds and then stage two which is between 100 and 50 to 250, 200 to 250 milliseconds uh, it will uh, issue trip to the bus power protection all the adjacent breaker which can feed the fault and the remote end so this was uh, uh, about the breaker failure protection I hope you enjoy the training it is a continuous current which a bus power can carry without uh, any damage then it has a 40 kilo ampere for 3 seconds it means it is a short circuit rating of the bus power that the bus power can carry 40 kilo ampere for 3 seconds then frequency is 50 hertz and it is a 3 phase bus power obviously which is shown in, on a single line pattern ok then we will go to the E01 which is our bay number 1 e is showing basically the voltage level for voltage to kV so here you can see the, this is the isolator and this isolator is called as a bus isolator and M is showing it is a mode property and it is isolator 
some earth switch so it, this is basically a three position switch you can say like this which is a function of isolator and earth as well and the rating of uh, uh, this isolator is 1250 so you can see the rating of the line bay is 50 percent the rating of the bus bar here this is per design then we have uh, q51 which is basically our switch further we have a breaker and which is uh, 1250 ampere which is 40 kilo ampere so breaker is also more propagated further you can see a uh, current transformer and current transformer has one two three four these circles are showing number of cores so it is transformer is multi-core p1 is the polarity of c which is towards uh, bus bar p2 is the polarity of c t u is towards line so if we make a star point or we all join all the CD secondary winding at S1 side then we will say that star point of the CT is towards bus and if we join all the CT wiring coming from S2 side to make a common wire then we will call it as CT star points towards line so this is uh, some introduction that I have provided you further you can see this is the core number one which is of class point two this is for use for metering three four and two three and four are five feet twenty and they have chosen 800 ampere uh, slash one ampere ratio for all the cities so we can call it as a multi-core and multi-ratio ct uh, cl point 0 0.2 means it is it can have a error of 0.2 and it is class 0.2 is used for metering 5 to 20 means uh, this CT can have the 5% error at 20 times of fault current so this is uh, the did some detail about the CT then you can find a line isolator which is again more propagated and then you can find uh, the detail about the, this equipment which is 40 crore ampere and continuous rating is 1 to 5 0 this is again the line isolator and earth switch further you can find uh, q8 which is 40 kilo ampere and you can find this is basically the high speed earth switch for the line because a uh, line in, in our case is a cable feeder and uh, if the cable is long there will be a large charging current and if we slowly uh, close the earth then it might damage the contact of the earth because it, it has a high charging current and we, when you will connect the earth slowly the spark will bigger and will damage the contact so high speed earth switch is provided to close the earth uh, in a fast way to protect the equipment so this is basically you can see this core P2 uh, near to P2, this core 5 to 20 potassium core is connected to breaker failure and bus power protection. This protection has both functions, so one CD is enough for both. And further, you will see the bay E02, which is the transformer bay, and you can find the similar equipment here and the CT is again except the ratio here uses 200 dash dash 1 because it is using as less ratio because of the capacity of transformer and the CT is connected to again the bus bar and recuperable production relay further you will see that uh, production panel RP6 the bus bar production relay is giving trip to trip coil 1, trip coil 2, it is giving alarm at control panel and SCADA alarm is, is connected. So this was all about the single line diagram. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. Uh, in this section, we will 
see what factors that are influencing the relay performance. So we can classify the relay performance in three different categories. Uh, category 1 is uh, the relay has performed correctly. Category 2 is the relay has no conclusion. Category 3 is the relay has not operated correctly or incorrectly. So uh, the incorrect operation may be either failure to trip or false tripping. The cause of incorrect operation may be poor application, incorrect settings, personal error, equipment malfunctions. Equipment that can cause an incorrect operation includes current transformers, voltage transformers, breakers, coils, wiring, relays, channels, or station batteries. Incorrect tripping of circuit breaker not associated with the trouble area is often as a disaster as failure to trip hence special care must be taken in both application and installation to ensure against this. No conclusion is the last resort when no evidence is available for correct or incorrect operation. Quite often this is a personal involvement. So there are three different uh, type of uh, scenarios. One, time and one scenario is when the production is operated correctly. The another scenario is incorrect operations. Uh, incorrect operations can be uh, can happen because uh, there could be a wrong setting in the protection release. Most of the uh, setting uh, trippings which are caused are basically mall tripping, unfortunately, and these are due to the wrong settings. Other option could be, for example, tripping may caused by CT saturation uh, or by it may caused by VT itself. So uh, sometimes the relay mall functions. Sometimes relays has not done anything, so there is no conclusion of enough uh, basically data available to decide the relay should have operated or not. So these are some factors which are influencing the relay performance. Welcome friends. In this section, we will go to through basic uh, electrical theory. So we will see some equations like Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's uh, current law, and Kirchhoff's voltage law. So you can see we will start with basic power equations uh, V is equal to I into Z where Z is equal to R plus Jx uh, these are basically the vector quantities uh, S is the apparent power which we are saying uh, VA is equal to voltage into current and in the rectangle components it can be shown as P plus JQ. Uh, P uh, in watts uh, can be uh, written as uh, voltage into current cos of phi, voltage and current into the power factor. Cos of phi is basically same as the power factor, which is equal to V squared divided by R, which is equal to I square R. Q is measured in VAR, uh, which is equal to V into I into sine of the angle. S is equal to P under uh, under root. Uh, P square plus Q square power factor can also be calculated by P divided by S. Uh, basic power equation uh, three phase power uh, is equal to three into single phase power. Three phase power is also can be calculated into three into V line to neutral into I single phase or in the other way, we can calculate uh, three phase power is equal to three divided by V line to line divided by under root three into I one single phase. So P uh, power or S uh, three phase uh, normally the equation we are using mostly in case of transformers and generators and everywhere is under root three V line to line into I single phase or it's equal to under root three V into I. So uh, we will uh, go through an example where we will calculate full load current of 115 by 12.47 kV, uh, 20, 30, 40 MVA power transformers. So first of all, why a transformer has uh, written with three different ratings? Uh, the reason behind is the transformer rating depends upon the cooling method. So if the transformer has three la la levels of cooling, two levels of cooling here, so if like fan group 1 and 2 <coughs> if both fan groups are off so this transformer can we can draw the power up to 20 MVA, MVA if the fan group 1 is on you can draw the power up to 30 VA so if fan group 2 is on you can draw the power up to 40 MVA so that's why the transformer rating is shown in different values 
So let's uh, calculate uh, the full load current. So P is equal to under root 3 V into I. So I is equal to P divided by under root 3 V L L. So then it's equal to 40 MV divided by under root 3. For HV side, the voltage is 1.5 kV. So we have calculated the HV full load current as 200.8 amperes on the high side. So in the same way, we will calculate the current. We have to just divide it by the low side voltage, which is coming as 1852 amps. So at low voltage side, the current is more, but the voltage is less. But at the high voltage side, the current is less, but the voltage is more. But the power will remain same on the both sides. So next uh, we will just go through the per unit system uh, briefly. Uh, sim uh, per unit system simplifies calculation in power system, allow a single phase equivalent circuit of three phase system, no more under root theory errors, eliminates power transformers for calculations. Because of this, it is uh, very common for equipment parameters to be in per unit, example 20 MV transformer with 8.5 percentage impedance. So, Whenever you, you, you will see the nameplate of an transformer, you will see the percentage impedance uh, they are showing in always in per unit or percentage. So we will take uh, an example. Uh, we can see we have a transformer which the rating is 115 by 12.47 kV and the rating is 20, 30 to 40 MV transformer with 8.5% uh, is the percentage impedance. What is the maximum fault current on the low side? So we can we can calculate. Uh, first of all, we should know the percentage impedance. So how is transformer percentage impedance is determined? So short one side of the transformer slowly increase the voltage on the other side until the current reaches the rated base amps. So this is the method of finding percentage impedance. So you will get this formula. Uh, I rate it uh, at 20 MVA is 100.4 ampere at HV side. The test determined the required voltage to get 100.4 amps is 9.775 volts. So it means that impedance Z is equal to V divided by I which is equal to 97.36 ohms. So how you will use 97.36 ohms in calculating fault currents on the low side under the normal condition, voltage regulation, etc. Phase, uh, single phase or three phase, voltage ratio, current ratio, this is uh, pretty tough. So how is transformer percentage impedance determined? Short one side of the transformer slowly increase the voltage okay uh, to the other side and the current reaches the rated uh, base amps so you can get this value again this is 100.4 ampere the test determine the rate uh, required voltage to get 100 amps 9.775 volts so percentage impedance can be calculated by dividing uh, v divided by i so uh, 9.775 we are dividing it by 115 and we are getting is 0.085 which is equal to 8.5 percentage impedance. So this is the formula in this way we are doing the we are calculating the percentage impedance using per unit value. We are not using this formula so this formula is very easy to understand and very easy to do it. So you just have to uh, uh, divide the ohms by the voltages. Uh, of the HV side you will get the percentage impedance. So this is another example. Uh, what is the maximum fault current on the low voltage side if you know the percentage impedance. So we have done the calculation you have to divide MVA divided by percentage impedance you will get 235 MVA. So this is the uh, fault MVA. So you can calculate the fault MVA using this formula. This is very simple. So you have and you know the MV rating of the transformer divided by the percentage impedance, you will get the fault MV. So if you want to collect the fault current, you just uh, in this way simply using the, this formula I fault is equal to P fault or S fault divided by under 3 into V line to line. So in this way you can calculate the fault on HV side and LV side.
So remember, personal independence is on the transformer base rating 20 MV, not the top rating 40 MV. So you need to know what is the base rating of the uh, uh, transformer. So normally, the personal independence is uh, selected on the base rating which is the least rating of the transformer so you should in the nameplate you should be able to know that what is the base rating so now we will use per unit uh, system to evaluate the fast okay let it do it in the next section so thank you very much In this section, we will use uh, per unit values to calculate the and to evaluate the arc flash hazards. So, where are you uh, at more risk for the arc? Working over 14.5 kV terminal of 50, 62, 75 MVA, 9% percentage impedance of substation transformer, or working on 480 volt terminal of 2500 kVA, 5.5% impedance of distribution transformers. So, this is an example. So we will see uh, we have two different type of transformers so which have more hazard of arc flash. So solution is uh, we will calculate basically uh, the fault current uh, in case of both transformers. So this is uh, fault current calculated uh, for the type 1 where you can say voltage is 14.4 kV the fault uh, the fault amps is 22 kilo amperes approximately and for the uh, low voltage voltages are very less this is 480 volts and here we have high volts so the current is 54 kilo amperes so uh, by this example we can see the arc energy we can calculate is, is equal to i square into t so uh, we uh, once you calculate uh, the arc energy uh, for 14.4 kV the arc energy and then you have to divide it by this one it, it is giving uh, uh, that it is understood that uh, the arc flash energy a distribution transformer is six times more than the arc energy uh, at the 14.44 uh, kV transformers could you have done this with ohms it could have been difficult so this is example of arc flash study so we have seen the impact of arc basically the concept is that arc is not depending upon the voltage arc is depending upon the current so more the current the more will be the arc and uh, if the arc current is uh, and if the arc will be more then there will be a more energy in the arc so energy in the arc is directly uh, square of the time so if even that at low voltage the impact of R is more because the distribution transformers doesn't have that much percentage impedance so we can see the distribution transformer here has percentage is of 5.5 percent whereas that main transformers power transformers have the percentage impedance of 9 percent so this is a very good example uh, to understand that uh, how uh, which equipment has more arc flash hazards so a layman will uh, will think that 14.4 kV the voltage level is more the transformer MVA is more have a more arc flash but with this calculation you know that a very small transformer of uh, you can say 0.25 MVA and 480 volts has a very very six times more hazardous and then a, a bigger transformer 75 MVA for the arc, arc flash so you need to be aware of the fault current uh, before you are starting the work so it is more important to wear the arc flash uh, equipment on the 480 volts in this case so this is how this arc flash studies is important I hope you enjoy this uh, lecture thank you Hi friends, in this section we will go through the phaser system and different uh, types of fault. What will happen if uh, there is a different type of fault in the phaser system? So here yeah, we can see if the system is balanced. So you can see uh, the all three voltages are balanced and placed equally at uh, 120 degrees. And the current is also balanced and in the symmetry. 
and it is at 120 degree place here we can see the current is lagging the voltage it means it is showing that the load has a lagging power factor so this is the waveform for a balance system so now we consider a three phase fault if there is a three phase fault in this three phase fault you will see that current three phase current is increased too much and the three phase voltage will be reduced so you can see the current has increased and voltage are decreased so but uh, the symmetry is not disturbed so symmetry of voltage and current remain the same so this is basically what happened when uh, there is a three phase fault again we will start if we for example if you have a balance system and then if there is basically single line to ground fault so you see this is phase a this is phase b and this is uh, this is phase a phase b and phase c this is va vb and vc so if there is a phase to ground fault previously it was looking like this everything was fine and balanced so when there is a fault on phase uh, a so phase a voltages are reduced because this loop is under fault and the phase a current is increased so this is what happened when there is a fault on phase a so again we will consider a balance system first and then you can see if there is a phase to phase fault so in case it was it was like this so then we have fault on phase a and phase c so phase a and c Mm, uh, both will be equal and opposite because the current will be entering through phase A and uh, phase B and leaving phase C. So now the angle is disturbed. So uh, uh, angle between these two phases will be out of phase by 180 degrees. And you can see the phase B and C, the voltage will be collapsing. So this will be the waveform of the system. This will be look like this. So again we will consider first the balance system and then we consider that we have uh, line to line to ground fault. So in this way you can see we have fault on B and C and then you can see the voltage of B and C are uh, reduced and the current in B and C is in, in this direction. So it was B was here and C was here so the voltages are just reduced and an angle of B and C slightly tilted uh, towards each other and the current you can see also is in different direction B and C both are moved so because now both conductors are uh, uh, grounded and uh, now current is not out of phase between B and C but there is a huge current we will consider a fault balance system again and then we will come to the phasor system so we have a balance system we have unbalanced system so we can divide phasors in two groups one is balanced and another one is unbalanced in the balance system for example it is a three phase load we have a balanced phasor so voltages are high current is under limit and the three phase fault is also a balanced symmetrical system but in this one current is higher and voltage is less but symmetry of the system is not disturbed whereas in unbalanced systems uh, single phase to ground fault double line to uh, ground fault phase to phase fault uh, unbalanced load these are all example of unbalanced system so this was a little introduction about the phasors next topic will be about symmetrical components so we will just have a little introduction about the symmetrical components basically an unbalanced system it can be divided into three different balance systems one is positive sequence, one is negative sequence, and one is zero sequence. So, zero sequence, you can see all three components, uh, phase A and B3, all three are in phase. Positive sequence is same as uh, a, a normal healthy system. It has the same sequence, A, B, and C. 
So, negative sequence uh, it has a reverse sequence. So, first A will come, then C will come, then B will come. So, this is the little presentation of symmetrical components. So, any unbalanced system as I have told you can be equally presented, can be presented by a positive sequence and by a negative sequence and by zero sequence. So, we, we have to decompose an unbalanced system into three different uh, sequences so that we can use it easily uh, in our calculations. So, this is just an uh, introduction and idea of our uh, symmetrical components. So, here is a summary uh, different we will see different types of fault and which type of uh, components are available in it. For example, if for a three phase uh, load uh, only positive sequence components are available. Uh, for three phase faults uh, also the positive sequence is available for line to line faults positive and negative sequence is available for line to ground all three sequences are available for line to ground to, uh, uh, to fault line to line to ground fault all three components are available open phase uh, also positive negative and zero sequence is available if the phase is open for unbalanced load all three components are available. So, this is just a summary uh, uh, and explaining the different types of faults and conditions and availability of components. Thank you. So, in the substation uh, there are two type of uh, instrument transformers are available. Uh, one transformer instrument transformer is called as a current transformer whereas another instrument transformer is called as a voltage transformers. So, we will start with the current transformer. So, this uh, is basically very simplified diagram of the current transformer. So, there is a conductor and this is called uh, we are calling it as a primary IP uh, primary current is flowing through it and this is basically the hollow core type of CT and this is basically CT run ratio primary turn ratio will be considered in this case a 1 and secondly you can see there are a lot of turns and then you can see uh, that there is a primary current and depending upon the ratio there will be a CT secondary current and it is connected to a meter so uh, for example uh, why we are using uh, uh, here a current transformer why we are not measuring directly the current in the system. So, the reason is for example, if you are working on 132 kV level, first of all if you are, if you are trying to put the ammeter uh, in the circuit at 132 kV level, you have to design a uh, ammeter uh, at the insulation level of 132 kV which will be extremely costly, costly and, and not feasible. The size will be very big and it will be extremely costly. Secondly, uh, if you want to connect the equipment at the high voltage level, the current for example at the high voltage is flowing is 1200 ampere. So, then you it means that you need to design a ammeter at 1200 ampere rating and this size will be again huge. So, the best idea is to step down to find a way to step down the current and also to isolate the voltages and connect it to some uh, smaller device at the remote area, remote uh, place and you can do the measurements of current or voltages or you can do the uh, protection features. For example, I have designed this, uh, uh, for example, we have designed a, a transformer because you know the transformer has basically uh, the transformation ratio. So, it, it can step down when it step down the uh, voltage it is increasing the current and when it is uh, stepping up the voltage it is basically uh, decreasing the current. So, here you can see we have put a ring core CT and uh, we have put a, a CT is kind of step up transformer. So, voltage will be up but the current will be uh, reduced. So, it is put uh, in a ring so, voltage will be negligible here and we are we have shorted the CT secondary and you can see in this way if for example, 300 ampere is flowing through primary, there will be less current at the secondary depending upon the ratio. So, we can define this ratio by N1 divided by N2 is equal to 
i2 divided by i1 so this is the uh, we are calling it this is as a primary this is the bar is showing as a primary and this uh, secondary current is shown by is and ip so this is was a little concept of the ct that why we are using cts or even vts in the in, in the substations this is uh, one of the reason and there are two different types of cts physically available one is wound type or uh, uh, window type or split type another one is wound type so this is example of wound type ct so the conductor is connected at the one terminal and the another terminal is connected to the other side so this is basically the window type so conductor is passing through this uh, for example you can pass a cable through this and this is split core type so you can all, even if the cable is already installed you can split it open the core and you can then again connect the core back and tight it then you can connect the ct in series so as i told you the ct ratio is measured by the simple formula uh, np primary trans divided by secondary trans equal to secondary current divided by primary current so secondary current can be calculated by using the formula is equal to primary current into np divided by ns this is basically a very simple uh, presentation of a current transformer so you can see this is a bus and uh, this is the generator and you can see it is feeding a line we have put our ct in series and this is basically a secondary winding and this is called as a primary winding of the current transformer and this is the relay which is sensing the current so here ratio a ct ratio is 1000 by 5 ampere so for example if there is a fault 1000 ampere is flowing through the primary but uh, the ratio is such that if 1000 flow on the primary 5 ampere should flow on the secondary side so the 5 ampere is flowing to the secondary side so the relay we we have installed only 5 ampere relay the fault current here is 1000 ampere but uh, just for your curiosity the normally the fault level is in kilo amperes so, and we are using the relay because thanks to the cts uh, cts we are using relays of only 1 ampere in the field so the relay for example setting is 4 amperes the relay will pick up and it will operate and it will trip the breaker and to isolate the fault so this is the function of uh, current transformer it is reducing the current to manageable level so and uh, in the relay we are we are in, in the modern relays there is option of putting ct ratio and even you can do the settings in primary or secondary there is a switch you can select in numerical relays so you can do after putting the ratio you can do the settings in primary as well as in secondary so then there is another uh, concept of ct which is called as ct saturation so uh, when the current passes through the ct core basically ct core uh, also has some capacity so when the flux is uh, full when the flux capacity is full there is no rate of change of flux in the core and you can say the core is saturated so when the flux after some certain time is full and there is no rate of change so it means that uh, there is no rate of change there will be no induced voltages so we can say the core is saturated and the output of the cts is reduces and it ceases and the waveform is very bad shape when the primary current is so high that the core cannot handle any more flux the ct is said to be saturation in saturation there is no flux change when the primary current changes as the core is already carrying maximum flux since there is no flux change there is no secondary current flowing so here I have shown you this is the full load current this is basically the meeting we have shown the meeting CT core so meeting CTs are designed to saturate after certain amps for example if 110 to 120 percent after that they are designed to saturate because they are not there for protection so if there is too much current they will saturate no need to uh, make a CT uh, of bigger size for the metering because it will operate always within the maximum load current and you can see this is basically the waveform for the protection CT so protection CT will not saturate because uh, it, it when the fault comes the level is in kilo amperes and the 
potassium CT has to be connected to the potassium relay and the potassium relay has to decide during fall time that uh, to trip uh, and to make all decisions. So that's why the potassium CT you can see here the wave form of potassium CT is still sinusoidal at higher value of current. This is approximately 20 to 30 times the waveform is still sinusoidal. So whereas um, if you see the metering core, the waveform CT is saturated at this point and you can see the waveform is no more sinusoidal. The waveform is a sawtooth, it is in the form of spikes. So the potassium CT is not saturated whereas the metering CT is saturated. So how you can define uh, the saturation? So uh, when uh, the current is increased, secondary current is increased, the exciting, uh, if, you, if you increase the voltages, uh, if you are injecting the voltages to the CT secondary, if you increase the voltages, the current in the CT secondary will also increase. So there is a real linear relationship in the start, 10% increase in the voltage will also result in 10% increase in magnetizing current in the CT secondary. Uh, but point will come where 10% increase in CT secondary, the saturation will start happening, will increase 50% uh, current uh, in the exciting core. This point is called as a knee point and um, this knee point is defined on the on normally CT nameplates uh, or in the manual you can find out the knee point. Normally we are testing the relay and we are checking the knee point of the CT and automatically also the knee point is uh, calculated. When the primary current is so high that the core, core cannot handle any more flux, CT is said to be saturated. So this is an uh, again the example of uh, uh, CT saturation. You can see this is the saturation, saturation region, saturated region and this is the unsaturated region. So and this is the knee point as I explained you. So again uh, we are showing the operating, this is the basically flux uh, and excitation diagram and you can see this uh, protective CT operating point, measuring CT operating points. Then we will discuss some errors in the current transformers. So there are two types of the errors in the current transformer, one is a ratio error and another one is a phase angle error. because. Uh, uh, ratio error is uh, because of X and each uh, uh, transformer uh, have uh, also exciting uh, in order to drive the magnetism it will draw some exciting current so this exciting current will be minus from secondary I2 current so this exciting current is basically uh, will create a error in the CT secondary so design should be done so that error should be within the permissible limits and uh, the error in the reproduction will appear uh, both in amplitude and phase as shown in figure. Uh, the relay in the amplitude is called uh, ratio error. According to definition, the current error is positive if the secondary current is higher than the rated current. The error in the phase angle is called phase error or phase displacement. The phase error is positive if the secondary current is leading the primary current. So nowadays equipments are automatically calculating the phase angle errors and the ratio errors and then they are giving the results. So another topic is uh, current burden. So uh, uh, we will discuss uh, okay the current burden. Uh, the burden of the CT is a value in ohms of the impedance on the secondary side of the CT due to relay and the cable connections CT secondary and the release the secondary rated current is standardized in 1 and 5 amps the output voltage of the current shows the capability of transformer to carry burden so whatever you connect to the secondary side in ohms is called basically a burden so this burden is the sum of uh, uh, lead resistance and the VA burden of the relay which is already defined in the in the manual and also you can measure the VA burden simply you need to inject uh, rated current 1 ampere or 5 ampere in the loop and then you can measure the voltage and then you can multiply V into I to calculate the uh, VA, actual VA burden in the field. Then we will discuss here the 
current transformer should have never been open circuited. Secondary winding of CD is always single point grounded. Hey friends, previously we have seen uh, something regarding uh, current transformer theory. So I will discuss with you now practical problem that we have faced. So question is what will happen if we swap metering and protection core in a system. So what will happen if I connect, if I have a protection relay, for example this is a protection relay and this is the measuring device and I have two cores, CT cores okay this is the conductor for example this is the core one this is a core two and this is a protection core 5p20 for example and this is measurement core class 0.2 so both have same ratios like uh, 300 by 1 300.1 okay so both have same configuration and if I connect uh, this let me mark the this is basically the over current relay for example over current relay and this is basically the meter so if I connect this is what happened practically and we find the issue if I connect the metering core to this over current relay and the protection core I connect to the metering so what will happen so I have we have just finished in a lecture and I have explained you everything so what what do you think what will happen if we make uh, different connections both have the CT ratio similar CT ratio and both have uh, similar secondary CT ratio so what will happen I will explain you now just now for example the fault current is coming 20 times so if there is a fault face to ground fault there will be a current so let's see the fault current here is flowing through this is 20 times it will be equal to 300 300 into 20 which is equal to 6000 or 6 kilo amps so 6 kilo amps is flowing through this both of the CT so when 6 uh, when the current is reaching to instead of 300 to 350 for example So there will be 6 kilo amperes flowing. So this CT, uh, measuring CT is designed to saturate at overload. So this will be saturated at 120%. So it will be kind of 360 or maximum 400 amps. This CT will saturate. So the fault level is 6 kilo amps. If this CT is saturated, there will be output of the CT secondary will be 0 and the over current relay will not sense a fault whenever there is a fault this relay will not sense a fault and at the other end when there is a fault so this fault current will be fitted to the meter so this current will be in the range of for example we have 6000 amps so we'll see how much will be the secondary current 6000 divided by 300 so it will be approximately 20 kilo ampere will flow through the meter 20 amperes 20 amps so this 20 amps we can also damage the meter 
but uh, the more damaging is that the protection will never operate in case of fault so if this protection specific protection is not operating another protection as a backup protection will operate so uh, this the problem that we find out one of the substation and this is very practical example that how the metering and protection core works thank you very much Hey friends, so it's important to note that uh, for the CT, the CT current transformer circuit should never be open circuited in any case. So this is because that current transformer generally work at low flux density. The core is made of high quality material to give a small magnetizing current. On the open circuit, the secondary impedance becomes infinite and the core saturates. This induces a very high voltage in the primary winding up to approximately system voltages and the corresponding volts in the secondary will depend on the number of turns multiplied by the ratio. Since the CT normally has much many turn raised turns in secondary compared to the primary the voltage generated on the open circuit CT will be much more than the system volts leading to flash over. So, this is the concept and if the CT is uh, uh, lightly or not loaded, the uh, flash over will be not that much high. But if the CD, CT is loaded and you are trying to open the CT, then the flash over you can consider that it is it's a very high flash over. So CT opening is always a very, very, uh, you can say dangerous phenomenon that has to be avoided. So. Uh, need to take care the CT should no, never be open in any case. Secondly, we will discuss the topic as CT secondary winding always uh, is grounded at a single point. So uh, uh, it's always required, you can see in this figure, the secondary uh, uh, always uh, the secondary winding is, is grounded, the star point is made. So you can see then they have then the connections that they have uh, from the yard they have taken three wires to the relay and they make a star point in the switch yard and they make a ground connection and they take a single wire to the relay. So it's important to, to connect uh, basically star point at one point and avoid the multiple groundings. So grounding is important uh, in order to make a reference. So if the, it is, uh, if the system is ungrounded, there is no reference, solid reference of phasers. And the second thing is, uh, if there is any static charge uh, or about voltage rise, it will be grounded through this earth. The third thing is, if you are grounding the uh, CT circuit for the multiple points, for example, if you ground from the switcher side and also if you ground star point of the, of the relay. So what could happen is, so now there are two paths for the earth fault current to flow. One is through this IN, another path is through the ground. So in some of the cases, the current mostly flows through the ground and this earth element is bypassed. So if there is an earth fault, the relay will not pick up. So this is an example that why it's important to make earthing at one point. So another uh, thing that is important here is if you make a multiple ground, you have ground here and here. So if there is a ground fault, so you know that uh, in case of a fault current, it will try to flow on all possible available paths. So this is also a low, low current path. So it will try to flow from the earth, it will go up and it will then try to flow through this element and then from the another earth fault element, it will be coming down and back. So, this is the another uh, issue that could happen because of multiple points. So, uh, what happened if there is a fault in system at another feeder? So, you will find that the adjacent feeder is stripped on the earth fault and you will keep on finding what's the reason. Then reason is that multiple point is grounded and the fault current has uh, gone through this element. So when you will see the fault records, you will be able to know that there is a fault current at the same time when the fault appeared on the adjacent line. So that's why it's a practice to uh, avoid the multiple grounding on the uh, CT star points and uh, 
there is a check there's a very important check on each CD circuit to check the single point at thing hi friend in this session we will just uh, review a CT nameplate uh, you can see uh, this is basically uh, basically a CT uh, the rated voltage of CT is uh, for uh, 69 to 115 kV the rated short circuit level for the C this specific CT is uh, 40 kilo ampere for one second this is the short circuit rating of the CT frequency is 50 Hertz and uh, U test is 230 by 550 kV so I dynamic is 100 kilo ampere weight is 350 kg so here you can see the uh, it has uh, primary side has a ratio of 3000 and secondary side there are different ratios you can see 500 by 5 500 by 5 1000 by 5 so this is primary rating is 2000 ampere for the uh, for the uh, CT whereas uh, different CT ratios are available and selected this is basically the V rating of each CT is provided and this is basically the class this is the protection class of the CT and this is basically the measuring class and here you can see that this is the knee point voltage uh, for one core this is normally used for the uh, bus power protection so they are also provided the knee point voltage for one core which is uh, for 10p uh, then they have provided also resistance of the CT this is used for calculation of uh, 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 basically CT sizing calculations and calculating the total burden you can add this also uh, in your calculation so uh, here you can see basically in this one they have not written uh, the accuracy limit factor in the uh, name plate like 5p10 or 5p20 they have not mentioned the times what does it mean by 5p10 or 5p20 it is called as accuracy limit factor and uh, meaning of uh, this uh, is that uh, at 10 uh, for example 5 to 20 means at 20 times fault current if the CT ratio is uh, 1000 for this score and this is if 5 if this score is 5 to 20 then 20 times means 20 kilo ampere fault current is there then there will be a uh, error in the reading will be 5 percent so this is how the uh, accuracy limit factor is taking care so this is just a little introduction about the CT nameplate Hi friend, in this session we will just uh, review a CT nameplate. Uh, you can see uh, this is basically uh, uh, basically a CT. Uh, the rated voltage of CT is uh, for uh, 69 to 115 kV. The rated short circuit level for the C this specific CT is uh, 40 kilo ampere for one second. This is the short circuit rating of the CT. Frequency is 50 Hertz and uh, U test is 230 by 550 kV so I dynamic is 100 kilo ampere weight is 350 kg so here you can see the uh, it has uh, primary side has a ratio of 3000 and secondary side there are different ratios you can see 500 by 5 500 by 5 1000 by 5 so this is primary rating is 2000 ampere for the uh, for the uh, CT whereas uh, different CT ratios are available and selected this is basically the V rating of each CT is provided and this is basically the class this is the protection class of the CT and this is basically the measuring class and here you can see that this is the knee point voltage uh, for one core this is normally used for the uh, bus power protection so they are also provided the knee point voltage for one core which is for 10p uh, then they have provided also resistance of the CT this is used for calculation of uh, 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 basically CT sizing calculations and calculating the total burden you can add this also uh, in your calculation so uh, here you can see basically in this one they have not written uh, the accuracy limit factor in the uh, name plate like 5p10 or 5p20 they have not mentioned the times 
what does it mean by 5p10 or 5p20 it is called as accuracy limit factor and uh, meaning of uh, this uh, is that uh, at 10 uh, for example 5p20 means at 20 times fault current if the CT ratio is uh, 1000 for this score and this is if 5 if this score is 5p20 then 20 times means 20 kilo ampere fault current is there then there will be a uh, error in the reading will be 5 percent so this is how the uh, accuracy limit factor is taking care so this is just a little introduction about the ct nameplate welcome friends in this section we will uh, go through the C uh, uh, classes of uh, different classes of ct so the, the class of ct can be of class p type class tps class x class tpx class tpy class tpz and class x so for class p the current transformer accuracy limit is defined by composite error with steady state symmetrical primary current this specification is most useful when applying simple time delay protection there is no limit specified for the residual flux for class TPS represent low leakage flux current transformers with performance limit specified by excitation characteristics and turn ratio error limits the IC specification for TPS are similar to class C but not identical one needs to pay keen attention as to detail of what is specified in terms of peak or RMS values or slope of the characteristics as defined in those standards class TPX class TPX accuracy is defined by peak instantaneous error during specified transient conditions no limit is specified for remnant flux indicative of non gap CT cores class TPY has smaller air gap hence its residual flux is very small limit is 10 percent class TPZ has an air gap not necessarily suitable for high speed applications the larger gap provides a very short secondary time constant with very short DC collapse time making CT ideally suitable for breaker failure protections class X current transformers protection current transformers specified in term of com complying with class X specification is generally applicable to unit system like bus power protection where balancing of output from each end of the protected plant is vital so this is just an uh, some definitions uh, of different classes so this just to give you an overview there are different type of classes available and where we are using them so just just introduction I hope you enjoy this lecture thank you very much hello and welcome friends uh, in this section uh, we will study the voltage transformer first of all why we need a voltage transformer so you know you need you know that we at the high, high voltage side the voltage are in in kvs like 132 220 and 500 kvs the voltage level is so high so if you want to make uh, an instrument uh, who can measure at the primary you need to make uh, the, the equipment size voltmeter or whatever is will be very big you will be having uh, need to have a very big insulation and difficult to carry and to move so that's why uh, the voltage transformer was designed so the concept here is that voltage uh, high voltage will be reduced to the low value and using a multiplying factor on the display or in the meter which is called as a VT ratio you can calculate back calculate the primary currents so there are two different types of VTs uh, so far which are used in substation one is inductive voltage type uh, inductive voltage transformer other one is a capacitive voltage transformer so inductive voltage transformer is a normal transformer uh, it, which is it's just stepping down the voltages whereas capacitive voltage transformer one capacitor voltage dividers uh, is used and and then at one capacitor at the end the conventional transformer which is uh, uh, is used so let's move on so uh, this is uh, in this uh, picture you can see different different types of transformer this uh, voltage transformer 
is normally used at low voltage level and this is uh, inductive type of transformers are used up to 132 kV level normally and this is CCVT based uh, capacitive voltage transformer these are used at 220 and 500 kV voltage levels. So here you can see this is example of capacitive voltage transformers first of all the voltage is divided across capacitors at the end of the capacitor you can see uh, the basically a uh, small transformer which is uh, normally up to the rating of 1 to 5 kV is used uh, because of capacitance there, there will be change in angle so this angle will be compensated using this compensating reactors so this is a tunable coil so uh, during uh, uh, when it is delivered from the factory they are early tuning it but uh, with the passage of time if some of the for example capacitors are fused so you can also again adjust here the phase angle in the same way here there is a transformer uh, which is also called as EMU electric magnetic unit it is kind of conventional transformer and it has a rating of up to 5 kV so uh, at, at the secondary side you will get the uh, second normal secondary voltages of the transformer this is uh, uh, we are showing a normal conventional transformer this is normal PT uh, and uh, uh, the relays connected to the secondary of uh, the PT also we are calling it as a burden so this is another presentation of the uh, CVT here they have installed a protective gap so if the voltage increase beyond the limit then this is, is just like a spark plug though so this seat, uh, this capacitor will be basically uh, and this capacitor and this EMU unit will be bypassed uh, you can see this VT has one uh, primary winding and it has a two primary secondary windings this is multi uh, core and multi ratio so there are two taps at this tap you will get the voltage 66.4 volts and at this tap you will get uh, 115 volts so in the voltage transformer just like a current transformer there are two type of errors one is measurement error and another one is phase angle errors and the load which is connected to the secondary side of the VT is called as a burden so here you can see the accuracy class uh, different accuracy class and where they are used for example 0.2 accuracy class of the VT uh, basically is used on revenue metering and 0.5 accuracy class uh, is used on, on normal metering uh, uh, static meterings uh, class 1 is used on instrumentation and class 3P we see 30 percent of error is used for protection release so voltage transformers uh, uh, have in the secondary side they have two different type of cores one is metering core and one is protection core metering core is more accurate and the error is less where the protection core has more error so uh, here you can see the VT secondary single point grounding VT secondary can never be short circuited VT uh, connection start and open delta so these three topics uh, we will cover in this section so like CT VT also has to be grounded uh, at single point multiple point grounding is not allowed in the VT if the VT is not grounded then there is a no solid ground reference and the phaser will be in rotation so you will not able to get uh, uh, all three phase to ground voltages correctly secondly the VT secondary can never be short circuited uh, we have un uh, we in previous section we have seen that CT can never be open circuited the voltage transformer is a uh, reverse it should never be short circuited normally our MCB is installed to detect any short circuit if there is a short circuit MCB will trip and interrupt the fault current number theory is now VT connection can be done in star and in the uh, open delta connection so here you can see this is basically the VT primary winding this is the secondary winding this winding is connected in star and this winding is connected in a uh, open delta connection so it's a delta but it's open 
So, what will happen if there is a balance condition then all three phases will be same and then open delta voltage which is basically 3 V naught will equal to 0. But if one phase is grounded it means there is unbalanced now the voltage will appear across this open delta. So, uh, when we are designing the uh, basically VT circuit uh, in the substation we need to consider the voltage drop uh, in the VT circuit it should be within the permissible li limit otherwise it will induce a significant error in the relay calculations. So, voltage factor what is a voltage factor? Voltage factor is determined by the maximum operating voltage which depends on the network earthing system and the way the VT's primary windings is connected. The voltage transformer must be able to withstand this maximum voltage for the time necessary to clear the fault. So, voltage transformer is maximum operating voltage a transformer can bear voltage factor. So, uh, if the rating is uh, for example of a VT rated for 100 uh, kbs and the voltage factor is 1.5 it means that it can bear the maximum voltage 150 kb for a given time. So, another topic is uh, ferro resonance in magnetic voltage transformer. Ferro resonance can occur when the primary of voltage transformer is connected uh, line to ground and a, a, an ungrounded circuit. This configuration results in magnetizing reactance of the VT being in parallel loop with the coupling capacitor to ground and the system. So, this is just an uh, basic definition I do not want to go here in detail to explain this. So, this is uh, about the voltage transformer. So, I hope you enjoy this lecture. Uh, hi friends we will start our uh, new topic and that is related to some introduction about the station batteries. So, why we need station batteries uh, at the substation? So, uh, basically the uh, is, you know that AC power is fluctuating and uh, there are the cases when the AC power is lost. So, and al uh, they also there is no backup for the AC power. So, uh, all, taking all of these things uh, in account and considering these things uh, uh, battery banks are designed and how battery banks are basically uh, um, uh, working. Uh, first of all uh, uh, AC supply is connected to a DC. Uh, charger. Uh, the charger converts AC supply into the DC supply and one end of the charger is connected to the uh, basically the battery uh, batteries and it is charging the batteries and other end is connected to the AC DB. So, it is supplying the uh, uh, DC DB and the batteries in parallel. So, we can have So, we can imagine this that for example, this is the charger and this is the AC supply, three phase AC supply is connected here ok and output of the charger one output is connected to the batteries for example, these are the batteries. and this one is the TCTV. So, this is for example, the battery bank and this is the DCDB <coughs> and normally uh, at any substation is provided by two battery banks. So, let me first write this is charger and it is converting AC supply here we have three phase AC supply in the substation. So, or any power plant and this one is basically the battery bank. <coughs> the 
this one for example is the DC distribution board we can say 1 so this is the normal configuration uh, of substation and here uh, uh, then this uh, is taking supplies to further protection panels protection panels control panels and then switch yard all different places is taking giving the supply so it's like a protection panel relay panel rp control panel cp and then switch gear like circuit breaker isolator etc so then further supply is distributed to all of these through DCDB. So here it is getting supply and here uh, basically uh, they have uh, the diodes, dropping diodes. So let me make the dropping diode. Battery for example here the uh, if the system voltage requirement is 220 volts system voltage requirement is normally for example 220 volts at uh, the substations uh, the battery will charge at not at uh, 220 volts at float also it will charge at 242 volts for example charging will be at the higher voltages so the generator uh, at the terminal output of the generator these are called as terminal voltage terminal voltage will be around about in the float mode will be around about you can say 242 volts so this will be directly connected to the battery bank and after that there will be a number of dropping diodes so these diodes uh, will drop the voltage and will bring it to 220 volts <clears throat> so there is a term of terminal voltage will be which will be here and there is a, a voltage after this uh, dropping diodes which will be connected to DC distribution board. The purpose of dropping diode here is to reduce the voltage so that it can be used at the distribution level. So normally in the substation there are two banks of batteries. There is no one bank, there are two banks of batteries and these are connected through a coupler so this is the normal configuration <coughs> this is a bus coupler for example so now if for example the AC supply is fail here the AC supply so if this supply is failed, so what will happen? Then this battery will be supplying the voltage to DCDB directly. So uh, this dropping diodes uh, will be bypassed, and the battery will supplying the voltage to the DCDB directly. And uh, the uh, supply to the relay panel, control panel, and the CB will not be disturbed so this is the advantage of dc db and the battery banks so uh, uh, they have normally they are giving two chargers set of two chargers and two battery banks and this is the reason is behind is that that for example if the one complete set is failed if for example this battery bank charger there is a fault and this complete set is shut down so there will be no power available at dc db one so the bus coupler uh, can automatically close in that case uh, if, uh, if it experiences that there is no supply at this db in commerce side and then this coupler will close and it will give supply from this charger 
2 dc db 1 so, so charges are 2 this is a charger 1 for example and this is a charger 2 so charger 1 will give uh, if the charger 1 is shut off and also the battery bank is sh is shut off then charger 1 will be switch off and the charger 2 will give supply to the all rotation systems so this is the purpose of the uh, uh, potassium batteries in the substation to provide backup power to provide stable power charger is doing <coughs> converting ac to dc and it's providing smooth dc supply regulated dc supply to all our control and protection panels <coughs> so this was little brief about the protection systems that we uh, uh, about the uh, about the battery system that we are using in for the protecting our equipment and operation and control so how battery works this is very simple battery uh, is basically converting electrical uh, first of all electrical energy into chemical energy during the charging process and when uh, load is connected to it it is start discharging and then the chemical energy is converting back into the electrical energy so the process is used here is electrolysis uh, there are two different types of batteries which are used in the substation one is uh, lead acid battery and another one is basically the nickel cadmium battery so these are the two different batteries that are used so both the above types can be classified further into flooded type and seal maintenance free type the flooded uh, cell construction especially referred to electrodes of the cell in the electrolyte medium which can be topped up with distilled water as the electrolyte gets diluted due to charging and discharging the batteries also discharge hydrogen during the cycle and it is very necessary to restrict this discharge to less than 4% by volume to air. To avoid surrounding becoming hazardous, the higher discharge of H2 is in lead acid cell has resulted in the manufacture of sealed maintenance free or wall regulated uh, acid VRLA batteries. Here the H2 discharge is restricted to below the hazardous limit. Hence, for conventional switch gear, protection applications, sealed nickel cadmium batteries are not required. As such, the sealed nickel cadmium cells are only used for small battery cells using modern electronic gadgets. The rechargeable lead acid cells normally used in switch gear relay applications are generally of the plant type and have an electrical voltage of 2 volts. The cell contains pure lead positive plate and lead oxide negative plate and electrolyte of dilute sulfuric acid. The nickel cadmium cell has electrical voltage of 1.2 volts containing nickel compound as a positive and cadmium compound as negative plates with potassium hydrogen solution as electrolyte. So there are some advantages and disadvantages of this, this type of batteries that we can discuss. The Following are, are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, nickel cadmium batteries over lead acid batteries. And the nickel cadmium batteries have better mechanical strength. They are easier to maintain. They have a long life. Space and weight is low. Uh, they have low H2 uh, discharge and no spillover issues. The disadvantage of nickel cadmium is lower cell voltages. They are more expensive and higher current consumption for charging, not recommended at higher ambient temperatures. So these are some advantages and disadvantages of the battery.
Welcome friends, uh, now we will discuss some advantages of uh, nickel cadmium batteries. So advantage of nickel cadmium battery that it is operates, uh, it can operate on higher temperature. So whereas uh, lead acid batteries when the temperature increases their life expectancy is also uh, decreased. But uh, nickel cadmium uh, batteries are more uh, you know, tough if, uh, and more strong to face the temperature. So if, if you are installing a battery in an area where temperature is at extreme, so you have to come, uh, it's better option to use nickel cadmium. So nickel cadmium is perfect for most applications. So for, for example, you can install it in boats, aeroplanes, nuclear power plants, UPS, so it's al always suitable. Uh, nickel cadmium has exceptionally long operation lifetime so the lifetime of the nickel cadmium battery is uh, very long it's basically a low maintenance uh, and it's mechanically strong uh, battery nickel cadmium means no risk of sudden failure so suitable for continuous operation with peace of mind so as compared to lead acid, uh, nickel cadmium uh, is uh, there is no risk of suddenly some cells are fail. So this is uh, uh, nickel cadmium is better in this case. Nickel cadmium is most reliable battery. So nickel cadmium is considered as most reliable battery in in the in the field of power uh, plants and substations. Nickel cadmium is suitable for use in every sector. Nickel cadmium can safely be recycled. So recycling is also possible, 99% of nickel cadmium batteries will be recycled after collection. Nickel cadmium has low life cycle cost. So initial cost of nickel cadmium is high, but if you divide the cost of nickel cadmium with the total number of year plus uh, less maintenance cost, the total cost is called as a life cycle cost. At the end, it will be uh, cheaper as compared to lead acid battery. Uh, this is basically uh, a gas company uh, the gas uh, the gas is basically the Javan company which is manufacturing the nickel cadmium batteries so here they have shown on their website that how nickel cadmium uh, life uh, time is reduced with increase in temperature so here is on the left side is basically the nickel cadmium battery on the right side you will see the lead acid battery so as the temperature is increasing the life of nickel cadmium and, and lead acids both are decreasing but the lead acid uh, life is decreasing very fast as the temperature increased so uh, this is very nice presentation and, and it's uh, giving a good comparison so i hope now this this is uh, this presentation is really help, helpful for you to understand the benefits of nickel cadmium in the substation so now more and more uh, uh, nickel cadmium batteries you will see in the substation in future thank you very much hey friends uh, the batteries can be classified into three different types based on the plates uh, uh, which are used in the batteries though three types could be tabular batteries the, the in this one the type uh, the battery plates are in the form of tubes then it comes to flat plate batteries the flat plate batteries are where the uh, basically anode and uh, cathodes are in the form of uh, basically plates and in which you will see the square boxes so and then planted batteries and these are planted batteries are basically the initial very initial form of batteries in which cathode and electrodes are basically rods electrical rods and in between the insulation was uh, used to be placed so th the life expectancy of these batteries is planted battery is 25 to 30 years flat plate is 5 to 6 years and tubular is 10 to 12 years so this is basically the example of uh, planted battery and this is uh, uh, one of the very old batteries that uh, were uh, invented and this is the picture of a battery that was invented in 1859. This battery was invented by a scientist named Gaston Planté. And this is one of uh, first battery, one of its kind. 
and the invention year was uh, 1959 so this is one of the very initial batteries then it comes to flat plate batteries you can see the battery cathode and cathode is a, a, a anode and cathode structure it is fine in the fine uh, in the form of flat plates uh, and uh, uh, you will find these batteries mostly now in the cars, uh, electric cars. And this is basically tubular uh, bat battery uh, uh, system in which the anode cathodes are in the form of tubes. And uh, these are very, very uh, reliable and these are deep cycle batteries. Here is some comparison of uh, the flat plate and tubular batteries. You can see reliability, tubular are more reliable and also tubular battery is more expensive. You can see charge cycles. So clearly the tubular batteries uh, have bigger and more reliable charge cycle. Uh, then electrolyte uh, stratification risk is medium. Here it's low because external shape of positive plate allows for easier movement for electrolyte float current here is medium and the float current here is low so it's less burden on the charger thermal management uh, is medium and the tubular thermal man management is high because of construction is this uh, tubular battery will not heat up uh, as quickly as the flat flat battery surface area is medium and surface area is high electrical resistance is mid to low and here the electrical resistance is uh, low why because well defined pore size permit easy movement to, elect to the electrolytes life expectancy of tubular is more than the flat plate charge engine uh, in the flat plate is long but in the tubular is it is longest because there is no electrolyte pollution from reinforcing agents so this is a little comparison of these two batteries so i, I hope this has given you an idea and on the stations mostly you will see the tubular batteries uh, which are deep cycle and which are more reliable. Thank you very much. Hi friends, we will start our new topic and that's uh, in this topic we will study the voltage, capacity, specific gravity and some information about the hydrometer. So the per cell voltage of there are two different type of batteries one is uh, basically the nickel cadmium battery and another one is a lead acid battery for the uh, nickel cadmium battery the voltage per cell is normally less and it's 1.2 volts per cell whereas for the lead acid battery the nominal voltage is almost 2 volts per cell so you know that in 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 the uh, in the substation we have to form a bank of 220 volt and 110 volt for example so you need to connect the batteries in series so for example if you want to if you want to use nickel cadmium battery to form a 110 volt uh, bank then you need 92 nickel cadmium batteries 92 into 1.2 will be 110 and if you want to prepare a, a 110 volt dc bank battery bank by using a lead acid then you need a 55 total number of cells so this is little introduction about the voltage rating of the battery and the banks then next come is basically the capacity of the battery so capacity of the battery is measured in ampere hour it means that if a battery is uh, a battery single battery rating is or the bank battery rating is 100 ampere hour so uh, it means that it can supply 10 ampere for 10 hours or it can supply 1 ampere for 100 hours so it, it means that you need to multiply ampere into hours but the range should be within that specified rating so the battery should be able to supply the uh, rated or minimum allowable voltage to the networks within its uh, capacity defined so this is basically the concept now regarding a specific gravity a specific a simple hydrometer reading indicates the state of charge in the cell a specific gravity is basically when uh, the uh, when the lead acid electro uh, lead acid batteries 
when the electrolyte is charged, the specific gravity is, is high. When the electrolyte is discharged, the specific gravity becomes low. So, it's basically how much uh, the specific liquid is heavier than the water. It's uh, measuring this thing. And uh, for, uh, for uh, lead acid batteries, the hydrometer, uh, the operator need to come and check regularly the specific gravity of the batteries in order to confirm that batteries are charged and everything is fine. Uh, but for the lead acid batteries, uh, the ma gas manufacturer is not uh, relating the specific gravity with the charge, charging and discharging of the uh, batteries uh, because this is a different type of batteries like is nickel cadmium. So, a simple hydrometer indicates the state of charge in a cell. A fully charged cell will have a specific gravity reading of between 1.025 and 1.215 as a thumb rule in lead acid battery. Open circuit volts is equal to specific gravity plus 0.84. Thus, the open circuit volt at the cell with specific gravity 1.25 will be 2.05 volts one with an specific gravity of 1.28 and 2.12. So this is some kind of a calculations that you can uh, perform. So, and the hydrometer, this is the basically the hydrometer. And by you, you, you can put this one hydrometer in the battery. And it, if you, when you press this uh, upper, uh, this plastic, the acid will come inside and then this float will go up and it will show you the specific gravity of the basically the battery electrolyte. So this was all about the station batteries, voltage, capacity and specific gravity. Thank you very much. Hello, here uh, in this section, I will just show you a single end diagram uh, in which you can see the battery banks and you can see the connect how the battery bank charger and the DCDB, these are connected together. So first of all, they have two chargers available in, in the DC system. So you can see this is one charger, this is another charger. Both chargers are fitted by three phase AC supply. You can see this is basically a uh, uh, basically rectifier so which is converting AC into DC so DC is uh, then uh, going through this uh, circuit breaker and it's reaching here okay so then you can see this is also connected to the one side is connected to the battery okay and the other side is connected to the load and here is basically the bus coupler okay and this is uh, basically the another bus and you can see the same configuration is uh, applied to the uh, A section A uh, the set 1 and set 2 so that advantage of coupler normal coupler is open and both sets are supplying DC, DC power to DC, DC, DC DB1 and DC DB2 so but if, for example if uh, this breaker trips or there is a some fault in the set 2 then this set 2 will be off and the coupler automatically based on the scheme or manually you can close this coupler and this single uh, up, uh, system will supply power to the both uh, DC DBs so this is some simple format here you can see they have used a discharge register for the discharge so if somebody want to do maintenance on the DC DB he can use this discharge resistor to completely discharge the batteries. So this is a very simplified diagram for the uh, DC, uh, DC DB uh, battery charger system in a substation. So here uh, we will discuss about some uh, thing about batteries then how you can do the maintenance of the battery. So you need to check the batteries and charger regularly at, uh, at least twice a month and you need to check the specific gravity and uh, that it should be within the limit you need to monitor the per cell voltages you need to monitor that cell temperature if the any cell temperature is uh, uh, more increasing more it means that the life of that cell is uh, uh, is now finished 
then you have to see the specific gravity of the uh, different uh, uh, cells you need to check the gassing if there is if cell become uh, old aged up uh, there will it will start to make more gassing and uh, it is a it is a basically sign that cell life is uh, cell is become weak and life is almost complete then you can check the leakage and you can check the exhaust fan also because uh, due to the gas hydrogen uh, will be formed in the uh, battery room and uh, exhaust fan should uh, work uh, all the time so these are all certain factors that you need to watch and monitor your station batteries thank you very much hey friends welcome now we will start our new topic and that is basically that uh, grounding of dc system so first of all the question is why we want to ground a dc system a DC system has two polarity, polarities, one is positive and one is negative. Now, uh, this, uh, there is no reference of positive and negative with respect to ground. It means that if positive, somewhere positive cable uh, is broken and it is not lying on the ground, that uh, no protection can detect that this fault because it is face to ground and there is no current and there is no reference and uh, there is no method to detect that our whole system is uh, working healthy and there is no cable failure to the ground or um, and and, and uh, to detect so uh, the need arise to make some kind of a uh, reference of a positive and negative uh, polarity with respect to ground and we need to create a system in which we should be able to know that if if any of the conductor is grounded so first you can see the method this method is a very simple method so in this method what we are doing we are connecting two bulbs in series and we are making center point grounded so normally if there is no grounding in the networks so both bulb will be light up okay but uh, will, they will be light up with the same intensity because both are in series so it will show that the positive uh, is not grounded and negative is not grounded so both are both uh, our polarities are healthy so now suppose that if now here if the negative is grounded some uh, wire of a negative is grounded so you can see now this bulb is bypassed so this bulb will be off because now the negative is grounded and the, this bulb will glow more lighter so which is indication that the negative of the substation is grounded so in this way you have make a system which can detect the fault so similarly if for example if the positive of the of the dc system is grounded then you can see that uh, here the positive bulb it will be switched off and it will indicate that the positive uh, is not healthy and positive is grounded somewhere whereas the negative will be uh, now full voltage will appear across the negative bulb and it will be lighting up more so another advantage for this uh, type of technique is this if uh, the negative is not solidly ground but is grounded with some impedance then you will say that uh, that uh, you will see this that the negative bulb will not be switched off completely it will be glowing with the less intensity as much as is basically the uh, low imp uh, impedance fault will be higher uh, lower will be the uh, glowing uh, or luminosity of the bulb so glow of the bulb will be less and glow of the, uh, if the fault impedance is less if the fault impedance is high this this bulb will start to glow high so you can also check the severity of the fault through this bulb so this is very old method that uh, was used previously so this is another method so in this method you can see uh, what they have done they have basically grounded a uh, negative here permanently they have grounded negative solidly and uh, if there is any fault face to ground and then the MC, relevant MCV will be tripped. So in the telecom system, uh, 48 volt, uh, they are adopting this uh, technique in which uh, they are grounding solidly one terminal, the positive is solidly grounded uh, in this terminal. So this is another way 
of detecting the fault but if there is any ground fault uh, if the relevant LME, LME, for example if the negative is already grounded and the positive is grounded to the fault uh, to the um, positive terminal is also grounded then there will be a short circuit and MCB will be tripped and alarm will be generated this is another way of making a grounding of DC supply and this is the third method which is used at uh, 130 to 110 volt and for uh, 220 volt DC system in the substations so this is very famous method what they are doing they are basically uh, on the center point of the two batteries they are grounding it with a very high impedance so it means that if you measure the voltage between phase to ground this is 110 volt battery system so in the middle they are grounding with high impedance so if you check the by voltmeter the voltage between phase to ground you will get half voltage plus 5 5 and if you check the voltages from negative ground you will get the minus 5 5 voltages if the system is healthy so if the system is not healthy uh, then you can see uh, if you it's for example uh, in this case if for example positive is solidly ground so if you check the voltage from positive to ground it will be shown it will be showing zero and if you check the voltages from negative ground it will be showing the full voltage because now ground is at positive potential there is a, a relay which monitoring the ground fault also if there is a ground fault obviously some current will flow through this relay and it will create alarm that system is grounded so these are some methods that are used uh, in the DC system to create a ground and to detect the ground fault so here this this is basically the DC charger this is the display and you can see a lot of uh, different LEDs here so here you can see this is the basically earth fault plus it means the plus has grounded earth fault minus and between the minus has been grounded so this system is detecting the fault and this system is using the same technique that we have just discussed that is this type of connections so this is a basically a very good idea to understand and how it is detecting that this plus is grounded and minus is grounded it is simple if the plus is grounded the direction of current is in one direction if the minus is grounding the direction of current is in another direction so th these are some techniques uh, by which uh, we are grounding the DC system and this is just to protect the system and monitor the system thank you very much so we will start our uh, also new topic and that's related to capacitor storage strip units so these are the units uh, which are intended for use as backup protection in case of DC supply failure or at the substation where no tripping batteries have been provided so uh, uh, in Pakistan there is a utility which is called a K-Electric and uh, what happened here is basically there are some incidents more than once that whole the substation is burned out and when the investigation was uh, took place then they find out that the DC system was failed so no protection operated on the local grid and uh, that resulted in total fire and failure of all the substations so later on they decided to use capacitor storage strip units so in case even if the DC supply is fail or even AC supply is fail whatever is the case these units are powerful enough to trip the circuit breaker so the concept is is that as soon as the DC supply is failing the breaker will trip through this device so this device is monitoring the DC supply continuously and as soon as this supplies fail regardless of uh, anything it will trip the breaker so this is kind of protection to uh, the priority has given to the protection then on the reliability or continuity so as soon as there is a DC is fail this uh, the energy is stored in the capacitor and the breaker will trip through this energy So another example of using this storage capacitor storage unit is 
in uh, ringman units for example where there is no dc bank is available so existing ac supply is used to charge this uh, capacitor storage units and to operate make the trappings through it uh, here uh, i have shown a very basic diagram for the capacitor storage unit how the capacitor storage unit look like you can see this is the inside from the capacitor unit and this is basically if you see in the panel you will see this type of capacitor storage unit in the panel so this was introduction of capacitor storage unit i hope you like this lecture nc device codes as per ieee c37.2 the protection devices and control devices in the substations are shown by the nc codes in the drawings in the single line diagrams in the three line diagrams so it's always important and to learn these codes if you want to uh, study and read the drawings so for example 21 is a code that is used to represent the distance relay 50 is the device code to represent instantaneous over current relay 51 is ac time over current relay 52 is ac circuit breakers 67 is ac directional over current relay 79 is used for auto recloser 81 is used for frequency relays and 87 is used for differential relays so there are some prefix or suffix which are used for multiple similar devices on the same piece of equipment for example you can use 101 201 301 and you can use for example 21-1 21-2 to 21-3 it is showing that there are three different distance relays which are installed here so a slash is used for multiple functions in single device for example if a device is have the function of over voltage and under voltage so you can use 27/59 and if the device is instantaneous and time delay over current you can use 50/51 so there are some prefix suffix which are used to uh, describe and differentiate devices examples abc is used for phases b used for bus bf is used for breaker failure g is used for generator or ground l is used for line n is used for neutral p is used for phase q is used for liquid or negative sequence r is used for remote t is used for transformer V is used for voltage and X, Y, Z are used for auxiliaries. This is a single line diagram. So, if you know the codes that we have recently learned, you can find out different devices in it. For example, this is basically over voltage device five five nine. This is basically the under voltage device. Here you can find out more devices. This is the breaker fifty two. This symbol is showing the breaker. The rating of breaker is one thousand two hundred ampere. Eighty six is basically the lockout relay. So in the same way, you can find different devices. Eighty seven is the differential protection. And there are lot of more NC codes uh, that you can find. You can find a complete list of. Uh, nc device codes on also on wikipedia so you can see this the list of uh, different devices codes i have in my slides showing the uh, very uh, highly used device codes just you can find distance is 21 here or speed device is 12 here so these are all kind of devices ground distance is 21g phase distance is 21p uh for example you can see under voltage voltage is 27 phase under voltage is 27p dc under voltage is 27s so try to learn this uh, device codes this will be help you to understand the protection uh, things quickly and here you can find some acronyms descriptions also like r flash deduction aft clock or timing source clk so there are a lot of things that you can go and study yourself 50 is basically instantaneous over current relay 50 bf is breaker failure 
50 g is ground and here you can find more list of suffixes and prefixes so this is a good example this wikipedia is giving you all the nc code these are as per ic standard c7.2 so i have uh, i hope that you enjoy this lecture and uh, welcome to the next lecture hey friends in this section we will study the lay application uh, we will see which type of production release installed on what type of uh, production equipment so we will see what set of production scheme production release installed on distribution networks transmission network buses transformers motors and generators so here you can see on the 11 kb distribution feeders you will find mostly over current release instantaneous over current relay inverse time over current relay non directional release and phase and ground release typically four release and if this 11 kb feeder is connected to a source like a power plant or generation source there you can also find the directional earth fault relay also there on the transmission line you can find a distance relay 21 21p or 21g directional over current is also installed on the line differential production relay 87l pilot fire protection scheme auto recloser sync check relays are also installed on transmission line level and close supervision relays so this is basically a single line diagram so you can see there is a ct and there is a pt a ct is connected to distance relay first 21 and then it is connected to over current instantaneous over current there is a failure relay and then it is connected to a directional over current relay so vt is connected to distance relay and also to the directional over current relay because directional over current relay need a polarizing quantity to decide the direction of current is it in forward direction or in reverse direction here you can see an auto recloser and this is basically uh, we have shown very simple scheme uh, for the transmission line zone 1 is taking normally 85% uh, to 90% of the line zone 2 is taking as 125 to 80% of the next substations zone 3 is 150 to 200% of time delay trip uh, of the third substation so uh, this is basically zone 1, zone 2, zone 3 so this is basically uh, the coverage and then for the um, directional overcurrent uh, the ground directional overcurrent is instantaneous and there is ground time overcurrent relay also installed in it and the ground time permissive transit trip is also installed here so directional overcurrent relay needs to polarize polarization is a reference the relay compares the phase angle of the forward current to the reference angle to determine the direction uh, whether it's forward direction or it's a reverse direction the reference polarizing vector must remain the same regardless of the forward location polarizing can be by voltage or current or both phase quantities or sequence quantities there are some common polarizing method one method is to take the open delta voltages 3 v naught and then uh, you can work well for close in heavy faults when the cd is may saturate transformer neutral current x naught bushing ct transformer tertiary delta winding so these are different uh, polarizing quantities that you can connect with and you can connect with the directional earth fault relay then there is a bus and the transformer so on the bus bar you will see a bus bar differential protection and bus bar differential protection is normally can be of two types one is a low impedance bus bar differential protection and another one is a high impedance bus bar differential protection then you can find differential protection on the transformers on the transformer you, all, uh, you, all, you will also find an HV over current, LV over current protection, HV earth fault and LV earth fault protection you will find high set uh, protection, over current protection stage uh, 1 and 2 on HV and also you will find high set over current protection 
stage 1 and 2 on LV side. You will find over excitation production on the transformers. You can find sudden, uh, sudden pressure production. You can find temperature production. Basically, in the transformer, winding temperature and oil temperature gauges are installed. In the stage 1, it will run the uh, fan group 1, for example. Stage 2, they will run the fan group 2. If also they have a forced oil cooling, then they will also start the pump. After that, they will give the alarm and then in the last they will initiate the trip. Then there is a breaker failure protection, there is a lockouts. Here we have shown the different zones of protection. This is basically the bus bar protection. So bus bar is covering the breaker we, uh, and also the bus whereas the line protection is covering the breaker and the line so this is always a good idea to give uh, to make the loop uh, uh, bus bar zones overlap so all the areas in the protection system should be covered by some zone so here this is just an example if there is external fault okay then the differential current inside the bus bar will be zero only the line will trip and if there is internal fault then bus bar protection will operate. In the same way, you can see if there is external fault on the transformer differential protection, current in and out will be same. So that there will be zero differential protection. There will be zero differential current and the transformer differential will not operate. So if there is an in-zone fault, so you can see the both current will add up. Differential current will be high and then the bus and the differential protection will operate. So transformer differential protection cannot work like a differential protection of the bus bar because there are some losses in the transformer. There is a transformer inrush. There is mismatch between transformer ratio and CTs on HP and LV side. And there is also tape changer winding, which is normally 10%, which is also including an error. So uh, all of these things are contributing to design a special differential bus bar uh, special differential transformer protection so that uh, uh, in this one we have to keep a slope uh, at, uh, at a higher value we also have to take care of inrush uh, there is uh, blocking uh, due to inrush in this transformer differential So on the generators and motors, in the generators and motors, you can see thermal overload protection is installed, over current protection is installed, over and under voltage protection is installed, reverse power relay is installed, earth fault relay is installed, unbalanced and negative sequence protection is installed, stator overheating protection is installed, over speed protection, differential protection, out of step protection. So these are all the examples of the protections which are installed in different type of equipments. Thank you very much. Hey friends, uh, the batteries can be classified into three different types based on the plates uh, uh, which are used in the batteries. The three types could be tabular batteries. The, the, in this one, the type, uh, the battery plates are in the form of tubes. Then it comes to flat plate batteries. The flat plate batteries are where the uh, basically anode and uh, cathodes are in the form of uh, basically plates and in which you will see the square boxes so and then planted batteries and these are planted batteries are basically the initial very initial form of batteries in which cathode and electrodes are basically rods electrical rods and in between the insulation was uh, used to be placed so the life expectancy of these batteries, this planted battery is 25 to 30 years, flat plate is 5 to 6 years and tubular is 10 to 12 years. So this is basically the example of uh, planted battery and this is uh, uh, one of the very old batteries that uh, were uh, invented. And this is the picture of a battery that was invented in 1859. This battery was invented by a scientist named Gaston Planté. And this is one of the uh, first battery, one of its kind. And the invention year was uh, 1959. So this is one of the very 
initial batteries then it comes to flat plate batteries you can see the battery cathode and cathode is a, a, a anode and cathode structure it is fine in the fine uh, in the form of flat plates uh, and uh, uh, you will find these batteries mostly now in the cars uh, electric cars and this is basically tubular uh, bat battery uh, uh, system in which the anode cathodes are in the form of tubes and uh, these are very very uh, reliable and these are deep cycle batteries here is some comparison of uh, the flat plate and tubular batteries you can see reliability tubular are more reliable and also tubular battery is more expensive you can see charge cycles so clearly the tubular batteries uh, have bigger and more reliable charge cycle uh, then electrolyte uh, stratification risk is medium here it's low because external shape of positive plate allows for easier movement for electrolyte float current here is medium and the float current here is low so it's less burden on the charger thermal management uh, is medium and the tubular thermal man management is high because of construction is this uh, tubular battery will not heat up uh, as quickly as the flat plate battery surface area is medium and surface area is high electrical resistance is mid to low and here the electrical resistance is uh, low why because well defined pore size permit easy movement to elect to the electrolytes life expectancy of tubular is more than the flat plate charge range uh, in the flat plate is long but in the tubular is it is longest because there is no electrolyte pollution from reinforcing agent so this is a little comparison of these two batteries so i, I hope this has given you an idea and on the stations mostly you will see the tubular batteries uh, which are deep cycle and which are more reliable thank you very much hey guys now we will discuss here this different type of uh, uh, circuit breaker mechanism so there could be three different type of mechanism one is spring charge one is hydraulic and one is pneumatic so these are three different type of mechanisms which are used initially the spring charge was created for up to 132 kV now but you can see the spring charge is also used at uh, up to 500 kV they have created a spring charge is basically mechanism is very maintenance free uh, almost maintenance free and uh, is uh, is really cost effective solution hydraulic mechanisms initially when a spring charge was not established hydraulic mechanism was used but hydraulic mechanisms have the disadvantage that uh, you need to create constantly a high pressure to 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 be ready for to break the trip and there is lot of leakage issue of leakages in this mechanism so that is not preferred now the the third is pneumatic mechanism so this pneumatic mechanism also with the high pressure uh, of air uh, this breakers mechanism used to operate but also this is uh, now less likely to use because of high maintenance cost Hey friends uh, when you see the circuit breaker name plate you will see circuit breaker operating cycle details like open close open and close open and in between you will see the time so i will try to explain here what's the meaning of this uh, uh, basically uh, uh, this type and we will see that you can see it is specified as open time close open time and close open and generally you will find this data on the name plate of the circuit breaker zero open then there is a time delay of 300 milliseconds then close open and then 3 minutes so and then you can again close open so this is basically in the operating cycles where o is circuit breaker tripping t is a dead time and co is a reclose time co is a reclose with immediate tripping here successful and t is a reclaim time and then the cycle continues if it is a multi shot er or fault reoccur so 
when you are doing uh, commissioning, sometimes manufacturers or, or sometimes client is also asking to measure this uh, opening cycle of the breaker. So first of all, breaker is stripped, then it is given it as a delay of 300 milliseconds, then it is close again, and then trip again, then it is given a 3 minute second which is for reclaim time, and then it is close open again. So 300 millisecond here delay is considered for the dead time and the 3 minute is considered is for the reclaim time. And now what is a dead time and what is a reclaim time? Dead time when there is a fault arc will form and breakers will take some time to quench the arc and isolate the line. So this time they have given 300 milliseconds so production system to operate and quench the arc. If we want to close it again before the arc is extinguished, it means that uh, if arc is extinguished, we want to reclose the, it means the fault is persist, persisted because arc has a low impedance and it has a low resistance. If you are trying to close in, uh, the breaker again, reclosing, if the arc is not uh, extinguished, it means that you are closing it again onto a fault. So, and then it's close again after that time, arc is extinguished, it's close again, and then for example, it's strip again because of fault. So then it's given a reclaim time of three minutes. Sec three minutes. So in three minutes, uh, it will check that fault is not come back, and then again after reclaim time, we have make a close open cycle. So let's go to the sequence one by one. When there is a fault, the concern relay operates, which is uh, in turn operate the master trip relay 86. Circuit breaker trips initiate and at the same time auto closer initiates. So there is a fault on the line, relay operate the tripping and it is also initiate the auto closer. CD trip in about 30 milliseconds which initiated by open in the duty cycle. So circuit breaker will trip approximately 30 to 50 milliseconds between that open cycle has started. Then circuit breaker will remain open for some time that is 300 milliseconds to complete the arc quenching which is called as dead time and is indicated by 0.3 seconds in the duty cycles. So 300 milliseconds will be given for arc to quench and it will be shown as a duty cycle of the breaker. After 0.3 seconds, if the AR is in service, a recloser will be attempted and if the fault persists, circuit breaker immediately, uh, circuit breaker immediately which is in uh, operate and uh, circuit breaker trips immediately which is indicated by CO in the duty cycle. So we have considered that after that time AR was in service and the AR has initiated the reclose which is shown by C here but the fault were persisted so it is open again. If it's a single shot auto closer breaker will go into auto closer lockout that means auto closer relay will not give any further reclose command to the breaker. After close open there is a reclaim time of 3 minutes in which the circuit breaker gets ready for reclosing which includes CB spring charging so it has to recharge the spring within this time indicated by 3 minute in the duty cycle. After the reclaim time has completed, second reclose will be attempted in following two cases. Case 1. If it is a multi shot AR, the breaker will close again. If the fault is clear, it will remain closed but if the fault is still there, then the breaker will open immediately and breaker will remain open until it, it closed manually. Auto closer was successful, fault clear, breaker had closed, but after the reclaim time, the fault recurred. In this case, due to cycle will continue. So, this is basically the duty cycle again. So, this is uh, I have shown you by a graph. For example, the protection relay operate, the protection relay will uh, trip the circuit breaker. So, you can see it operates and trip the circuit breaker. At the same time, it initiates the auto recloser. After the dead time of 300 milliseconds, auto recloser will attempt breaker reclose. 
So this is that time of 3 minutes second has passed. After that, after the closer will att attempt to reclose the breaker. We'll give the closing command. So now if the fault is persisted, then the breaker will trip immediately. Okay, and if the breaker is tripped, now the breaker uh, will uh, the reclaim time will start, which is three three minutes. In this reclaim time, breaker will be ready to and uh, to uh, go for for another reclose cycle. This reclaim time defined by manufacturer normally it is three minutes. In this three minutes, breaker breaker spring will be charged. So after these three minutes, uh, auto recloser again will give another close command. And if the AR is successful, breaker will remain, remain closed. And if AR is not successful, the breaker will open. And again, uh, the another reclaim time will start depending upon how many shorts are designed for the uh, system. So in, in the auto regulation really, you can set this uh, dead time and reclaim times, but you need to check the circuit breaker name plates, what are the recommended uh, dead and reclaim times of that specific circuit breakers. So you should be in line with that. So again here I have shown you this uh, circuit breaker duty cycle. So this was uh, some brief discussion about the circuit breaker duty cycle. I hope you enjoy this lecture. Hey friends, uh, we will start uh, just a brief new topic uh, about the pole discrepancy. What is a pole discrepancy in the production systems? Uh, pole discrepancy is basically uh, is, uh, is a timer relay which is installed in the circuit breaker where each pole has a separate mechanism, operating mechanism. This is normally at 220 and 500 kV voltage levels mostly. Uh, what happened, uh, just consider the case that there are three phases A, B and C. Uh, if one of the phase, for example, phase A failed to close and two phases, two poles are closed. This, this is basically an abnormal condition and this has to be monitored. So basically this monitoring of this is done by a timer. Timer checks basically all the contacts of the breaker should be open or closed. If one of the contact is stuck up, a scheme is wired up in such a way that a timer will start and timer will in stage 1 is called as pole discrepancy timer. So timer in stage 1 will try to re-trip the breaker, trip coil 1 and 2 and still if it's not clear then in stage 2 it will operate the breaker failure protection of this, that specific breaker uh, so that it, it should isolate this breaker from the system. So you can see this basically I have shown a basic uh, uh, scheme this is a timer and they can put this uh, contacts uh, in series like this so let's uh, draw this scheme let's draw this scheme here so in order to draw this scheme Let's make two sets of contact. We'll start a timer relay here and we will supply this relay with negative and on the top we will supply here this circuit as plus 110 volts
okay now we'll make uh, one contact as normally open and one contact as normally close this is normally open contact these are the normally close contact So this is the condition of contact when breaker is, for example, open. Here the breaker is open. CB is open. Here we want to, we will give command to breaker to close. CB close. So this is basically phase A. This is phase B, so here, and this is phase C, is here. So similarly, we have phase A and B and C here. So if uh, if breaker is open, all the phase normally open contacts are open, and all the normally closed contacts are closed in the same way. Uh, if the breaker you want to close it, uh, for example, two two poles are healthy, A and B, uh, B and C are healthy, and A pole stuck up. So what will happen here? If this contact is closed, normally open contact will close like this. This will be close also. So this will be closed because these contacts are operate it and this contacts will be open so I will mark it here so this contact is open here so now two poles are closed pole number B and C this is B this is C this is A so two poles are closed and this pole is stuck up so you can see now that the DC supply will be through in this case positive will come from the top and from here it will come to the common point and because this pole is stuck up through its normally close contact this timer pole discrepancy rate timer will start so this is PD relay and stage 1 is 100 milliseconds stage 2 is for example 200 milliseconds so in stage 1 the timer will start at 100 milliseconds it will try to re-trip the breaker it will give tripping command to TC1 and TC2 to operate if it strips okay if it isn't trips it will give tripping commands to breaker failure protection of it will initiate the breaker failure protection of this this specific breaker so this is the example of how pole discrepancy really operates i hope you enjoy this section also hi friends now i will give you some introduction about the anti-pumping relay and so basically what anti-pumping relay is doing uh, first of all we'll understand the pumping phenomena that could take place in the production system the pumping phenomena is that just consider operator and if he when he's trying to close the breaker he will push the pole discrepancy switch and it will for example hold the switch on its position for one second or two seconds <coughs> so let's draw this on this board so it will try to hold this switch let's draw the circuit breaker closing coil okay and then we will draw basically a command We will draw a push button. We will try to make a pole discrepancy switch. Okay, and this is the closing coil. 
So if operator is pushing this, it will pass the supply to the closing coil and the closing coil the breaker will close. Just suppose the operator is hand is still on the switch because it will be at least one second or two seconds on the switch. It takes time and at the same time fault is appearing on the system. So if fault is appearing on the system then you can see the breaker will trip but his hand is still on the switch. So what will happen breaker will trip for example in 40 milliseconds, 45 milliseconds or you can see 50 milliseconds. So breaker will trip but because the hand is still on the switch, switch is still pressed so the breaker will again close. So but fault is not clear then again it will trip. So in a, in a second of time you can see if you divide setting by 50 milliseconds or if you divide even by 100 milliseconds the breaker will close 10 to 15 times in a second if this situation happen. If you are trying to close the breaker at the same time fault occurs. So this is called pumping action. So we need to avoid this action. So we need to uh, avoid this pumping action. So we need to install a relay which should protect our system and it's called as an anti-pumping relay. So how it works? Basically let's install another relay. This is the relay. Okay. And we can connect this relay with this switch and one normally open contact, normally close contact. of the relay is kept. This is the contact of this relay. Uh, now we have um, put another relay which is called as an uh, anti-pumping relay. So when operator switch, uh, press the switch here, this contact will close. This anti-pumping relay will ener uh, uh, energize and also closing command will be given to the closing coil when this relay picked up okay so let's draw the seal in contact of the relay also we have to make the seal in contact here we have to take a solid positive supply So here we have solid positive available, here we have downside negative available. So when operator push the switch in this case anti-pumping relay will energize and also close command will be issued to the breaker, breaker will close for example. As soon as the anti-pumping anti relay picked up this contact will now move to close. So this contact will close. So this contact is closed it means that this the new position will be like this. This contact will move on and this will be closed. Now this contact is closed so positive is available through this anti-pumping relay. Okay so the hand is pressed and you can see when this relay is picked up it will cut down the supply of the closing coil. This contact will now open because the relay is picked up. This is normally close contact and it will cut down the supply. So it's uh, the operator hand still is on the switch here for example. So only one pulse will go to closing coil and an and anti pumping will cut this pulse and it will seal in through this contact. And then if the fault comes, the breaker will open if, if his 
hand is still on the contact the next pulse will cannot be given and uh, this uh, anti pumping relay will be reset we have to put another contact here by normally open contact of this switch so when this switch when this switch is closed this point is closed when this person take off this switch this is the auxiliary contact of this switch so when the operator remove this switch at that time this anti pumping relay also reset and this contact is also closed so this is some example of uh, anti pumping relay how it's working i have separate uh, training uh, on this one introduction to potassium design 1 and 2 that you can go through and understand more in detail so i hope you enjoy this lecture hi friends now the, the new topic here is a trip circuit supervision relay and uh, this basically tripping coil in of the circuit breaker is uh, more one of the most important uh, uh, device to monitor because uh, if the tripping coil of breakers is failed it means that uh, whenever the fault comes everything is okay but what a breaker cannot be tripped so that's why the need arise to monitor the healthiness of tripping coil all the time so the healthiness tripping coil is monitored by a trip circuit supervision relay uh, here you can see this is a tripping coil and this is a trip circuit supervision relay circuit so how it operates basically is for example if the circuit breaker is uh, in uh, open position so 52a is normally open contact it will also will be open position so you can see the uh, the tripping coil will be monitored negative will pass through the tripping coil through b and through a and to the positive so in this way you can see the both coil will be, will be picked up and it will show that the system is uh, healthy so uh, but in case uh, for example and this is basically uh, uh, the you can see here is this is the contactor so when both are uh, uh, in, the, in the in in the case when the breaker is open so we can monitor the tripping coil both coils will pick up a1 close and b1 will be closed and c will picked up and this is the normally closed contact of the uh, basically this contactor so when c is picked up this will be open and there will be no alarm so here you can see if somebody is uh, issuing the you can see potassium relay is operating and it is issuing the trip command if the, for example now the breaker is closed so if the breaker is closed you can see 52a will be closed so the tripping will be monitored by tripping coil this coil b will be bypassed so through 52a it will come to a and then it will be monitored by coil a so coil a will pick up and it will energize c and alarm will not be initiated so in case if there is a failure of the wire or failure of the coil coil becomes open there is no written negative and the a and b will be reset so the c will be de-energized and then you can see the alarm will be initiated because it's normally close contact so there is another case for uh, just uh, information that if for example if the breaker is closed then you can see 52a contact will be closed and at the same time if some protection really operates so you can see at that stage uh, b and a both are getting bypassed so in order to recover this time because stripping pulse is approximately 100 to 120 millisecond at max breaker is uh, opening in within a time of uh, 50 to 60 milliseconds at max so uh, basically a timer is installed and this timer will uh, hold uh, and keep on energizing the contactor for the given period of time so that during this uh, time protection should not uh, operate and it give a uh, give alarm unnecessary so this was uh, some introduction about the tip circuit supervision if you are more interested to uh, join about the drawings you can check my other available trainings and you can start your learning thank you
Hey guys, welcome. Uh, in this section, we will study with single line diagram for the AC distribution board. So this will give you the idea how the ACDB works and then later on we will start detailed drawing for AC distribution board. So just for your knowledge, you can see here that at any substation there are two sources are provided for AC power. One source is fed through auxiliary transformer in the substation which could be 11 kV by 415 volts and another source is for example if the supply AC supply of substation is failed that in that case the backup could be provided through a generator in our case you can see here it is diesel generator 250 kva so these are called as incoming supplies or incoming feeder for the ac distribution systems so here you can see if you go further i will start with first uh, incoming from the auxiliary transformer so first we will familiarize with the symbols so here you can see they have installed here a relay that is over voltage and under voltage it means the relay will monitor that is there any over voltage or under voltage and that accordingly it can trip the breaker as per the required settings this is the MCV which is protecting any short circuit happen here okay and these are the basically voltmeter which is connected and this voltmeter is showing supply which is coming from in uh, from the auxiliary transformer it means this supply will be available uh, in the cable box at the cable side or yard side so once the auxiliary is energized you can see the voltages on the voltmeter here okay then they have shown here a CT which ratio is 1000 by 5 amperes so the CT is feeding a meter energy meter which is measuring KWH and KVARH and then three ammeters are connected so this is the symbols of single line diagrams then they, they have connected three LEDs each for one phase red yellow and blue and then they have heater on indication they have shown here also an annunciator where you have option of uh, lamp test when you press or lamp will glow that will make sure that lamps are healthy and when some indication appear the lamp will glow and it will blink flicker and there is a hooter in the substation and this hooter will will be on so there will, it will be a loud noise so you can when press acknowledge this hooter will be off and blinking will be stilled so you can see the indications here so if indi indication is attended when you press the reset button it will go automatically off but if indication is still persist after pressing the reset button it will not reset this is the main incomer breaker of incoming one which is named as Q01 uh, rated at 1000 ampere and this is motor operated and this line is showing that it is interlocked so later we will see the interlocking diagram and also we will see the interlocking circuitry how it is made possible here you can see the switches are provided these are selected switches you can put this uh, in cover in automatic off or manual position means if you keep it automatic what will happen as soon as there is a supply at the incomer site at the yard site at the cable site 
this relay will sense and automatically this will switch on the breaker so this is automatic operation when you keep it off the breaker will become tripped and when you make it manual then you can manually switch on and off this breaker this will not update through interlocking or any automatic operations so then when you close this breaker the power is fed to this bus and you can see at this bus they have connected a voltmeter and this is voltage selection vs for each phase you can select for example in the practically if you want to see red phase voltages you can put the selector on red and if you want to see yellow phase voltages you can put the selector on yellow similarly you can also see blue phase this is the mcb which is protecting any short circuit in this circuit so this is basically the incomer side now we will see the single end diagram for the diesel generator side diesel generator side the single end diagram is same as i explained you can do self study here it is the same as the incomer one the difference here is they have utilized a small ct the ratio is 5 400 by 5 whereas the main incoming one through all the transformer is utilizing 1000 by 5 ampere ct the reason is that the generator which is called as an emergency generator don't have the capacity to supply a full substation so that's why its rating is less and this ratio is also uh, is less CT ratio. The CT ratio is selected as per the load current. So now we will see the bus bar arrangements. So here you can see the bus bar is divided in two parts. The part one is normal load bus. You can see from here up to this point is a normal load bus and then there is a tie breaker which is Q03 and then there is an essential load bus so in the normal when the station is normal and supply is fit through auxiliary transformer in that case if you keep the system automatic the power will be fed by auxiliary transformer from here and then it will be fed to normal bus and this tire breaker will be remain closed or automatically it will be closed so it means in normal condition the auxiliary transformer will supply voltages or load current to normal bus and as well as on essential bus but in 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 case if incoming transformer incoming feeder trips or there is a substation blackout uh, or the feeder of auxiliary transformer trips in that case there will be no supply here the under voltage relay will trip this breaker and the coupler also will trip and after a few seconds two after a few seconds it be one minute or two minutes depending on the set our setting we have one minute settings after one minute the generator will uh, this breaker will close and the supply will be fed through the generator but it will not feed all both buses normal bus or essential bus but it will feed only the essential loads connected to essential bus because the generator cannot take the load of full substation but if this generator have enough capacity to take the full load so scheme could be modified to connect this breaker even when the supply is fed through diesel generator so we this is uh, all about the single line diagram these are you can see the outgoing mcbs each is rated at 150 ampere you can see the rating the size of copper of the main bus is 50 by 10 mm width into length 
so again this is the size of the main bus and you can see the outgoing MCBs are of different ratings 63 ampere is one rating 150 ampere is another rating so this is basically the outgoing feeders or outgoing MCBs you can see so this is the little introduction about the signal line diagram for the AC system uh, you can see the automatic interlocking system is also wired in secondary side is shown through this block so these all three breakers this is called as incoming one q02 is called as incoming two and q03 is called as the tiebreaker are controlled through some circuitry that we will discuss next so thank you very much uh, we will move to our next topic thank you